very low. And that should be better. I think that we have audio now. Looks like we do. Yep. If the chat can let us know, it looks like our audio should be better now. I apologize for that. It might be just a little low still, but it should be good. Push the run. Are the mics plugged in? I'm just gonna, just gonna say yes. The mics are plugged in. Yeah, we're up. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, we're up. Well, we are back, and we made it with 18 minutes to spare. As I said, on a muted mic, welcome everyone to the 2023 Coca Dona 250. I'm your host, Matt Feldick, joined by the great Chris Warden. Chris, how are you doing, buddy? 
Um, a little bit more awake than I was a few minutes ago now that uh, we've got uh, things sorted out and we are ready to rock and roll here for the 2023 Cocodona 250. Uh, for those tuning in for the first time, welcome. The Cocodona 250 is the brainchild of Air Viper Running, an event that traverses a good part of the state of Arizona, starting down in Black Canyon City, just north of Phoenix, Arizona, and traverses several uh, communities, including Crown King, Sedona, Munns Park, and more, on its way winding through the state to Flagstaff, with a finish culminating in Heritage Square, right downtown, less than a mile from where we're at right now. This is the first time we've actually done a studio here in Flagstaff for Kokedona. Uh, this is our third airing of the event, and I'm really excited about the fact that this is going to be uh, a, a situation where the studio is just less than a mile from the finish line. So we can actually hop down there back and forth and potentially even bring runners in after they've completed their journey. Of course, there are not, there's not just one journey this year. There are three. Yep. And while we kind of uh, get a lay of the land, let's go ahead and take a look at the start-finish area here at Black Canyon City. Oh, and I will have to get that in just a second. There we go. There's on the ground over in Black Canyon City, courtesy of our good friend Bryce Brooks, Aravipa marketing team extraordinaire. And a heck of a runner, too. And a heck of a runner as well. So shout out to uh, shout out to Bryce for giving us these shots here. And so, Chris, can you set us up here for what the uh, what the uh, rest of this week entails with? all of these different races that we have going on. Yeah, so the Coconut 250 starts today uh, in uh, about 15 minutes. But then uh, later on this week, the runners of the Coconut 250 are going to be joined by athletes that are participating in two other distances as well. The Sedona Canyons 20, or 125 rather, uh, starts in uh, Sedona, or uh, Jerome on Wednesday morning, and then the Eldon Crest 36 starts at Fort Tuttle, just on the outskirts of Flagstaff on Friday morning. And all races culminate with a completion of, all runners have to be in by 10 a.m. local time on Saturday. So they've got 125 hours to complete their journey if they're running Cocodona, uh, 75 hours if they're running Sedona Canyons, and 27 hours if they're running Eldon Crest. Yeah, and so that's one of the really interesting things about, um, you know, having these different races going off, right, is it still gives you pretty pretty generous cutoffs, um, you know, regardless of what race distance, you, you know, you're running. So um, I think that some of these, some of these additional race distan distances, you know, are super exciting Sedona Canyons 125 basically getting to experience you know some of the big chunks uh, of the course that are you know some of people's most favorites you don't have to experience that brutal first 50k yes. um, and you still get to you know go through Sedona go up through Flagstaff things like that so that's one of the things that uh, we'll be talking about as the day progresses this day one uh, the the key word is brutal. Uh, the first uh, 50 to 55K uh, of the race, the runners will be heading from Black Canyon City uh, up into the Bradshaw Mountains and hitting Crown King as their first major aid station. They do have an aid station at mile eight in Cottonwood and a water drop or two along the way. But uh, really it, it comes to uh, getting to Crown King. And along the way, they're gonna climb roughly 10,000 feet in that first 30 to 35 miles, and it's gonna be warm. It's gonna be very warm. In fact, most of the carnage, it felt like in 2021, the original running of the Coconut 250, uh, so many runners were derailed by uh, a lack of water and not being prepared for just how hot and brutal the elements were going to be. 
Which brings up another point. Um, last year, we had to alter our uh, race course due to wildfires in the early part of the race. So this year, we're looking at a return to the original course uh, for the first uh, for the first 70, 80 miles back to Whiskey Row. But uh, and we'll see that, how that plays. Yeah, I mean, it should be it should be a lot of fun. Um, you know, it'll be nice to be back on that um, kind of what the original the original ish course at this point. Um, yeah, there are a couple of, of small changes that have taken place uh, in, in regards to the finalization of the course. So uh, it's not exactly the way the course was in 2021, but it plays fairly close. It's a little bit shorter. The 2021 course was uh, 257 miles. This one plays closer to a two true 50. So uh, not as much uh, extra bang for your buck, so to speak, for those running the Cocodona this year. Uh, they're getting about 200 and 50 to 252 miles uh, uh, based on our estimates. Yeah, keeping it pretty close to 250. Some of that comes from, um, you know, a reroute out of Sedona. So runners going to leave Sedona a similar way or the same way that they left last year. Yeah. Um, versus year one, they took kind of an entirely different route up to the Coconino Plateau. Um, so I think that that's kind of one way uh, that they really cut down on miles. But Chris, can you kind of lay the foundation for what we can expect here in day one? What kind of, um, as we just saw Pete Kostelnik a few minutes ago there, what kind of uh, terrain are the runners going to be traversing? I know that especially this first 50K section, you haven't necessarily run all these trails per se, but you've run a lot in the area at some of these other Air Viper races. So what can runners kind of expect uh, here on day one? Yeah, uh, the course is actually going to be very similar to uh, the terrain on the Black Canyon 100K. There's, It's going to be rocky. It's going to be um, a lot of, I, but rather than being downhill such as Black Canyon, it's going to be uphill. They're going to have, uh, like we said, 10,000 feet of climb on their way up to uh, Crown King, which yeah, at, at mile 37 is going to be a, a very welcome site. They're actually going to crest out at Lane Mountain uh, at about mile 33 or 34, and it, it's going to be all about heat mitigation. It's going to be about evaporative cooling, about uh, avoiding the heat. I hope that these runners uh, follow the prescribed <laughs> water uh, suggestions. I believe that four liters was the absolute minimum that they have to be carrying when they leave Cottonwood. That's a lot if you think about it. The average hydration pack that most people are used to carries two liters or one and a half liters. So these runners are going to be uh, instructed and expected to carry twice what they normally would, but they're going to need every bit of it because from mile 11 to mile 33 there is a water station drop at about mile 21 or 22, but after that they are pretty much on their own. Yeah, and actually I believe that the uh, what was normally the mile 11 aid station has actually been moved That's as right. well due to um, the terrain being a little bit a little bit rough to get out there given the the you know the rain and stuff like that that they've had. So I believe the mile 11 aid station is now around mile 8. Yes. Um, and then there's a water drop. Yeah, around mile I believe 21 to 25, somewhere uh, in that ballpark. So while that's still a pretty long stretch, um, in the inaugural year when runners ran this first section, they didn't have any water from mile 11 to mile, what is it, 31, 32? Yeah, it was a 20 like plus mile K. stretch. Yeah, and I think you saw a lot of carnage uh, because of that. And so hopefully, you know, we don't see as much carnage. I believe, I'm going to pull up the weather here real quick. I believe it's going to be a fairly warm uh, day today still. As you can see, we're about eight minutes from the start, and you can see a, a, a packet pickup. Uh, it looks like everybody's pretty well checked in. You'd think they'd have to be at this point. 
unless they're uh, pulling a Michael Versteeg 2022 and showing up at the literal last moments. Running through the start line in sandals uh, shortly after the race started. And so the high for today in Black Canyon City, which is where the race starts, is 88 degrees. So going to be pretty warm uh, today. It'll cool down as they get higher in elevation, but 88 degrees with primarily full sun exposure, uh, it's going to be a toasty one. Today. Yeah, yeah. It's going to get, um, once they hit the elevation, it will cool off as far as what the highs will be. But when they're hitting Crown King, it looks like they're probably going to be looking at the lower to mid 70s, which in that Arizona sun can definitely be something to contend with. As I mentioned, I'm hoping that these runners are actually going to be wearing shade. When I run out in the desert here, I always wear sleeves now at this point. I'm just so used to it. I don't. I know that some people prefer to run in tank tops to try and stay cool, but I, I prefer to try and stay covered because I know that it's really easy to get cooked out there in a hurry. Yeah, and based on what I'm hearing from our team who worked the expo, we sold about 25 to 30% of the runners the Cocodona kind of sun shirts this year. Uh, so they purchased them at the expo. So a lot of runners picked picked up some sun, some sun safe gear at the expo. I'm assuming that most runners uh, are going to have some sort of sun protection plan um, coming into the race there. There you see Howie Stern getting all set up. Runners getting close as we're about five minutes or so away from the start of if the third Cocodona 250. We've got some intel from John Marushek uh, in the chat. Looks like mine is not lining up with what we have in here, but uh, John mentioned that mile 11 is now another water station. So that's actually advantageous, even yep. though it is close by, you know, <laughs> if, if you can, you know, get a leader into your system between mile eight and mile 11, that'll allow you to be ready for what is yet to come. Yeah, and I believe that is going to be the, uh, the infamous Ken Rubley uh, water station. Uh, yes, for those who are familiar, Ken Rubley uh, is the director of Beyond Limits Ultra in California and also was the former race director of Jackpot Ultras uh, in Henderson, Nevada. Yep. Not Las Vegas. Yeah, Henderson. The beautiful town of Henderson, Nevada. Didn't Glaze just run Canyon? Yes, Bradford. Glaze just ran canyons, and Glaze has joined us here at the start line uh, for the Cocodona 250. We are again just a few minutes away from the start. Of what would the term for third annual be? Um, I think that that nails it. Just third, third annual. annual. There's no fancy word for it. We should. Well, by the end of the stream, we'll have created something. Oh, we we'll create guarantee. plenty of terms along the way, as uh, you have been able to do over the last couple of years, uh, such as the uh, the famous iconic left on birch, Cocodona Alley. Yep. I, I, however, do want to address the the elephant in the room. We we were not able to uh, to get a, an agreement with Coca Donuts, the donut company based out of the Pacific Northwest. So, unfortunately, no Coca Donuts on course this year. But we'll keep we'll keep using the term. And anyone who's uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, just know I was hoping there is in fact a place named Coca Donuts, like a coffee and Coca Donuts thing. Um, what we see uh, Howie Stern uh, taking photos of the runners at the front of the pack at the start line. Uh, as I was wandering around town yesterday, I, I ran into several runners, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about some of their, uh, their names and experiences. Um, and the energy was really exciting. I, I, just, I was having coffee at my favorite place to have coffee in town, um, uh, Macy's just down on the other side of the tracks. And the the runners are 
are really excited. One runner had run 200 plus miles before, had run uh, one of the Triple Crown races. The other one had never done anything like this before. And so uh, uh, looking forward to see how they do. Matt Moore was one of them who had never run his first uh, uh, 200 before, uh, bib number 24 out of Tulsa. And uh, Adam Adoski from uh, Salida, Colorado, bib number 114, um, had previously run Moab. So uh, I had a nice uh, little cup of coffee with them and was able to appreciate their excitement. And uh, one of the things about Cocodona that's so great when you talk about this, this event is that we are going to be covering some amazing athletes at the at the start and in the lead pack here for the first you know, day or two even. But then as the, the race progresses and the podium is uh, determined, we're gonna be able to pivot to the mid and back of the pack extensively and show uh, a lot of stories and tell a lot of stories and a lot of times we'll learn about these runners in the chat as their uh, friends and family give us information and intel on them as uh, we see a great shot of the start finish line a drone shot is that uh, Troy Wicks that is Troy Wicks himself gracing us with the uh, with the beautiful aerials here Look at, just look at this atmosphere compared to where we were at in, uh, in year one, Chris. Oh yeah, well extenuating circumstances made it a, a bit crazy. We're about uh, 35 seconds from the start here, but that's a beautiful shot right there. Yeah, and it's starting to already give me goosebumps here just thinking about what all of these crazy folks are about to embark on uh, over you know the next three to five and a half days. Um, there's about 200 runners that are towing the line for the 250 mile distance. Yep. And I do see, I think we have a Versteeg sighting on the right hand side of the start line. Yep, oh, and it looks like he is in shoes today. So here we go. We're gonna keep it on this drone shot for a little bit and then we do have Good, our good man Bryce, boots on the ground there, um, getting us all, getting us all taken care of. This is one of the more exciting scenes in my mind. Watching these runners take off. We didn't get it last year because of the rerouted course and the later start time. Um, you know, watching them just traverse these trails by, by nothing but their headlamp. So how far do you think Bryce is going to go with that lead pack right there? Do you think he's going to... He said he was going to go, and here we got Bryce right here. He said that he was going to go a fairly good ways, but it may also be dependent on uh, when he runs out of service as well. So, and then we also have... Yeah, so we have our, our drone in the sky. We've got Bryce... And again, this is, uh, we haven't started at um, Rock Springs Cafe here since the inaugural year. And during that year, um, due to the pandemic that we will no longer speak of, right? Yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, there were about. wave starts. So I think the final runners didn't leave, didn't start until 7 a.m. And then you've got the long, hot stretch with no water. So I think that all of those things um, kind of compounded quite a bit. That's correct, and that's an excellent point because I actually had a conversation with somebody who was asking when the uh, when the race was finished, and when I realized it was 10 a.m., I, I, I didn't think about the fact that we had two hours worth of starts the first year of Coconut yeah. 250, so I had to kind of recalibrate my brain on there. As we just saw bib number 14 right there, uh, Megan McCarty, one of our, uh, uh, one of the people that we talked about as a potential favorite for uh, making the podium this year. Uh, she is in the maroon shirt and yellow shorts. I believe I also saw Bid number 20, Garrett Nelson, uh, up there as well. Uh, we'll be following a lot of runners, of course, over the next few days. 
And we did our preview show, uh, Andy Jones Wilkins and I did on uh, about a week ago, and we, we named some of our favorites. Uh, have you gotten a chance to take a look at the race roster at all and kind of make some thoughts or have some expectations? Yeah, I've looked at it, and I think just having having uh, been a part of the race the last two years, I've come to learn not to have expectations. <laughs> uh, but I think that I think that one of the really cool things is you have just so many really talented runners. Yes. Right, and some of those runners are going to do really well, mm-hmm. and some of those runners are going to going to have really rough days. We saw it last year, right? Versteeg uh, came in. He was a little dinged up um, and wasn't able to have the race that he wanted. You had Eric Sensman, who's been hyper successful at uh, shorter distance ultras, 100K and, and lower. Um, he had a really tough day. But then you had people like Mike McKnight and Joe McConaughey, who you expected to do well. Um, do well and the same on the women's side you expected Annie Hughes and Sarah Ostazewski to do well and, and they both did well whereas you know some other people who had you know championship pedigree um, maybe struggled so I think that you know the thing I'm most excited about like in terms of a storyline to follow is how Mike McKnight handles uh, handles the heat I know that that's something he's struggled with in the inaugural year at Cocodona. Um, he struggled with on his AZT attempt. Um, you know, is this where, is this the race where he, you know, gets the, the monkey off his back, right? Like he had a really strong run last year on the altered course, but is this the race where he, you know, tackles those heat and cooling challenges um, and really overcomes? And so that's one of the real interesting storylines I'm I'm looking at, I think, on the women's side, <coughs> one of the things I'm interested to see is um, how well Sally McRae does. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think that obviously she's a veteran ultra runner. Um, she's never done anything like this, really, but um, she's done her due diligence and her crew is made up of people, basically, who uh, have experience on the course. I know that um, Summer Ego, I go. Summer Igo, um, is one of the one of the members of her crew team. So um, she's been out at the race in various capacities, both the last two years. I know that Bryce Brooks, who's on our uh, marketing and media team, he'll be helping out with. Um, you know some of the uh, some of the crewing there in the early parts of the race, and then she also has um, uh, Shelby Farrell. Yeah, is uh, one of her crew and pacers. So twenty twenty one finisher. Twenty twenty one finisher. Um, a lot of experience on the course, so um, I think Sally's doing a, a good job of you know checking as many boxes off as she can, right? But the end of the day like a race like this who knows who knows what's going to happen well uh, the who knows is i think it's a it's funny that you say that because i remember when we were in the early minutes of the 2021 live stream and we were soliciting expectations on the time frame and people were saying well is there going to be a runner that breaks 65 64 hours and everybody seemed to take the under, and we were all way off. Michael Versteeg, the first year, uh, was just over 72 hours to win the race. And then that kind of made us gun shy for year two. And the expectations were such, even with the altered course, that it would probably be you know, maybe a couple hours faster than that. But then string bean McConaughey, went and blew everything out of the water with a a sub-60 race where it looked like every time we saw him on camera, he was running. It was actually pretty amazing. Now, while the the finish times would not necessarily be something we could predict, I think that for the most part, we've been pretty accurate in terms of the who. Uh, We're not not blown away by who wins this race. 
you know, the first year we had Michael Versteeg and uh, um, uh, Maggie uh, Guterall. Like, yep. you're talking about, you know, world-class, you know, distance runners. And the second year, we had String B McConaughey and Andy Hughes. No surprises there. Yep. Uh, this year, I think that it would be along those same lines that uh, it's going to involve somebody who's got the pedigree to do it. Although, an interesting thing about that is that one of the runners on the men's side is somebody without, one of the favorites, in fact, is somebody who, quote, doesn't have an ultra sign up. And Josh Perry. Yeah, Josh. That's. I think that because of that, he always flies under the radar for me. Yeah. Uh, personally, you know, when I'm listing off names, he's one that I always unintentionally skip over. But he has a pretty stout. Uh, what is it? Through hiking background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's got an FKT resume, including uh, one of the uh, Arizona Trail um, FKTs as well. Yep, that's correct. So a lot of. Uh, it's like a battle of Arizona T FKT holders out yeah. there. At one point or another, Michael Versteeg uh, held the record at one point. Um, Jeff Garmeyer held mm -hmm. or holds the record. And then uh, Perry, Mr. Perry, holds the record as well, right? Um, and he's also got Pacific Press Trail yep. uh, FKTs as well. So, Yeah, and very, very interesting because it's a similar story to Garmeyer in year one. Right, mm -hmm. where he came out with not a whole lot of ultra running experience, and uh, still had a pretty solid, a pretty solid run. Was able to really leverage his um, problem solving ability. Right, like yeah. I think that that's one of the biggest things that this race is about. Is you know over the course of a number of days, rather over the course of a week, you're going to have to solve a lot of problems. Uh, and the better you can do that, the better your chances are of having a having a successful day. It's it's funny to bring up Garmeyer too because we've seen an evolution of him over the two years as we've gotten to know him. Um, when he came in, he was known primarily as an FKT uh, specialist. Uh, he had practically no race results to his name and uh, was considered you know, more of a through hiker. And uh, he's made a, an interesting pivot because his last couple races that I've I've seen him at uh, have included the last person standing event at Across the Years and the Jackpot Ultra 48 Hour in La in Henderson, Nevada. And it's interesting because those races couldn't be more different than a, an FKT through hike attempt because they're both looped one mile courses and he's had success at everything. And now as a result, he's joined the Air Viper racing team and He's shown that uh, not only is he, you know, capable of handling you know long distances, he's capable of actually being like a competitive runner, which, which was a little bit of a surprise. Plus, I saw his uh, pre-race photos. He's looking yoked right now. <laughs> he was, uh, he was looking uh, uh, quite buff in his uh, his pre-race photo yesterday. So uh, he looks ready and primed. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is is a unique character in the sport, right? Very. I think that I think that he's just such an interesting person, and I love that he's just like trying whatever, whatever he thinks he may find any interest in. He's just, oh, I'll try, I'll try it. Yeah, you know, he's done, he's done like like uh, park run five k type races <laughs> uh, in Crocs, of course. Um, he's done you know 5k's pushing strollers and then he's done all of these big mountain long fkt attempts and he's done kind of everything in between now and so it's really interesting just to see uh jeff kind of out there trying stuff and it looks like we're gonna lose that feed so let's go to the drone shot you see the sun starting to peek out yeah uh, that's gonna make for some great visuals here in the next uh, 15 to 30 minutes um, I see Maurice Lohman in the chat uh, uh, supporting some runners. Um, I met Maurice at Havlin 100 this year. He is the he was who helped us complete our map as far yeah. as the runners from every state 
uh, that have finished halfway in 100 when he became can the I first you finisher on, from Rhode Island. I was going to say, can I put you on the spot, and can you... Can you remember which state he's from? Oh, very much so, yeah. Uh, we we met uh, uh, randomly, and it just so happened that when I saw his name, I was like, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a great follow on Instagram for those who are into uh, social media as well. We'll be delving into the stories of these runners as well as, as time goes on. We've got a lot of time. And... Uh, you know, I'm really excited. Uh, this is going to be a long week, but it's also going to be a fun week. We're going to be on the air for anywhere from 85, 90 hours to possibly yep. 100 or more, depending on how things pan out. Yep. Yeah, I think that we will likely uh, have anywhere from 85 to 90, maybe a few more hours of live coverage this year. We will be going until... Uh, until about 11 p.m. ish tonight. Again, dependent upon uh, when the race leaders hit Whiskey Row. Um, but that is kind of what our journey is looking like today. Is we want to try and stay online until the race leaders hit Whiskey Row tomorrow. Uh, will be be a whole new day. We'll yeah. get to see see where everything is and how uh, how that shapes up. And as uh, you'll you'll see, we are, we're going to have it takes an army to handle a broadcast such as this. So, well, that's a beautiful shot right there of runners that are crossing a uh, cattle gate. Yep, uh, as they descend down into the black. This Canyon. is beautiful. So you can see the Agua Fria, or not the. It is the Agua. Yeah, the Agua Fria, yeah. right? Yeah, you can see it in the background as runners are going to kind of wind their way down before crossing. It's a beautiful This is one area. of my favorite sections of trail. This is on the Black Canyon course, correct? Yes. Once you leave um, Black Canyon City Aid Station, um, so this is probably around like mile 30, oh, 39. 7, 38, 39, yeah. yeah. Um, about a mile or so out of the aid station. And it's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, and shortly thereafter, they only follow the Black Canyon 100K course for maybe about the first two miles, and then they they cut across through trail systems towards Crown King, and then they are on trails that I'm not really all that familiar with. I've only done a little bit of that area uh, simply because I've never had to. <laughs> well, that's because that's when the course really starts to get pretty remote, right? Yeah. Like, Again, the Cottonwood Aid Station, which was meant to be at mile 11, was moved to mile 8 because they couldn't get the aid station vehicles out to mile 11. Yeah. However, Ken Rubley, being the legend that he is in his souped up, uh, his souped up Jeep, uh, is out at, it got out to mile 11. He said it took everything he had to get out there. Uh, in his in his jeep. That so. man knows how to throw a party. I will just leave it at that. <laughs> it's like we might have. Yeah, you know, there we go. We're just hovering there. I Again, have to admit, the water crossing isn't too bad there. No, no, that's not bad at all. I have to admit that if I were leading the Coconut 250 this early in the race, and I will never be leading the Coconut 250 this early in the race, or ever. But is is it advantageous to go out hot like this? Like some of these runners are taking it out pretty hard uh, in the early going. Well, someone's got to break the cobwebs. This is true, right? Um, no, but uh, I think that I think that at this point you're just kind of trying to stay comfortable and relaxed and we're going to get I can see Bryce following yeah. down there yeah and so Bryce will come in and out of service through this section quite a bit so I'll when he has him we will uh, try to get that on the ground coverage but I'm surprised we're I'm surprised we're getting footage from him at all down there because he's down in the canyon but this is a great drone shot uh, courtesy of uh, uh, Troy Wicks who does an excellent job with all of our event coverage here uh, with Air Vipa, in particular the Coconut 250. That's one thing for those who are tuning in for the first time that you're going to experience is the the footage that we get out here at, at the Coconut 250. 
it's beautiful down here in the lower desert. Um, and once you see the the forests up in Crown King, the rock formations, Sedona starting as a backdrop, it's visually stunning. And AJW and I talked about this that unlike other races, uh, maybe that are you know more faster down to business, such as Black Canyon or even Western states, that the course really is the star here. Now we're gonna have some great runner stories over the course of the next five plus days, but really what makes Cocodona so amazing is what you see the runners run through and traverse over the course of their race. Yeah, and again, we'll keep trying to test these uh, kind of follow cam feeds again. You're getting you're getting pretty remote out here, so they're going to come in and out of, uh, you know, how good they are. But we'll try our best to, um, you know, give you as dynamic of coverage uh, as we can here between the aerial shots versus um, the on-the-ground shots. And also, um, one of the things that's nice is that we have, for a race such as this, simply for health precautions, uh, we have a GPS based runner tracking. Yep, and so from time to time we'll be able to pull that up uh, on screen and um, and kind of yeah, be able to, especially as the race uh, as the race progresses and things get spread out, we'll be able to kind of show you where runners are at uh, on the on the course map. We also will have hopefully some uh, some good leaderboards that we're able to um, pull in throughout the course of the throughout the course of the race. I believe that's Jared Bird, bib number eighty-one, uh, who is basically uh, towards the back end of that lead pack, uh, heading out right now. Now, if you go to the runner tracker on uh, cocodona.com/live, it's going to look like a big jumbled mess, and that's because uh, the especially early on, it's, it's almost impossible to tell who's in the lead. You're gonna see things obviously spread out over time. You know, based on what I'm seeing, if it's, not that it's, not that it's really relevant to anything, but uh, I believe our leader at this point is uh, bib number 38, Don uh, Reichelt out of uh, Fair Play, Colorado. Shout out to him, uh, Speedland athlete. Oh, okay. Uh, so he, yeah, he is a, a Speedland athlete, one of our one of our great uh, sponsors of this race. And shout out to you know all of the brand partners who you know have believed in the vision this early on and have supported uh, what we're trying to do here. Like you said just a few minutes ago, Chris, it takes you know basically a small village to put on just the race. Yes, and it, t it takes a separate small village to put on the live stream. Um, you know, and so we couldn't do it without you know the support from all of our uh, all of our different brand partners. So. And and the sponsors they're taking a leap of faith because a few years ago coverage of of American trail and ultra running didn't exist. You know, I, I'm going to pat ourselves on the back here, but this is something that uh, Era Vipa and Steep Life Media has really brought uh, to the. Uh, to the audience to, because there is a want for it and a desire to see it so uh, and this is something that that really didn't have any uh, sponsorship interest in its in its initial time now that uh, we've shown that we can uh, cultivate an audience and bring you know some some great coverage you know p that people are starting to uh, people are starting to understand and believe so uh, we're gonna take a. I'll take yeah, a quick, quick look. It, we're gonna send it back to this drone as we've got more runners crossing the Agua Fria here. Oh, somebody take a. T okay, so oh, no, they're cooling already. No, so what this is, there were runners that were posting. There's a Facebook Coconut 250 runners page where some of the runners were expressing concern about a water crossing <laughs> so early in the race and wanting to keep their feet dry. So. <laughs> Andre Lee suggested to people that they carry, and, and Andre was the final finisher of the first year of Coconut 250, suggested they carry garbage bags and put them Classic. over their feet as they cross the water. 
So I think that as it looks like uh, it's a run, yeah, uh, unfurling a, a plastic bag to make the first water crossing. Well, that could be Andre. Uh, he's running Sedona Canyon. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> I, I have to admit. Look at this shot. I feel like it's, I think it's a little bit too early to be um, worried about things like that. I mean, frankly, you've got 247 miles ahead of you. Your feet are going to be wrecked no matter what. But that's also why you and I are sitting in the studio. This is true. And not out there like uh, like these uh, wonderful individuals. Excellent point. The, is that our lead pack? I think it's either. Not, I don't. Okay. No, I think that this is more middle of the pack here as they're making that yeah, little right. climb uh, up out of the Agua Fria still. So the Agua Fria section, when you first climb back out of it, it starts out really, really rocky. Um, but then you get out onto this like nice kind of winding single track. This time of year, you might not see too much cattle out quite yet. But they are right but off they are of the course. Typically, right on the course. Yeah. I know that I've run this section uh, multiple times with the legend himself, Rob Ricardo, <laughs> uh, and we we've seen we've seen many a uh, many a cattle out there, which is also one of the interesting things because they're still on the Black Canyon Trail uh, proper right now, mm -hmm. and that trail is kind of still utilized in ways for. Um, cattle farmers to like move their herds from uh, area to area and that's kind of one of the things that's been used for over uh, a big number of years. Yeah, yeah, I've done hundreds of miles on the Black Canyon Trail having run that race itself with four finishes and two more not so great days. So, you know, I've done training runs out there where I've been face to face with cows and it's, it's a little bit jarring to come across a, a 1,500 pound animal uh, as you come around a corner because you just don't know how they're gonna react. And I've had a couple of friends who have had some unfortunate encounters with some of the cattle, but you know, we have to share there the land out there. There have been some up there on the left uh, that we missed just a couple minutes ago. With some cattle? Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, I know that uh, our steady drone pilot, Troy Wicks, if he, if he sees any cattle, he'll make sure to get the shot for us, just, uh, just because that's the, the gentleman that he is. Troy does a great job. I'm really excited to be working with him again during this race. So He, uh, he was one of the drone pilots for Western States last year as well. That's so fantastic to hear. Shout out to, shout out to Troy. <laughs> Aaron Shimmins in the chat. I wonder if Sensman is having cold sweats. Uh, Eric uh, is going to be joining the commentary team, I believe, Wednesday evening. So yeah. he may, I don't, know, uh, I don't know what kind of mood he'll be in. He may be having, uh, he may be having nightmares at that point. <laughs> um, well, actually, no, I'm sure, I'm, sure Eric, uh, I'm sure Eric would love to be seeing this is coverage. That Sarah Ostaszewski? Yes, sir. Sarah Ostaszewski finished fifth in 2021, third last year in 2022, and is looking for that linear progress. If so, she will win the Coconut 20, 250 in 2023. She was actually my pick in our pre race preview. Nice. So, a solid, solid pick. Absolutely. Air Viper Racing Team member does the work out there. She is. Uh, a Flagstaff resident now, so she's on, a, on her way home. Yep. So, uh, and I know that her uh, her sister Melissa is among the people that are going to be crewing and pacing her this year. Uh, I'm sure that she has a, a very experienced, uh, robust team supporting her out there at the Coconut 250. Yeah, and one of the one of the like kind of interesting things about Sarah is she because Flagstaff got so much snow this year. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of her training has been down in Sedona, so she's been down getting on course, getting in a lot of the, a lot of the trails that the course will, um, will kind of run on or near, but also just like for a Flagstaff runner, she's been, you know, getting uh, into, um, uh, into the heat. 
Well, also, she did a lot of training down in New Zealand. Yep, she, she was ran. out for um, she was out for Tarawera, and stayed down there. And stayed for a down few there weeks for afterwards. a little bit after. Yep. So yeah, she spent most of the month of February down in uh, New Zealand. That's a wonderful visual right there. Is that our uh, um, Bryce cam? Yeah, that, that was got? Bryce, and we're gonna switch it back to the drone here. I got a message from the wonderful drone pilot Troy Wick saying Versteeg to the front. So, well, there's uh, no surprise in that. Um, Versteeg, in 2021, he went out hard and fast. Uh, Versteeg and uh, I believe it was Drew Fraze were uh, setting the pace early on in the 2021 Cocodona 250. And I believe that's Megan McArdle right behind bid number 14. course this is so early on in the race this is what uh, uh, 28 minutes or so so you're talking maybe two and a half miles in into a 250 mile race so they're one percent of the way done at this point so but it's always fun to prognosticate and uh, and try and see where everybody's going to be but Megan McCarty yeah I believe is who is following Michael Versteeg right there uh, as we get back to the lead back and uh, that is the Bryce follow cannon. Yep. It's a nice thing about having a fantastic athlete on a on a gimbal because uh, Bryce can keep up with these runners for a long time. I have no doubt that if his phone battery and his uh, and and if it were necessary, he'd be able to be able to follow them for most of the first thirty to thirty five miles without any uh, difficulties. Yep. Yeah. Bryce, an absolute. An absolute legend. He will be doing some media work, and then, like I said, he'll be um, uh, helping his his partner, his girlfriend, Summer, with uh, some of her crew responsibilities for Sally McRae in the first part of the week. Mm -hmm. And then he'll be uh, blessing the studio a little bit later in the week to, to help with some of the production. He produces a lot of the preview shows, a lot of the podcasts, stuff like that. Um, so shout out to Bryce. Uh, as always. And uh, so we've got our first Cocodona sunrise taking place. Uh, it's such a beautiful shot uh, of the desert. You can see a, a couple of saguaros dotting the landscape. One of the signature uh, features of the Cocodona 250 as uh, the runners handle the first day in the first part of the course. Of course, the course changes significantly by the time they hit Crown King because they are going to be hitting the, uh, the, the pine forests up in the Bradshaw Mountains. And, uh, and, and then it's going to change even more as they head further north into, uh, into the state. So you see Michael Versteeg on the right, and I think that we had established that as Megan McCarty uh, on the left, uh, following closely behind. Yeah, and you still got, everyone's still really grouped up here. And I think that, Chris, what you just said is one of the things that makes this race so interesting, right? Is you change in and out of so many different, um, like, geological ecosystems mm -hmm. uh, that it presents such a unique set of, of challenges, right? You know, today runners are going to go, you know, from Suaro Cacti filled, you know, Sonoran Desert up into the Pines and the Bradshaws before, um, you know, kind of meandering their way through Crown King down the Senator Highway and eventually ending up in, in Prescott, right? And so you're getting, you know, this low desert feel, this kind of not true high alpine, but higher alpine feel before you come back down into Prescott. Um, and then you kind of do the same thing, right? You cross yeah. Fane Ranch, then you climb up into the Black Mountains uh, up to Mingus Mountain. So get back up to, you know, around 7,000 feet feet, I believe, before dropping down and coming through um, the, oh, the Verde Valley. That's a wonderful shot. I believe that was, was that a Scott Rokas sighting that we saw out there? Yep. Um, Scott Rokas, one of our uh, course photographers, catching runners as they come up the hill. Um, it's just such a beautiful morning out there. Uh, it's uh, 67 degrees, which is going to feel nice and cool um, after the sun has established, established itself 
67 degrees is going to feel nice and warm. So it uh, looks like we uh, had uh, some generosity. Brittany Tapora, thank you for the generous Super Chat donation. We are grateful. Yeah, and we're, again, we're super appreciative of uh, everyone who's tuning in today, spending your Monday morning with us here. Well, but here's one of the fun things about this race and doing the coverage is that we are, we've kind of got a captive audience for the week because I know a lot of you out there, obviously it's uh, just, uh, it's only 5.30 here, but uh, later on the East Coast, these people are having this on in the background behind a few spreadsheets and uh, browser-based uh, work platforms so they can tune in. It's, it's not like on a, a race on a Saturday or a Sunday where they might uh, find themselves going out to do other things. A lot of times we get to hang out with them all week and, and we're gonna see a lot of the same names over and over again in the chat. We know how it goes. I, I've spoken with uh, business owners who have had it on in the background and uh, they say that uh, we are a detriment to their productivity. Man, the live chat is already is already popping. Uh, Austin cooking. Corbett wants to know when I'm running Cocodona. Well, I would never say never, but it's like as close to never as you can <laughs> currently get. Uh, as close to, as you can get without actually saying that. But uh, shout out to Austin. I believe he will be out along the course. His partner, Carrie Henderson. Oh, yeah. Again. That's the other thing, Austin. As long as Carrie is running, she's she's holding it down for the Illinois natives uh, quite well. So, uh, DeKalb, Illinois, Chris. DeKalb? Yep. DeKalb. Yeah, DeKalb. Uh, it's DeKalb County. Georgia. Northern DeKalb. Illinois University. Yep, Northern Illinois. I believe she's a U of I alum. Oh. Um, DeKalb, also uh, the hometown of Cindy Crawford. Yep. And Barb Wire. Yep. So... You're going to hear Chris also from originally from Illinois, so you're probably going to hear Chris and I when we're commentating just go on riffs about uh, about the Midwest. Sarah Ostazewski, basically from Illinois. They were from uh, nor northern Indi northwest Indiana. Okay. Um, so her sister even claims Chicago is home sometimes. Well, so that's... <laughs> you know. It's funny you say that because that was one of those things that I noticed when I was uh, uh, in college and... I had friends who, you know, connected in the early days of LinkedIn. Nobody ever said they were from Rockford. They always said they were from the greater Chicago area because they were trying to reach a greater uh, uh, realm of uh, potential recruiters for jobs. So yeah, not that I'm, I'm not ashamed of being from Rockford. I'm very proud to have uh, been born and raised there and spent the first 26 years of my life there. But, uh, but it's always funny to try and explain, I never, tell people initially that I'm from Rockford, I'll say, I'm from about an hour outside of O'Hare. See, that, that's a shame, Chris. <laughs> I always, I, the first thing I tell people when I introduce myself, I'm originally from Illinois. Like, Illinois Oh, proper, I say Illinois. But Illinois proper. Oh. You know, like, down in the cornfields, you know? Uh, so, yeah, everyone in the live chat is probably gonna, gonna get to listen to us talk about random, uh, Looks like we lost that feed there. James Random Austin, by Illinois stuff here in the chat, uh, watching from Dewey, Arizona. Can't wait to volunteer tomorrow night at Fane Ranch. Uh, James, Fane Ranch is going to be a party, by the way. Oh, Fane, we'll we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. But uh, thanks to James for uh, volunteering because that's one of the aspects about this race that is so vital is that volunteers help make this race happen. We have people that are working aid stations, uh, people who are helping. Uh, at various logistical concerns throughout the race. Um, you know, we have sweepers, uh, both for safety and for course cleanup. So we're grateful to have all of these people involved. And uh, these events don't happen uh, without that kind of support. Yeah, and uh, one of the things to look for, Fane Ranch has typically been the, how do I say it, the low spot in most runners uh race experience that might over change the years i think that this year uh it's going to change thanks to our partnership with uh satisfy running satisfy is going to be taking over the satisfy fane ranch aid station um 
So it's going to be uh, it's going to be an entire vibe out there. They're going to have some catering from Canyons and Chefs. They're going to have some recovery boots, a lounge, uh, all sorts of really awesome stuff. So um, it's going to be it's going to be pretty cool to see all of that kind of come to life and and how that how that turns out. Hey. Maria, thank you very much for the super chat donation. Um, Project Josh in the chat, rumors that Prestige has tiny houses all over the course for strategic 10 minute sleep stations. That's entirely possible simply because uh, oh, that's one gosh. of those things, Michael Versteeg being the fascinating, oh, what a beautiful shot. But Versteeg also built tiny houses, yep. um, like with compostable toilets and stuff like that. And he makes them available for sale. If you follow him on, uh, on social media, he'll occasionally post a, a brand new solar powered compostable toilet uh, uh, dwelling that he's built. and. Uh, and uh, they look really sharp, I have to say. You know, if I were able to do the whole off the grid thing, you know, I might actually talk to him about uh, building me something. John Marushik in the chat. There is a 26 foot box truck dedicated just to the interior decorating for Satisfy Faint Ranching Station. Good Lord. So, John <laughs> Marushik, uh, <coughs> warehouse manager, logistics coordinator, Sedona meme, 125 runner, uh, meme sharer, Sedona Canyons 125 runner, what else? Uh, John also a former Midwesterner from uh, the great state of Minnesota. I believe he's from Winona, Minnesota. Winona, Minnesota. That just rolls off the tongue. Uh, that's some great insight. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, that gets me even more amped up for for uh, what this aid station is going to uh, it's going to look like. Great visuals from some of the runners. And that's one of the cool things about being out there on the trails. There's Jeff Garmeyer right there. Jeff Garmeyer. Uh, one of our pre-race favorites, I believe, wearing bib number five. And, of course, Bryce decides to give pursuit. <laughs> well, he was running in front of him there for a minute. I'm glad that he... He's changed the follow cam. Bryce now becoming an expert in media lighting here a lot better. So you're getting a little bit better visual uh, of Jeff here. Jeff, just such an interest, like we said earlier, such an interesting character. And again, through this section, especially our follow cams are going to kind of go in and out of coverage. Most of our drones will be using Starlink satellites. So their connectivity will be a little bit better, but as we've learned over the various live streams, uh, both Aravipa and non-Aravipa events, satellites aren't uh, aren't dummy proof, right? Um, yeah. So they're gonna definitely enhance the coverage, but some places are just really out there. I just saw a sighting of Pete Kostelnik out there yep. on the course, uh, easily recognizable by his Hoka kit. Uh, Pete, uh, for him, this is a, a shorter, a shorter time uh, to be out uh, running. Uh, I know that Pete is actually moving to Flagstaff, so he's uh, maybe he while he's out there, he's gonna scout out some potential places to live. So, God, the chat is is going off on uh, Chicago pizza here. Not yeah. a single mention of Geno's that I've seen, by the way. Well, and, uh, so Geno's, I, I'm down with Geno's for the deep dish, like, but I only have deep dish once or twice a year because. Illinois natives know, and Chicago natives in particular know, that deep dish is kind of a tourist thing. I mean, we enjoy it, don't get me wrong, but you can only handle it once yep. every so often. Yep. Otherwise, you're going to look like, you know, one of the super fans from SNL thing. <laughs> like, you can only take so much uh, deep dish pizza. Now, uh, I believe that uh, Eric had uh, mentioned talking about uh, the tavern stuff. That's Chicago pizza to me, the square cut tavern yep. with sausage and nothing else, or maybe sausage and mushrooms or something like that, where it's like slightly burnt. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's Chicago pizza to me, and that I can eat all day long. And folks, you've got 90 plus more hours of us talking about everything ranging from pizza to whatever happens to catch our views. And again, these are great shots by uh, Troy Wicks here at the Coconut 250. We got some love for uh, Luminati's. There's Luminati's in um, in Phoenix. Yeah, Luminati's has a, a few it's locations. It's not the there. same though. It's 
It's not, but it's, it's, it's still gets good. the job done. Yeah. Looks like, is that... Uh, we've got a pack of runners coming around that corner. That might have been Kerry Henderson right there that just came through in that pack. And, of course, uh, you can see that um, if you look at the... Uh, uh, just to the bottom of your uh, YouTube feed, the runner tracking is available there. Of course, uh, it is way too early to uh, have the runner tracking have uh, um, significance as to how this race is going to pan out. But it's always fun to follow and see where everybody's at. So, Yeah, and some of these shots that Troy is getting of... Uh like the Bradshaws and the kind of the Agua Fria, the little Agua Fria kind of nook there, pretty incredible. Yeah, Troy knows what uh, what gets us all happy. And we're um, to Bryce here, following the Tiger Jeff Garmeyer, and he's dressed like a tiger. Uh, he's got uh, one of his tiger tops on out there. Classic. And in our way too early uh, uh, following of where everybody is at, it looks like Michael Versteeg and Sarah Ostaszewski are out in front. Of course, they do have about 247 and a half miles to go. So take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see just like how people look once they get kind of up to Crown King. Yeah. Um, and, and being able to like, try to recall what people looked like in year one. Like, I remember even Michael Versteeg coming into Crown King looking like he had just seen a ghost uh, after that first 50K. So we'll see if those added water stations, um, you know, help help a little bit. Also, a wetter year. I don't think in the inaugural year there was any water in the Agua Fria. No, um, no, there was not. So going to be some water out there. And as you move north on the course, you're definitely going to see more water on course, so uh, hopefully runners have um, filtration plans as well, which is something that could be really important. I was just going to bring that up. Uh, having spoken with a couple of runners, uh, Matt Moore and uh, Adam Adoski, bits number 24 and 114 during breakfast yesterday morning, uh, that they were both carrying filtration systems. In the case of Matt, it was the first time that he had ever done that. Uh, simply because they knew that in weeks past there had been a significant amount of water on the course. So, you know, might as well take advantage of it if it's there because, you know, better to have and not need than need and not have when it comes to uh, staying hydrated out there. As we just saw, Adam Arthurs, I believe, is who we are following right now. Um, uh, following uh, Jeff Garmeyer, a uh, runner that I'm not quite sure who it is, but then, yeah, Adam, that was Adam Arthurs right there, bit number 103. Yeah, this is this is great. Again, I know that um, most of the peaks up in Flagstaff still currently have snow, so I think that you're going to see um, a bit of water, especially in some of like the creeks and runoffs, as you make your way up into the Coconino Plateau. I would assume that Oak Creek uh, in Sedona is likely to have water as well still, but I. I'm not 100% did last week. sure. I think, yeah, I remember seeing photos, I think, last week um, of there still being quite a bit of water over there, so. Andre Lee in the chat. Matt and Chris, how far are the first cams running? I believe Bryce is going as far as he can go uh, before he completely loses cell coverage. Yeah, uh, mentioning Adam Arthur's right there. Uh, this looks like it's Adam's first race of longer than 100 miles. Uh, Adam based out of Canada, so uh, we'll see. You know how his uh, how his race goes, but uh, yeah, from North Vancouver, British Columbia. But he's run uh, several of the high-profile Canadian ultras, uh, such as uh, uh, Canadian Death Race 125. Uh, he's run that multiple times. Uh, but uh, if he's uh, hanging with the Tiger King, um, he might be in for a ride. Yeah, I mean, at this point, though, Jeff is like a well-oiled machine, I think, right? Like, he 
he understands ultra running now, having yeah. like actually competed in ultras. Uh, he's done Cocodona twice. He's finished on the uh, inaugural year course and finished quite well. Um, so I think that he's good company to keep uh, if you're you know if you're looking for someone to follow. We got Bryce here on another follow cam. I can't bid fifty one. Number 51 would be Chad Wright. Chad Wright. Yep. Chad Got Wright some. out of Georgia. Shout out to Georgia. That's right. One spent, of the uh, Yeah, spent about six years in the metro Atlanta area. Some underrated that? trail systems uh, in, in Georgia. Chad's done a, a few races, including the Georgia Jewel multiple times. Uh, it's a tough one. And uh, he's. Uh, uh, finished on the podium there. Uh, finished uh, second in uh, twenty nineteen and fourth in twenty twenty. So uh, we'll see if uh, looks like maybe bib eleven or seventeen right there. That's Aaron Barber right there. Uh, Aaron I can Barber. tell by the uh, the head. The head. Yep. Yeah, Aaron Barber, a uh, local runner here in Arizona, has uh, run Mogi and Monster and uh, pretty stout at the fifty k distance. But of course, this is a huge step up in difficulty and distance for him. He's coached by Pete Mortimer. Nice. So, folks, we've got plenty of time to tell you about all these runners, yep. and uh, we're going to leverage every bit of information we've got uh, with, uh, you know, several days to fill. Uh, bib number 88 right there. Um, I believe... I, I, I saw a lot of these people. Uh, Ed Shelton right there. Ed Shelton, uh, I believe, out of Texas. Uh, some of these people I recognize, some of these people I'm just winging it, but yeah, uh, Ed Shelton from Cedar Park, Texas. Uh, we'll get uh, bits and pieces of all these runners. And yeah, I know that Bryce and uh, Aaron were friends, or are friends, so they, uh, that's probably why he um, wanted to follow uh, Aaron for a little bit as well. And Aaron, I believe, uh, I believe he was on one of our uh, uh, preview podcasts with uh, Jeff Garmeyer. Ed Shelton has run uh, Brothers Bend, uh, veteran of the 200s, has run Tahoe 200 as well. So uh, Ed Shelton um, uh, out on the course, uh, as we just saw. And again, they're starting to get pretty out there. So we may run in and out of, of coverage here. We'll work on getting our drones back up. I think we'll, oh, there's Pete Kostelnik right yep. there in the blue and orange. <laughs> Lots of smiles uh, at this point in the race. Well, that's how course. you can tell it's early, right? Yeah, it's the, folks, they've been out here for less than an hour. So uh, I'm not saying that they won't be enjoying themselves, but uh, it is quite early. So uh, we'll see how long they're able to keep their dispositions so sunny. Brian Gear, thank you very much for the generous uh, Super Chat donation. Shout out to the Washington Peaks and good luck to all. A uh, beautiful sunrise shot. Oh, that's what it's all about. That's what's so great about running in the desert uh, at sunrise. It's, it's still tolerable from a weather standpoint. Now Bryce is starting to head his way back down the course and probably going to pick up uh, some of the... Uh, Mid Packers here. Is that bib number 13 right there? Looks like that's Carrie Henderson yep, right there. That's Carrie yeah. Henderson. And Carrie has run this race before. So yep, she. Finished last year. I don't remember if she ran the inaugural year. Um, Carrie works with uh, Wilderness Volunteers as well, who's one of our uh, charity partners for the event, doing a lot of uh, great work to help maintain trails and parks that we all uh, love to love to explore. Right. So, shout out to Carrie not only for her incredible <coughs> uh, her incredible journey. Here that she's undertaking, but also for you know all the incredible work she does in her professional capacity. 
Yeah, Carrie had a very respectable race last year, finishing in sixth place yep. among the women. Um, that's a, you know, that's tall timber in a in a race such as this. That was group number forty-two, John Thompson out of Texas. Seven four right there. Sean Barnes. I saw somebody giving Sean some love in the chat. Sean out of Idaho. See, this is how you you get uh, seen in the Coconut 250 live stream. You put your bib on the back on your. Uh, on your pack, and we'll have a, a better ability to to follow and see who you are, because our our follow cams are typically literally going to be doing just that following. It's such a, a beautiful shot of the sunrise as the uh, sun sun starts to peak over the mountains here uh, in Arizona. It is, uh, as you can see, just before six a.m. locally. So we're also just waking up. Oh, is that? Uh, Bib number 168. So I actually had a great conversation. Oh, it almost took a tumble. So that is uh, Tommy, uh, what is Tommy's last name? Um, bib number 168, Tommy Jacobson. So Tommy Jacobson is a foreign runner. He's from Denmark. Nice. And uh, I was talking with him yesterday. I ran into him uh, on the streets of Flagstaff. He had all of his gear with him, all packed. And, and so it was pretty obvious to tell that he was running Okadona. So he did the Triple Crown in 22, and uh, he's 62 years of age, and he runs to raise money for children's charities in India, and ra has raised over the past several years an average of $35,000 per year uh, to send kids in India to school. That's incredible. It's an ex you know, this is one of the cool things about doing this coverage is that we get to know these runners. So yeah, bid number t uh, 168, Tommy Jacobson is, uh, uh, like I said, I got to, a chance to meet him on the streets of Flagstaff yesterday, and just a, a, a very, very uh, friendly guy. Where's Sensiman, John? Probably in bed. <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully... Finn, uh, Finn is awake? Finn uh, is apparently awake. So uh, Finn is uh, going to be part of our uh, team here in the Cocodona House uh, up here in Flagstaff. Uh, Finn Melanson and Brett Horneg will be uh, handling the midday shift here. We gave them the, uh, the downstairs bunk beds. <laughs> <laughs> the the stepbrothers? Yeah, so I'm curious as to whether Finn got bottom bunk or top bunk. <laughs> we'll have to ask them. Uh, they can share their... Uh, Experiences, of course. This is the first time they've been to Flagstaff. We went out to dinner last night, yep. uh, and uh, did what runners do, and uh, had pizza cotta. Um Love it, Bryce. Getting some uh, some love out on the course. Getting some fist bumps. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're happy to see Bryce at this point in the race. You know, he's uh, he's going to help bring the energy up and, and keep these uh, runners in good spirits whenever he sees them. So. Uh, and, and I'm sure that Bryce is, I hope he's got his, uh, his watch on, because I want to see how many miles he takes in over the course of this week. It's going to be... He got in, so last year for Cocodona was, one, was his first Cocodona experience uh, on the media team. And he got in quite a few, he got in quite a few miles. Exogenous ketones are the random ballers of the Cocodona 250. <laughs> Oh man, Classic. we're starting early, aren't we? Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> and we're going to throw it to our next drone shot here as Jason is up in the sky. Not exactly, it looks like that is frozen. Possibly. It's a, No, it's moving. Oh, is it? Oh yeah, there it is. He was just hovering. So Jason, I met Jason, uh, he came down from Utah to help film uh, the drone footage this year. And I, I'm really excited to see what he brings to us as well. Uh, such a 
such a gorgeous landscape. I mean, we gush about it, but there's a reason that we gush about it. Uh, this, there's a reason that this is our home in Arizona. And one of the most wonderful things about Cocodona is the fact that we get to share it all with you, get to share it with an audience that is, um, you know, maybe in some cases not familiar with what we have to offer out here. And this you know, shot here, I think, just showcases the the like vastness and beauty of this landscape, right? Like when you think of Sonoran Desert, you think of like brown dirt and cacti, right? Um, obviously there is that, but yeah. this showcases like just the, the landscape diversity. And he's flying out of uh, mile 11, I believe, um, which is the old Cottonwood Aid Station, which will also be where we get our uh, incredible Ken Rebelli site. I Ken can't Rubley wait to see. Uh, I can't wait to see Ken out there. Um, we'll get to chat with him as well. He said, "Matt, if you don't text me, <laughs> let me know that you want to talk to me. I'm going to be disappointed." And I said, "Ken, we'll check in with you, buddy." Ken has a, a bit of that P.T. Barnum in him <laughs> in terms of his. Uh, 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 in regards to the Arizona and Southwest Trail and ultra running scene, he is kind of the P.T. Barnum. And I mean that in the most endearing fashion. He is he is the consummate showman. At one point, he was contemplating taking a snow cone machine out to this aid station. <laughs> and mind you, this aid station, this, or not even an aid station, this place is, is so remote and like the everything is so rugged that we couldn't get a truck to put an aid station there. We had to move the aid station further up course. So I don't think he ultimately uh, took the snow cone machine, but he will be treating runners to some extra water and uh, a lot of fun out there. Can we do a quick flip to the start line cam really quick? I just want to show people like, so uh, now that the Cocodona 250 has started, we can go back to the, the drone shot, but I just wanted to show that uh, that's, uh, Things are moving and hopping constantly throughout the week. So now the people who are, are, are helping to break down the Cocodona 250 start line are gonna make their way up to Jerome and start to set up the Sedona Canyons 125 start line, which on Wednesday morning will uh, will be underway. And we'll talk about the field for the Sedona Canyons because there's a couple of very stout names in that field uh, that'll be taking part. Uh, but. Uh, this first couple days, we're going to spend our time getting to know and appreciate the runners of the Coconut 250. John, we should get Deep Dish Pizza for lunch and review. There is no Deep Pizza, Deep Dish in Black. I feel like that, uh, that's going to set us up for a rough afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I'm really going to respectfully decline. Um, like, I, I, I I'll do my Geno's once in a while when I head back home to visit, but that's about it. Geno's is interesting because they have a corn-based uh, yeah. like base and crust. Right? And a sausage so, patty. So it makes it, a, it tastes inherently very different than uh, most of the other deep dish pizzas in Chicago. Yeah. And it, it sits heavier too, <laughs> yes. to be honest. And I say that even as a huge fan of it. We back see we've got a pack of here. runners. Uh, following the trail as Bryce is uh, giving us some shots. Of course, uh, where Bryce is at is not exactly littered with cell towers. Is oh, it's the Jester. The, yeah, the Jester was a late ad. Did you know that? I did not. I saw a photo of him, actually, Yeah, uh, uh, at the pre-race briefing yesterday, so I should have known. The Jester at Eddinghausen uh, is a participant in Cocodona, Cocodona 250 this year, a late ad. And I'll be honest, I'm curious to see how this race goes for him because <laughs> while the Jester has run over 200, 100 milers and has won uh, many of them and participated in 200 milers as well and done many multi-day races, this is a different animal for the Jester. Um, I know from speaking to him in the past about his experiences at uh, the Mogollon Monster, another rough and rugged Arizona race that uh, he's not used to the uh, uh, the rugged courses, and Cocodona definitely qualifies as one of those. So, uh, well, uh, Ed is one of the 
grittiest athletes and uh, most uh, persevering athletes in the trail and ultra running scene, this is not quite his bag uh, as far as uh, what he would be good at or specializing in. So I hope he has a good race. I really do. But this is definitely not what uh, he is uh, he's used to. Yeah, folks, I'm just kind of sink, uh, soaking in that beautiful uh, drone shot from uh, Jason, a member of our uh, team that is new to the team this year. And uh, this is what it's all about, the, the beauty of uh, the Arizona desert in all its glory at sunrise. Oh, if you want to, yeah, if there's a question or two. Question for the commentators. Uh, what are some of the most interesting gear choices, strategies? I saw a check-in in the start. Um, I would say, for I didn't see many of the bag check-ins. I saw a few of the runners uh, pick up their packets uh, down at Aeropipa headquarters. And then uh, I saw some of them board the shuttle back from Flagstaff. I would say that the plastic bags already for... Uh, uh, for water crossings a couple miles into the race was a bit of an interesting choice. Um, I wouldn't uh, have, have done it, but then again, like you said, we're not running this race, so. Yeah, exactly, right? We're, uh, we're sitting in this uh, beautiful studio, nice, cool air conditioning while, uh, while these runners have to worry about, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of different issues. Oh, come on, John. Bucket hats are so 2021. I don't know. Uh, you might you might frustrate the the uh, mob in the chat. Here, yeah, get them riled Kevin up. Kevin Goldberg, I'm assuming, is going to be wearing a bucket hat at some point. <laughs> uh, and you know, the chat is already full of uh, big Goldberg energy. So yeah, that is one thing that will uh, be driving the the chat and the uh, the discourse over the course of the week is the uh, Kevin Goldberg fan club. You know, it's good for the engagement. Oh, for sure. It better to have the engagement than not have it. So, uh, you know, that's one of the things that uh, is, is cool about this race is that the coverage is not only uh, us with cameras out on course, but it's also the discussion that we have with the people that are watching and viewing. Uh, at this moment, I want to give a shout out to the uh, two time finishers of the Coconut 250 who have decided to tell the line for a third, third time. Uh, Jeff Garmeyer, who we've already mentioned, uh, uh, Andrew Glaze, Sarah Ostaszewski, Sarah uh, Courtney Boyle, uh, Wes Plate, Ryan Janzik, Aaron Fisher, Carl Balloon, and Jose Sosa. So those individuals, those nine, uh, are going for Cocodona finish number three. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Just the fact that so many people after year one came back and were like, ah, I'll do it again. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty impressive. And uh, as uh, for those that aren't familiar, the 2021 course, the original course, uh, differed from the 2022 course because the 2022 course started in Prescott and was rerouted due to wildfires. Now the 2023 course is largely the same, but there were a few differences later on. Uh, rather than um, going straight north uh, from Sedona, they actually kind of dogleg east a little bit. They're not going up Kasner anymore, if that's my understanding. They're not going up Kasner grade or something. They're going up Kasner mountain climb. Because it's the original like a different, it's an it's a different path that is also named Kasner. Okay, because the original Kasner climate, you know, as the runners would get to the Coconino Plateau, was brutal. Yeah, and that was uh, 
going out more more westward, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, whereas now they're going to kind of go more through Oak Creek um, and kind of climb up that way, ending up closer to the I-17 corridor. And it looks like we've got our first set of runners coming through here. And good morning in the desert. Look at, again, another beautiful shot of... Uh, of the, I guess I, I guess they're still technically in the Black Canyon area as they start to approach the Bradshaws. I mean, they're still only yeah. about five, six miles in at this point. Yeah, and once they get through that Cottonwood Aid Station, they will really start to. Um, they'll start to climb more into like the Bradshaws proper. Yeah. Right. Like right now, they're kind of meandering around. Uh, the foothills are the base of the Bradshaw Mountains. Um, but in a matter of moments, they will be uh, they will be making their way out there. Uh, right now, uh, in the way too early uh, uh, settings of the Coconut 250, it looks like our uh, our pace setters are Sarah Ostaszewski on the women's side and Michael Versteeg on the men's side. Obviously, as we mentioned, they are, Sarah Ostaszewski is roughly uh, six and a half miles in, uh, as is Michael Versteeg. So nothing to get uh, um, too excited about. Uh, you, you can't win a 250-mile race in the first seven miles, but you can definitely uh, alter your trajectory if you're not careful. Again, this, I believe this shot is, oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, I was going to say, um, I believe, uh, wow, mentioned in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. I just realized they actually are still on the Black Canyon course yep. at this point. Yep. Um, and uh, so they're coming out of that that climb. You hit the, that water crossing, you know, two miles out of the aid station at about, in Black Canyon, 100K, about, mile 39 so uh, they're creating the, they're completing the climb out and that's when they actually divert from the black tank of course you are correct uh, good uh, good on you there uh, thanks for uh, correcting me there Rick Nielsen's Kenny talking about Pizza, Rick Nielsen's Peace Pizza and Brewery is the place. Is that Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick Bang? So yeah, that is actually Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick Bang. I actually used to work with his son at a bank. No kidding. Yep, Dax Nielsen. So Dax uh, is... Uh, now the drummer of Cheap Trick. That's sweet. Yeah, so uh, when he, Dax Nielsen, was working with me at a bank in, in Rockford, Illinois, and I asked him, because at the time he was a local musician, I said, what are you doing working at, at this bank? And he said, oh, Dad told me I had to get a real job. <laughs> and now his real job is as the drummer of uh, one of the great power pop uh, bands of the 80s, and of today, because they still tour like crazy. That's awesome. So I've seen them in concert, I think, like 10, 11 times. Big fan. Is the live tracker up? Yes, Damien, it is. It's actually right below the, or linked to the live tracker is right below the, uh, uh, the video window on YouTube. So uh, we've got links to uh, the Cocodona live tracker, uh, the Cocodona 250 website itself, if you wanted some further information as well as the uh, merchandise. Uh, we'll be highlighting some of that. Uh, of course, uh, Matt and I are sporting some of it, and uh, 
we'll share uh, if you want the, the coconut bucket hats. The did you see the sandals, Matt? I did. Oh, the coconut sandals are actually pretty sweet. Um, but we've got uh, some some great uh, uh, some headgear, some uh, some cool looking shirts. I'm a big fan of the long sleeve shirts. We even have. The Coconut 250 Blend Coffee from Long Run Coffee. Yep, and they were in the chat earlier, so shout out to Long Run Coffee Co. Helping us, uh, they've done a Black Canyon Habilina and Cocodona Blend uh, for us. So. I hope that the Cocodona Blend is the most potent it needs to be, <laughs> frankly. I, I couldn't disagree with you. And as we were mentioning, uh, we did... Uh, um, talk about some of the people that will be joining us on the Coca Dona 250 live stream coverage here this week, the first week of May. Oh, happy May Day, by the way. Oh, yeah. In Australia, what they do is pinch and a punch first day of the month. So, oh. So live on air, I just, uh, I just got <laughs> Chris. But. Of course, uh, Matt uh, spent uh, much of the beginning of the year in Australia, so he's reacclimating, repatriating himself, as it were, to uh, our American customs. <laughs> yeah, just getting back into it, you know? Uh, some of the people that will be joining us this week, uh, as we mentioned, uh, Finn Melanson and Brett Hornig uh, from the uh, Single Track Podcast, they will be uh, taking you through the middays uh, this week. And I know that they're excited. We've been hanging out. Uh, they got into town last night, and uh, we had a good time at dinner. And then I showed them where Heritage Square is, showed them where the left on Birch. And, uh, Most Coca iconic left-hand turn in all of sports. Yes. Uh, I mean, some, pe you know, some people might figure uh, turn four at Daytona, but I think left on Birch is far more iconic yeah, or that just be incorrect or like, rounding third at Yankee that. Stadium that's yeah. that none of that compares to left on Birch um, also uh, we'll have uh, some of our you know in, in our case we're, we're gonna have some friends coming in to hang out with us over the course of the week we're gonna have uh, uh, 2022 competitor and uh, trail runner extraordinaire Eric Sensman joining us yep uh, later this week um, I also, I'll be having uh, a, a couple of co-hosts for Aerobyte by After Dark this, this year, including, uh, I believe tonight, our, uh, our scheduled guest is the one, the only, the trail gangsta himself, Rory Monahan. Love it. So tr Rory will be joining me in studio uh, tonight. Uh, tomorrow night, I'm expecting uh, uh, a friend, well, Rory's a friend, but uh, my coach, Pete Mortimer, and uh, 2021 second place finisher. He will be uh, hanging out tomorrow night and uh, we'll have uh, 2022 finisher, uh, Karen Brown on Wednesday. Um, Thursday night, uh, still a little bit up in the air. And then on a Friday night, uh, uh, we'll be joined by uh, Pedro Gomez and uh, Colleen Lingley. So uh, yeah, that's gonna be awesome. Great lineup. Um, so. Uh, we hope that uh, you have cleared your decks for the week because we're going to have um, uh, all sorts of people uh, joining us here this week at uh, the Coca-Cola 250. John, if you want Corinne Malcolm on the broadcast, you can fly her here. We'd be happy to have her on. We've worked with her before. She's great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Then we've got, uh, will AJW be dropping in? AJW, unfortunately, won't be dropping in for this live stream, he had some uh, family obligations to tend to. I believe he's still volunteering out at Crown King uh, Aid Station today. Yeah. Um, and then he has to make his way to the Beast Coast for uh, for his son's graduation. So, yeah. no AJW for this one. We are just as sad as everyone in the chat probably is, but uh, shout out to AJW. Glad that he's uh, back in back in Arizona. It John just said, feels right. John said deal. So apparently, Corinne, your uh, your flight. Uh, your John, we'll let you mail. coordinate all of the uh, all of the details directly with Corinne, and uh, yeah, <laughs> when she shows up, <laughs> she is got a mic for more her. than welcome to to hang out with us as much as she wants. So uh, we're big fans of hers as well. Um, thank you. Uh, Ashley, uh, I love this coconut plaid shirt as well. Um, I 
this is uh, this was originally last year's, but frankly, I just I just like the the color, the feel. It's uh, it's perfect for running actually as well. It's a very comfortable shirt. Thanks, Daniel. Voices for radio and faces for television. He nailed it right there. Yeah. Daniel's a friend of mine. Yeah. So, Daniel's actually the person who got me into trail running. So, uh, he can get away with that. Looks like we got the drone back up with the leader. So, this is not, uh, our drone pilot's flying from mile eight, not from okay. uh, mile 11. So, this would be the current Cottonwood Gulch, uh, or Cottonwood Aid Station, rather, um, and not the, the old one. So yeah, that is Jason uh, flying out there on course. Um, and we uh, were a little bit away, uh, we're a little ways away from this, but just as a little sneak peek here, we do have footage from Ken Rubley's setup at the old, um, the Cotton old Cottonwood Aid Station at mile 11. So. We'll uh, let them keep getting s everything set up and taken care of, but we will have some footage from there. Ken out there, camped out, drove his Jeep, camped out out there, and is uh, going to be providing the runners with some water, so we'll make sure that we check in with them a little bit later. Looks like he's still teaching himself the uh, nuances of a gimbal. No, they're, they, Ken, Ken told me this a direct quote, you know we don't half-ass anything. <laughs> he brought a tripod. So oh he's sweet! Have his camera mount. Actually, it looks like they've got it figured out. Yep. So they oh, are. Oh, is that his outfit? Yep. It, I don't have it on screen. We'll we'll uh, <laughs> we'll leave that little treat uh, for a little bit later. But yeah, is that, Ken uh, Ken won't disappoint. He's got some friends out there with him. Is that our Shad in the chat? Chad Burkholz. Yep. That, uh, yeah, that is the Shad. Not the our Shad. Shad. The Shad. No, well, we have a not a, a sense of. Uh, community. Uh, Shad, uh, for those who tuned in last year, I believe Shad logged 80 miles as a follow cam filmer last year. Yeah, I think it was something like that. Shad will be able to let us know. He signed up for even more. He signed up for one shift last year and then worked like four. Yeah, he was out there on the streets of Flagstaff basically all Friday and Saturday. Uh, it was pretty amazing, and uh, I was so happy when he introduced himself to me, uh, uh, I believe it was earlier this year. Um, you know, I'm grateful to have these uh, people that are willing to uh, put in uh, the effort and the miles, because uh, it means we can just kind of sit back and reap the benefits here in the studio as they all go and do the hard work. Is so that's Cottonwood right there. Yeah, so that's the Cottonwood hitting. aid station. So they just rolled in at mile eight there. That is our first aid station. We'll see if we can get eyes on who those runners are. Um, looks like that might be a lead pack with uh, I'm thinking maybe Versteeg and Sarah Suzuki, um, maybe uh, Megan McCarty and uh, Don Reichel, perhaps. I believe the white is Versteeg. Yeah, the white should be Should be Versteeg. So Shad clarified 83, 83 miles, miles. Last year. I knew it was around there. Hashtag 83 Nation. If you know, you know. I don't think we've ever had footage uh, in this section. Never. Of course. Not only for this race, I don't think we've gotten footage in this area for Black Canyon as well because they're still on the Black Canyon Trail too here and this is where I believe they turn off uh, so off of the Black Canyon Trail, yeah. right? Yeah, so Cottonwood Aid at mile 45 or so of yep. the Black Canyon course 
is really kind of a unique place because as you approach it, you don't see it until you're literally on top of it because you're actually coming off of a ridge. So like you're running and then all of a sudden you hit this series of short, just quickly descending switchbacks and all of a sudden you're right at Cottonwood 8. And of course from here, the race takes a life of its own and, and diverts from the Black Canyon Trail. But yeah, Cottonwood Aid is uh, like usually when I'm running because I'm you know closer to the mid slash back of the pack, it's dark by the time I get here. So this is actually a, a different perspective for me, not only to see the drone footage here at Cottonwood, but also because I almost never hit this area in the daytime. <laughs> Yeah, Jonathan Gardner about uh, about to find out how long it takes to fill four liters of water because uh, this is one of the last two opportunity, well, one of the two opportunities to uh, fill up the tank, so to speak, to make sure that they've got uh, uh, all of the uh, all of the water they're going to need to uh, to traverse this next section, which is going to be rough, rugged, and warm. This is awesome. Yeah, this section, once you start to leave here, it's gonna it's gonna start to get pretty real. Pretty uh pretty quick. And so like at this point, I mean I'm looking and it looks like there's about fifteen runners that are within the front quarter mile or so. So it's gonna it's gonna take some time for the lead pack to uh, shake out a little bit. Uh, I mean, and there will be some shake out. You'll have, you know, some separation between uh, the front runners, and it also takes on a different dynamic once people start taking sleep breaks and, uh, you know, full on uh, aid station rests. Uh, they do have sleep stations at several of the aid stations uh, coming up, and 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 so what we're following here is. The early stages of a, a race that has a long, long way to go. Of course, some of the runners, I mean, you know, people joking about Versteeg's naps in the chat. Versteeg was napping during the day, if I remember correctly, last mm -hmm. year because he wanted to avoid the, the hottest parts uh, of the day. 2021. Or 2021. That yeah, is the right. yeah, the inaugural year. That is, that is correct. So, he, I remember vividly. He was in the lead coming into Dead Horse Ranch mm -hmm. and chose to get in his van and sleep in the middle of the day, uh, which Michael McKnight then passed him. Um, Versteeg woke up, caught Mike McKnight, and Mike McKnight ended up having to drop at. Uh, the Deer Pass Aid Station, which is between Dead Horse Ranch and Sedona. Um, but yeah, his sleep strategy was to uh, nap when it was the hottest and to try and take that um, that like nighttime section, or, or to take that hotter section in Sedona uh, when it was a little bit cooler. So we'll see if he sticks to kind of that same strategy um, again today. Of course, Michael McKnight and Michael Versteeg, uh, two of the favorites here at the Coconut 250, but uh, couldn't be more different. And Versteeg, you've got the uh, kind of a throwback type of runner, uh, minimalist in a lot of ways, and uh, a little bit uh, rough around the edges. Yeah. And uh, Michael McKnight is uh, a a bit more, I don't know if tailored is the right word, but uh, he's, he's definitely a, a different presentation and also a bit of a, a tinkerer and a scientist and, and kind of experiments on himself in a lot of ways. Uh, a, a year or two at Across the Years, uh, Mike McKnight ran the 24-hour race without taking in any calories. Yeah and still did 119 miles in 24 hours. 
zero calories. Yeah, that's awesome. We got Tiffany Ferguson in the uh, in the chat. Coach McKnight, so one of Mike McKnight's athletes there. So, oh, that's such a pretty shot of nice, you know, Canyon Valley shot right there. That's that's what it's all about. And this is as they approach. Uh, this is the area around Cottonwood, a, the first aid station, about eight, eight and a half miles in. Yeah, and so they came to that mile eight aid station in just over 80 minutes there for the race leaders. So, yeah, moving, moving pretty solid uh, this early in the race. So I also wonder if, you know, they're trying to get up to Lane Mountain. Obviously, they're trying to get up to Lane Mountain as early as they can. Like that's the point of yeah. uh, of everything, right? But like, I wonder if there is not necessarily some fear, but some concern of uh, you know not wanting to be trying to limit your time um, going up Lane Mountain in the heat because yeah, it will cool off a little bit in Crown King. It'll still be hot, but you'll be at a higher altitude, so it'll be a little bit cooler. Uh, up there so yeah I, I think that uh, it's one of those unfortunate uh, realities for those who might be in the middle of the back of the pack they're just simply going to be out there longer and and potentially uh, cooking um, the the faster runners are going to be trying to uh, fade the heat and escape to the higher elevation here so we are just gonna check in at the mile 11 aid station here for just a second just to make sure yep that feed is looking great there you have a shot <laughs> ken rubley hanging out probably texting me uh right now asking if his food is clean uh and so we will we'll actually check in with ken in just a couple minutes here just to see what everything is what everything <laughs> is like but shout out to ken Ken is, is truly a, a wonderful character and uh, you know a, a fixture in the uh, running scene here in the American Southwest. Uh, such a great guy. And it looked like he was just kind of chilling out, having a nice grand old time. Looks like we've got a pack of runners heading uh, on the trail right now. Not sure if that's our lead pack or uh, just a large grouping. And you're gonna see while we're still so early in the race, uh, a whole lot of shaking on the on the running on the leaderboard for the running tracker. It, at this point, it's it's really just kind of throwing darts because it all depends on whose tracker pings when. Yeah, and that's something that as we get further and further along in the race, that you'll notice. That, you know, you may see runners who are running together, looking like they're leapfrogging each other on the live tracker. Um, but it is just dependent upon uh, GPS pings. Another thing that we'll make sure you're mindful of is uh, there is a little bit, there can be a little bit of GPS float. So yes. um, it can look like runners are <laughs> off course at a given time, um, just based on maybe a, an inaccurate ping or a little bit of GPS float, but typically over uh, a few minutes that sorts itself out. So. If a runner is way off course for an extended period of time, you know, uh, then we start to <coughs> then we start to uh, not necessarily worry, but uh, then we start to maybe maybe be a little more concerned. And one of the things it has happened. We've had a couple of runners. I remember last year there was a runner. I wish I could remember her name, but it was a woman who her tracker was showing in a neighborhood off to the side of the course and I said oh that now that's just a pinging error no she was literally on the other side of a neighborhood that was bordering the the course up by Munns Park um, you know so it does happen 
but that's cool. why it's good to have these uh, uh, these GPS trackers. But yeah, I mean, if a runner is you know showing that they're like a twentieth of a mile off the course, or you know, I wouldn't fret. And also, conversely, yeah, I mean, you can look at the the leaderboard right now, and it might show, like, for instance, right now our leaderboard shows Killian Korth, Dave Krupski, and Mike Gronenwagen as our leaders, but it's impossible to tell because, uh, I mean, depending on when, when their, when their GPS pinged, I mean. And while we uh, keep looking at that, we're actually going to check in at the mile 11 water drop here with, uh, with good old Ken, so... Ken, if you can hear me, oh yeah, uh, how, how are things going out there, Ken? <laughs> well, you know, we are the uh, water only station, but uh, you know, we didn't quite get Hold the on, memo, get so we've got a couple hundred of these turbo here. rockets yeah, ready to go. Uh, there we go. Frozen now. grapes. I mean, so the water is basically liquid gold in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Just imagine what kind of cash we can get for frozen grapes out here, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, no, my buddy Bill and I got here uh, yesterday. Absolutely beautiful area. We have uh, 750 gallons of water ready to go. 750? Uh, the man himself, Jamil, that's how we woke up. We heard the deep come in. It's lucky he didn't get shot. We're in the middle of nowhere. We heard the noise. <laughs> but uh, no, we're ready to go. It's an absolutely beautiful day. Little bunnies running around. And uh, yeah, we're ready to go. How are you guys doing in that uh, stuffy studio? We're, we're doing good, Ken. I think that the live chat wants to know, you know, as would be customary with uh, the Oscars or the Grammys, who uh, who who are you wearing today? Who's your outfit by? Well, you know, I, I, I'm wearing uh, that Oscar De La Hoya thing, but, my, you know, I'm almost 53 and my wife didn't wash it right. So the, hence why it's not button, you know? So, uh, yeah, no, I went with, uh, you know, it's pleated. It's nice. It's got a nice tie on it. And, uh yeah yeah so uh it should be any minute now we see folks coming through but yeah. just give people an idea we are three miles up obviously from the eight mile station but just to get from the eight mile station to here is like a half hour in the jeep it's uh it's legit it's a lot of fun we cross water um you got to get out every now and then and kind of look at the line to see to make sure you can make it with the jeep but so much so we came out a few days ago to drop off uh uh, two 30 barrels of uh, liquid gold, and then we brought more with us. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice, nice setup here, and yeah, so uh, awesome. We, yeah, we appreciate it. We're gonna play a little, probably a little Motley Crue, a little Metallica, because you know I'm almost 53, and that's what I want to hear. So that's what the runners <laughs> are gonna hear, and uh, yeah. I absolutely love it. Awesome, Ken. We're going to send it back to our drone shot, and as runners start to come closer to your aid station, we will uh, we'll send it back over to you. Right on, man. Take care. There you have it. There. <laughs> and an absolute legend. An absolute legend. I've got, I, I'm at a loss for words uh, with just how entertaining of a human being and how great of a person Ken is. So I... we're didn't have anything to say I, could, yeah. I couldn't formulate anything Ken is uh, uh, truly one of a kind uh, if you've uh, never had the chance to meet him uh, you're missing out he's uh, an energetic uh, positive vibrant member of uh, the trail and ultra running community he uh, and he has been for a long time um, he's been involved in a lot of air viper races uh, as a supporter and he's also put on a couple of his own as well and most recently the uh beyond limits ultra in california was uh, uh yep and the jamil event. was out there uh timing that's so, right and jamil helped time that event so really uh really awesome and we've got uh miss ashley in the chat the octave his voice hit when he tried buttoning the suit <laughs> Ken is just, Ken is so amazing. And you can see here just like some of the terrain the runners are crossing. So this drone again is back from, uh, they're flying out of the mile eight aid station, but this would be going uh, up course. So between the mile eight and 11 mark here, you can just see they're on kind of like a, a fire road here. Um, sections of it are gonna be pretty nice. And then sections of it are gonna be fairly rutted out here. 
uh, John Marushak mentioning that he thinks he bought a 76 Cutlass from Ken back in 82. <laughs> not surprised, uh, not surprised at all. Uh, Kevin Lara uh, asking uh, for a report on the Denim Cowboy. Is he back and wearing cowboy boots this year? I believe that uh, Tony Tadieski is bib number 18 this year? He, he is definitely in the field. Yes, he is in the field. I that. did not see what he was wearing out there, but uh, uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty of Tony. Um, and uh, I believe that Jamil paced him for a little while last year. Yeah, Tony Tedeschi is uh, bib number 18, so I don't know. His runner tracker showed that he's, how far? Well, that can't be right. He's done. He's gone more than 18 feet. Yeah, I would hope. 137 feet, sorry. But yeah, um, we'll, uh, you know, we'll be keeping up with these runners as uh, time goes on. Uh, we've got a, a group here on the road. Yep, so this is, um, some of the, again, some of that forest road, that fire road that will lead them out to mile 11, and then eventually they will uh, start to make their way on the long, long climb uh, up Lane Mountain. Yeah, Lane Mountain is uh, a gorgeous area, but yeah, getting up Lane Mountain is uh, is an arduous task, no matter which direction you hit it from. So, of course, that area had been affected by wildfire uh, a couple years ago, causing the cancellation of the Crown King Scramble. But uh, now, it I, I was actually up there a month ago running Crown King, and uh, it's starting to come back. It's starting to um, revegetate nicely. So. Yeah, and that'll be um, some of the interesting things to look, kind of look at as we're making our way down course, because you'll have, um, you know, that fire scar, right? Yeah. Uh, but you'll also have the one from last year that runners will kind of be running, uh, running near as they make their way from Crown King to Prescott uh, along the Senator Highway. Not a highway, as we always uh, like to like to point out. But. <laughs> Brett, you're welcome. Uh, Brett Hornig in the chat. Uh, Brett and uh, Finn Melanson will be joining us here uh, this afternoon uh, as we uh, continue our Cocodona coverage. So uh, it's going to take an army of us to, to stay awake and to keep the coffee going and uh, just to, uh, to keep this uh, car on the road. And while we have a little bit of a break in the action here, we are going to take a slight commentary break and we're going to uh, have a short um, ad break, a short commercial break here, uh, courtesy of our wonderful sponsors at Satisfy. I think that uh, everyone is definitely going to gonna love this uh love this commercial Soda. So shout out to uh, to the great folks at Satisfy there. They shot that commercial uh, just a few weeks ago, and so it would only be it would only be right to have a Verstieg sandal sighting. Granted, given that he's you know uh, wearing proper shoes today. So shout out to uh, Satisfy, and again they will be taking over the. Fane Ranch Aid Station, now dubbed the Satisfy Fane Ranch Aid Station, and it is, uh, it's going to be a vibe. I mean, how can you not just love, you know, the, the beautiful smile of Versteeg as he holds the soda, gives the camera a little smile, 
Uh, how can you not want some float after that? I don't know if I've ever seen Prestige Smile. Eh? Well, now you have. Yes, this that was a first. Um, I, I got nothing. I know. I, I've been overwhelmed by so much already. I mean, the whole Coconut Day One experience is overwhelming because it's inspiring and so much fun. Then I get Ken Rubley <laughs> out on the course, and then I get Michael Versteeg uh, doing a, a commercial for Satisfy Running. I mean, uh, I'm just here to soak it all in. Yeah, I mean, Satisfy may have to start working with uh, like Coca-Cola or someone to actually produce Floda in mass. That's entirely possible. Yeah. And, and you know what, we were talking about this last night here uh, at the uh, Coconut Studios that uh, Satisfy has some amazing videos, uh, you know. Yep. Don't, don't disrupt your Coca-Dona day, but uh, if you ever uh, want to see some very unique running advertisements and commercials, you can check out Satisfy's YouTube channel because uh, they've got some uh, other stuff starring Prestige and uh, starring Jamil Curry as well. Yeah, if uh, anyone is interested in uh, seeing Jamil in something other than nine inch running shorts, Yes, Satisfy has you covered as uh, out in the salt got, flats. Yep, they've got a video out in the salt flats of Jamil in uh, it looked like some five inch shorts. So <laughs> anyone who's interested in that, they uh, they do a great job with their content. And they always keep it fun and interesting, which I think is you know is good for the sport, right? And uh, yeah, Mallory, that I, commercial was awesome. Mallory, I didn't realize that Matt was going to come right back to the studio, so I was standing there, like sitting here, jaw dropped. Well, like. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've got uh, we've got drone pilots swapping batteries, and uh, we're just limited on feeds. But even if I had a bunch of feeds here uh, that were really clean, I may have brought it to the studio just so that the people could see your reaction anyway, Chris. I was so embarrassed. I was also kind of slouched down in my chair because I just totally didn't know well, what to say. Well, that's. You know, that's what makes the stream relatable because I'm sure that the viewing audience was also giving that same reaction as they yeah, were with Michael Versteeg uh, smiling at the camera with his can of Flota. But they weren't on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, thanks for joining us here on this beautiful May 1st, uh, 2023, the first day of the Coconut 250, uh, brought to you by Air Viper Running. Hey, Matt, is uh, registration open for next year's yet? No, it is not. It is not open yet. Because people are going to start asking. Yeah, we uh, we hope to have registration open soon. Um, I'm not sure when that'll be, but I will definitely keep the viewing audience posted. The The nice thing, not the nice thing, but like one of the interesting things about Cocodona now is you can make a vacation out of it. You know, you can come volunteer for the Cocodona live stream, volunteer at an aid station, and then run Elden Crest 36 on Friday. Yeah. Or... Uh, run Sedona Canyons uh, or anything Some like runners that. are so doing that. I've spoken to several people who are doing that. So I know uh, that is definitely something that some of the runners are undertaking. Uh, while mentioning uh, back in the day when Jamil had a full beard that uh, he and Versteeg looked like twins. Oh, those were the days. Those were the days. Jamil with a full beard. I remember that. Jamil, uh, this was bandana wearing Jamil. This was before the uh, before the trucker hats became his uh, headwear of choice so uh, yeah way the one that really gets me is uh, short hair Jamil short hair Jamil I um, haven't seen short hair Jamil in a long time there are pictures out there and there might be a video or two out there but uh, once upon a time Jamil had uh, a short hair and and he looked like a taller version of a, Nick a Nick yeah you know, uh, I, I remember seeing photos of them I believe uh, at the AC 100 which was they ran together, but was their first 100 miler. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Jamil and Nick look alike. It's just that Jamil is a foot taller or something, <laughs> you know? But now that uh, the hair is a little bit different, as uh, we now, is that uh, the end? Or is that Jason's? Yeah, camp? this is Jason. So I'm being told uh, that he is flying prior to the mile 88 station. Okay. So. And in the uh, way too early uh, runner tracking, if we were to actually um, bring that up, uh, your, your leader at this point, uh, again, it's, it's all tentative, but uh, Dave Krupski, uh, Michael Versteeg, and Michael McKnight, uh, of course, uh, Versteeg and McKnight uh, both um, ran the 
first two iterations of the Coca Dona 250 uh, with varying results for each of them. Versteeg won the race in 2021, and uh, Versteeg had to drop due to uh, the case of Rabdo. And then on uh, the 2022 version, Michael Versteeg had to drop at Whiskey Row. Uh, due to, I believe, some back issues, and then Mike McKnight finished second overall. So, um, talking about two runners who have had extreme success and also uh, experienced disappointment here at the Coca-Dona 250. So, uh, we'll be following them uh, throughout the uh, day and days to come, because uh, your finishers here, it, it's hard to say, because in the first year, we expected runners to finish fairly, I would say fairly early 60 to 64 hours, and first he came in just over 72. Uh, last year, uh, Stringby McConaughey set the world on fire and finished in under 60 hours. I would assume that our first finishers this year, since the course is much more similar to the 2021 version, that we're looking at finishers probably your first finishers in the 66 to 69 hour range, that, at least on the men's side. On the women's side, it might be closer to 73 to 76, perhaps. I'd have to take, I'd have to go back and look and see what um, Andy Hughes did. Um, I think I have that. Oh, I had it pulled up. I should have it pulled up, but yeah. Um, Annie uh, Hughes ran 71. 71 on last year's course. Yeah, the first woman is probably going to be around. So that was Annie. And what was Maggie? Maggie was 85.30. Oh. It's probably going to be somewhere in between there. I would say kind close to 85, I had to guess. Yeah. I mean, you're talking I'm about thinking that from year one to year two, both on the men's and women's side, I'm guessing that it's going to fall probably in the middle. Yeah, and not maybe directly in the middle, but in between them somewhere. It's going to be slower than last year. But I think that the course is just naturally going to be a little bit faster than the inaugural year. There's going to be more water. People know the course uh, more now. There's more beta out on the course. Um, the way you leave Sedona is a little bit different. It can be harder in ways, but it can be uh, maybe more spiritually uplifting in ways as well. So I think that I think that it will likely be faster than the inaugural year, um, but I, I don't think it'll be anywhere near as fast as as last year. But it's also hard to say, right? Because you also have uh, like so such talented athletes, right? Like Maggie Gutero is such an incredible athlete, and uh, like her performance is definitely very stout on on that inaugural course. So, and so I think that. Here in just a minute, Chris, we're going to be joined by Amy uh, from Wander Project. So they do um, a lot of our charity bib work. So Amy is going to join me here in just a minute in studio to, uh, to chat about just like, you know, what they're doing and, and uh, how our charity bib participants, uh, you know, got their entry into Cocodona and all of the fun things surrounding that charity bid program. So in just a minute, I think we'll be joined by her. And so, well, I'm going to go freshen my coffee. Yeah, yeah, pop off, pop off your cup, and uh, Amy will be joining me here in just a minute. And, uh, yeah. We're just getting Amy is set up here, so I will bring it to the studio here for a minute. Amy with the Wander Project. Amy, how are you doing today? It's it's been an awesome morning so far. I got to be out at the start and see all of the athletes. Yeah, so it's been a long going. morning for you as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I drove. A, I think it's a hundred miles, and um, these guys are are running double plus of that, yeah. and so it's it's super inspirational for sure. Every time I drive down to our Phoenix headquarters uh, from Flagstaff, I always think about Cocodona because I look at all these different mountain ranges and I'm like, man, people traverse that on foot 
uh, and it's it's absolutely crazy. So. It's definitely not flat. Yeah, no, it, it's, <laughs> it's definitely not, a flat, not flat route. Yeah, and so we wanted to to bring you on today just to chat a little bit about you know what Wonder Project does and maybe your involvement in uh, the Coca Dona 250 this year with our charity bid program. Yeah, yeah. So Wonder Project is a nonprofit partner of the Coca Dona 250 and. We've been grateful enough to have um, five entries this year uh, to, donated to the organization. And then from there, we reach out to the athletes and, and offer those up as kind of incentive to fundraise for any cause that inspires them to run. And we've got some amazing, amazing athletes this year, not only the amazing athlete of someone choosing to run 250 miles, yeah. but making it a little bit more purposeful even uh, and going a step further and helping to raise money for their entry so what uh do you know off the top of your head what were some of the charities that were supported by some of yeah. these athletes so we have um one of our national partners is bigger than the trail and so we have ann ludwig out running for bigger than the trail and talking to her this morning um it seems like such a fitting organization for this race because it's so mental right like you are stronger than you you know you're stronger than you think and and as she started off this morning just having kind of all of those thoughts of what does this look like can i do it and then knowing that you're running for an organization that helps with those mental health um, challenges that a lot of us face and, and especially since uh, the pandemic have kind of come to light a little bit more so bigger than the trail is one of our national partners and she's out running for that um, we have a few, so we have five charity bibs, so they're running for five different organizations. Yep. And um, there is For the Love of Go, which is getting people out and moving. We've got uh, Trails and Tribulations, who Mike Greer is, is out there and um, was here, la or wanted to be here last year, broke his pelvis oh, the man. week before. And so he did a charity bib for the second year in a row to get out here and, and make it happen. So That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Is there a few of them I can keep going? You just tell me. Yeah, no, that's some uh, some super inspiring stuff, and it's awesome to, like you said, see athletes who not only want to come and run 250 miles for some yeah. reason. Obviously, you get beautiful landscapes. You get this, like, existential out of body journey, right? That yeah. you're gonna experience. But to then, you know, choose to do it for, kind of a a greater cause is is you know super inspiring and hopefully it gives them uh you know a little more inspiration when they hit some of those lower moments right because yeah. in a race this long you're talking you know 125 total hours for some of these runners like you're gonna have ups you're gonna have downs and so i think that you know hopefully some of these runners having like a, a kind of a cause to run for hopefully gets them through some of those uh, some of those low spots. So. Yeah, an external why, yeah. right? Plus, on top of on top of that, they've you know it's all peer to peer fundraising, so they've engaged their community in the, their efforts, and so you know it's it's more than just them being out on the trail. It's everyone who donated to their cause is along yeah. with them on this journey. And Jessica Turner is an awesome example. She um, is raising money for Foraging uh, Youth Resilience here in Flagstaff. And she's our top fundraiser. So her community together raised over six thousand dollars for her race. That's incredible, and that's actually a good point that I didn't I didn't even think of. Right? You look at it from like, oh, you're running for this charitable organization, right? Yeah. And like that's the why. But I never even it didn't even come to me that you're also running for the you know the tens and hundreds of people who help support your yeah. your cause. That's that's yeah. really amazing. So. Yeah. And I know a lot of them are going to try and live stream or jump online along the way and their fundraisers are still open so that yep. they can continue to raise funds for their organizations um, just as they're going on this journey. So keeping their their communities engaged and then ideally hoping to raise even more to support the causes that inspired them to be out there. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So, well, do you have any uh, any other general thoughts about um, Cogadona or um, yeah any of the any of the races or Wander Projects kind of general involvement? I know that you yeah. all do a, a lot of uh, charitable work with a lot of different organizations yeah. across the country, and so we're obviously super excited to have you as like our partner to help facilitate a lot of the the 
um, the charitable aspect of, yeah. of Cocodona. So yeah. Yeah, we're just super excited to be here. It's my first year being out at this event and seeing it and seeing how much goes into it. We all know how much goes into a race, but a 250 mile race and, and the planning and preparation. So it's been super fun being a part of this weekend from bid pickup to being out at the start line. And um, you know, the goal is only to grow it and to have the ripple effect spread far beyond and, and grow far past $25,000, which is kind of where we're at this year. So we'll just keep pushing this event and hopefully get some more charity bibs and get more funds raised to support the efforts of all of those great organizations that are doing amazing things. And, and we just couldn't be more excited to be here. Awesome. And last thing before we send it back to the action and bring Chris back on, where can people maybe learn more about Wonder Project and yeah. some of the various things that you all support? Yeah, so easy is on our website, wanderproject.org, or we actually have charity bib information right on the Cocodona website. And so we usually try and open up charity bibs uh, around the same time race registration yep. opens. So for those of you who are excited to do this again or want to get in next year for and make it, like I said, a little more purposeful, um, you can check out that on the Cocodona website as well. Awesome. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to send it back to the drone footage here so that we can uh, keep you all on course. Actually, we have uh, folks coming into mile 11 here, so we'll send it there and we'll bring uh, Chris back on here in just a minute. So we are tuned in here at mile 11. We've got Ken Rubley in his dashing attire. We've got Verstique Shadow uh, in the chat as our uh, we just had our race leaders come through the mile 11 mark here. They've got some frozen grapes. They've got a ton of water. It looks like we've got Mike McKnight there. A lot of sun protection for uh, for Mike McKnight. And then we've got the exact opposite here. We've got uh, no sun protection from that gentleman there. And it looks like maybe our first female runner is coming in. That looks like Sarah O. I could have I could have missed a female runner come in prior as well, so I apologize. But definitely got Sarah Ostazewski. Um, in the uh, in the shot there. Ken's outfit is just uh, stealing the show here. Well, Ken usually steals the show, no matter whatever show he's in. He's uh, that charismatic, so. Yeah, and welcome, uh, welcome back, Chris. Thank you. Hope your, uh, hope your coffee was still warm there. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I just saw our top few runners come through mile 11 here. So we're kind of keeping it locked on this aid station right now. Looks like uh, um, there's a little bit of a. Wait, do we have runners coming up here? Yep. 
Yeah, our first runners are hitting the Ken Rubley. So we've station. had our first runners come through already. So this is a little bit further, and not further back, but and as we still mentioned, some of our top runners. Because uh, Ken is blasting the Metallica, we do have to uh, keep the uh, the volume down as uh, we don't want to get pinged for any sort of licensing violations. So. <laughs> <laughs> But is that uh, Dominic There's Grossman Dom right Grossman there? there. No, Rudy and Wellness, uh, as I just mentioned, we're not going to be able to bring audio from that A station while uh, Ken is uh, rocking out. So uh, we, that would probably multiply our budget by about uh, 50 fold to uh, get the licensing to uh, Blast Metallica on YouTube. Yeah, let me let me see how loud it is. You want a turbo rocket, but no one wants. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can definitely hear Ken, but unfortunately, we can hear the music, so we'll keep it muted here. Uh, we will check in with Ken periodically, though, uh, and when we do check in with him to get kind of uh, his uh, his opinion or his uh, thoughts on what he's seeing, we'll make sure that. We're able to do that, so. Yeah, see, I think the afternoon guys are uh, not taking advantage of the ability to sleep in. As uh, There's been a ton of activity in the Cocodona Studio household. Uh, there we've got today. a, looks like we've got a little big Goldberg energy uh, right there. What a, I'm sure the chat will help me out here. What a, what is the print on those shorts? You know, his shorts kind of go go with Ken's uh, Ken's suit there. That looks like vegetables perhaps? Like maybe peppers? <sighs> Some peppers. So you could have the peppers and then uh, Ken has the ice cream <laughs> uh, on his uh, suit print. Yeah, we're gonna, I think we're probably gonna keep it here for a little while as long as we've got eyes on uh, runners coming into the uh, water drop here at mile 11. Uh, these are still the first few runners to hit um, hit the Ken Rubley hosted uh, water drop of mile 11. Gosh, the, there's just a lot of uh, there's a lot of Goldberg energy in the chat. I'm here for it. Yeah, Ben, if there's one band you don't want to risk pirating, it's Metallica. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> they don't take kindly to that. <laughs> yeah, the ice cream, the suit, uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't is see definitely what, ice cream. I, I, I couldn't see what Kevin, so, Kevin had on. Maybe we'll have to see if he's uh, posted any photos of it. Or I might just be hungry. Yeah, I mean, it could be either of those. Those would both be very feasible. Uh, it looks like Art Project stumbled onto us uh, uh, serendipitously. Uh, never heard of the Coca Donut 250 before an hour ago and is now tuned into the live stream. Well, Art Projects, um, you, you, you can tune in to us as long as you want because we're going to be here all week. So I can't tell if that's exiting or exciting, and they misspelled it. But whether you stay or whether you go, we appreciate <laughs> we, we appreciate you uh, being here in the moment. Well, then, yeah, he, he, I, I misread that. So yeah, and it's exiting. He, they're they're just over it. And I think we've got a, you know, an early challenge for uh, for Top Beard in the race from uh, that runner that just came through. Yeah, that's something that we will be tracking very closely here over the course of the next five days here at the Coconut 250. Uh, we I tend to just... uh, follow the uh, facial hair uh, game pretty closely here. And it looks like... 
we may have a leaderboard update and this will obviously this will fluctuate based on uh, when runners come through I believe various timing points on the course um, so I'm not sure exactly where this timing point was but we will try to uh, keep uh, keep these leaderboards updated it looks like those might be the leaderboards might be from the start still and then oh, look who just strolled into the chat this morning good way out Liam Liam a station fireball excellent follow on social media I highly recommend if you're on Instagram or Twitter uh, finding him and following him for the uh, the spicy content that he uh, puts out there I just want us So we will uh, we will do our best to keep these um, keep these leaderboards up to date. And, and it, as we mentioned, like this early in the race, it really comes down to like you can go to the runner tracker that we have the link to at the bottom of the YouTube page, and you might see somebody ahead of somebody else on the runner tracker, but you really have to pay attention to when they're. Uh, when their GPS pinged because uh, you know, that determines, for instance, like right now on the men's side, Mike Gronenwagen looks like the presumptive leader, but his pinged uh, you know, two minutes ago versus somebody else who might have pinged five minutes ago. It's uh, Nathan Williams apparently right behind him or ahead of him depending on uh, when the ping hit. So. How do you pronounce Mika's last name? Mika Thuz or Tuz or Taze? Uh, I've always pronounced it Thuz, but I don't know that that's right. I would just call it Mika. Yeah, I think we can get away with that. <laughs> I think we are going to check in with Ken here. Of course, Mika won the uh, Tahoe 200 last year, so uh, and Bigfoot 200 the year prior. No stranger to the distance. Uh, right. Finished fourth year in 2021. Yeah, and we did get the the music lower here. And there's a garbage can out there. I mean, that sounds super cool. There we go. Yeah. All right, we'll see you out there. See ya. This way, this way, this way, this way. This way. <laughs> Good news, you just had to run through bomb wire, though. You know. You know what happened? Yeah. What do you need? What help? I'm only taking a leader. Thank you. So kind of, uh, Ken, to turn the music down for a few minutes. Yeah. And you know there's going to be frozen grapes? No. Or a <laughs> turbo rocket. Or a man in a popcorn shirt? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll keep it on here. And once, uh, once Ken gets a little break, we will, uh, we'll be able to check in with him and just get his thoughts on uh, that front group of runners. So, yeah, it's Elijah LaPierre there, uh, multiple-time Western States top 10 finisher. Uh, excellent runner but i believe that this is her first uh shot at something uh, above and beyond that yeah there's a garbage can for you to throw it in down the trail yeah i don't think they're very far but they're a quarter mile maybe not even uh yeah they have their computer screen there down on the table following along in the, in the on the live stream you're gonna see that at a lot of the aid stations here now and i've talked with uh, runners and crews who have talked about how they used it strategically last year, trying to keep track of where everybody else was it's, it's very and what we were saying. And when we talk about whether a runner looks good or look, whether they look worked, people, uh, I don't know if we can duplicate. I don't know if the world can handle it. Yeah, the world can handle it. And frankly, uh, uh, Ken is one of a kind. Yeah, and we've uh, we've got you live here, Ken. If you can uh, hear us, Hold on. Oh, Ken can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, can hear, hear you, you buddy. Ken. Oh, so here's the update. Frozen grapes. Frozen the only grapes analogy tree. I can think of is like it's like it's like crack for an addict. Once you have one, it's crazy. Everyone, this is the hot seller here at the water only station as we compete to be the best aid station. So the frozen grapes are going. 
And believe it or not, hang on, hold on. I feel like I just bought a ShamWow from this guy. <laughs> right. Baby's right here. Frozen grape. Frozen grape. Frozen grape. Turbo rocket. Tur Turbo rocket. Back my path. Hold on. Bill's working here for a minute. <laughs> but watch the sale. Watch. I'll get him to take grape turn ice cream. <laughs> Water, water. Yeah, let's take some of those. Yeah, frozen grapes. Yeah, yeah, start going back. Okay. okay. You want the whole thing? That doesn't open you. Oh, you got it. That's just wastewater for my legs. You want okay. the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wait. Okay. Okay. Then I got another one. All right. So I'm gonna right. Hey, that fella's working here. Uh, Ken, this is this is great. Cindy Metz, what's up? Yeah, right there. Blue Hi. Metz, love you guys. This one goes yes. Yeah. It's like kind of like NASCAR, but you know what? In NASCAR, you don't have frozen grapes. Yeah, frozen grapes. <laughs> frozen grapes in NASCAR. All right, all right. No. Guys. It's it's just just frozen grapes. You got it. Turbo rocket, come on! See, for folks who have never met Ken before, this is a new thing. I've seen Ken do this, and I'm still in Frozen grapes, we got water. Frozen grapes. Turbo rocket. Turbo rocket. This garbage can down the road. Turbo rocket. Well, this, uh, this is going to be hard to follow the rest of the the rest of the week. I am grateful that I'm here to witness this now, because, yeah, uh, Ken is truly... Uh, the energy he brings to an event is infectious, and uh, you know if you haven't had a chance to run races that he's been associated with, such as Beyond Limits, or uh, he used to be the race director at Jackpot, but he still came out and hung out last year. You know, I mean, you know, he's definitely a huge part of of bringing positive energy to the running community. Yeah, heavily stocked stations. Well, they didn't have the frosty grape trees. Yeah, that's the trees right around. Yeah. Yeah. The cows are going over too. Good. Do you think that? Looks like that's Garrett Nelson right there, bit number 20, uh, grabbing some frozen grapes. Yeah, uh, bit number three there as well. 103 was uh, Adam Arthur's. Yep. Yeah, well, let's stay here. They're listening to us. Yeah, anybody else having a hankry for uh, going to the grocery store and grabbing some frozen Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to have to send uh, Finn and Brett on a grocery <laughs> ride <All> right. <laughs> some grapes and some turbo rockets. <laughs> 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 Certain years ago, people are at home like, watch, you're going to like them. Those are yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a trash can. My mom is going, I would talk, but can. I'm busy kind of warming yeah. up here. <laughs> All right, see? Thank you, guys. Have a Boom. great race, guys. Great. Well done. All right. Mm. <laughs> Back to grapes. Am I live? You are yeah, live, Ken. You, you Ken, how are they? What is it? Legit, right? Legit. You tell them that at the fancy aid station. Yep, that's right. <laughs> uh, so on a serious note, everyone's in a great mood. Um, my buddy Bill is kind of new to helping level runners at this level and just how thankful everyone's being. They're being pleasant. No one's rushing. Everyone looks good. They're putting sunscreen on. They're tapping off their water. And... Uh, Right about now, they might turn around and come get more grapes, but everything's so great. Boom! You're live right here. Say hi to mom. Right here. Say hi to mom. Hello, mom. Hi, dad. Hello, friends and family. Oh, man. Yeah, Ken's energy is going to carry these people. Like, at, because this is the toughest, arguably the toughest part of the, the first half of the race. Yeah, the next 20... 20 to 22 mile stretch is definitely the the most arduous especially yeah. in the first you know 150 miles or something like that so um yeah ken's gonna ken's gonna give them a lot of energy going out yeah when, when it you know when all is said and done after the close of Cocodona. Go back and watch Jackpot last year, our coverage there when Ken uh, was the race director riding around on a bicycle uh, as an ice cream man on the course. Uh, Ken is truly one of a kind. And even hanging out in the studio with him, like as we were doing the broadcast, was a lot of fun. He's just that 
this is this is just the, who he is, and he's also just a like he wrote a really nice note to me after after our coverage of Jackpot last year, just to say, you know, just to say hi. That's the kind of guy he is. No, theirs did not have jokes. I was like, yeah. you know, I oh, okay. Okay. Can't, can't sell that. sand in the desert. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it. This is awesome. Yeah. Someone asked um, in the chat. I can't find who exactly asked it, but will we have um, check-ins at other aid stations? Yeah, we will have check-ins at a number of aid stations. Some of them will just be uh, on the ground cameras. Some of them will be more check-ins um, like this. But yeah, throughout the course of the next few days, we'll have footage both from the sky from the drones yeah. there as well as uh from yeah. within the aid station no, so we cannot promise any more kens but we can promise more coverage uh nick patterson looks like he's uh, finishing up there at the aid station uh, but just to be safe like just bring a little water in you don't make it take the cup there's a garbage can if you want it they're good Okay. There's garbage can, yeah, like, up that way. Yeah, Perfect. Course, All right. I think I'm good. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great race. Need some help. Ooh, that's great. Right there. Ken, a, a true professional, he's got a garbage can stationed about 400 meters outside the... He knows the drill. Room. Take a whole cup of the frozen yeah, drinks. Great. And there's a garbage can up the trail. So you can throw it away up the trail. Oh, this is a good one. Ragnar's Axe, or should I say, world's greatest grape yeah, station. Throw nice. it away. Here's a can here, and there's one up the trail. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, what country are you from? Well, uh, Quebec, Canada. Is oh, right, we're part. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got married in Victoria. Well, 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 all right, man. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. It's not. Have a good day. You, you too. too. Thank you. Uh, all right, we got some music back on yeah. Music. Uh -oh. live, are we? Yeah, I'll turn. Uh, I'll mute like, your audio here, Ken. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta put. A, I gotta put a little Motley Crue on, so we'll check back in with you in a little bit. Sounds great. Uh, gotta start conserving our grapes. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, that's Ken Rubley uh, out on the course at mile eleven at an impromptu water drop. Basically, it was one of those situations where this is where Cottonwood Aid normally is, but the roads out there are so rugged and rough that we weren't able to get enough gear out there. Ken took it upon himself to basically volunteer to create the aid station, the water drop out there. And uh, also, this was a fairly last minute yeah. thing. I I didn't find out that Ken was going to be out there until earlier this week, mm -hmm. uh, or I guess it's Monday now. So uh, maybe like the mid part of mid part of last week, Ken splits his time uh, between living in Arizona and in Colorado, I believe. So. Uh, shout out to Ken. That was awesome. I've got. There's no way I can. Uh, there's no way I can follow that up. No, no. And for those that are petitioning to uh, uh, to clone and duplicate Ken, I don't think that the world could handle that. It's. Uh, we're grateful to have Ken, but he is truly one of a kind. <laughs> We got. Again, we won't have audio from the aid station all the time, but we will uh, check in with Ken periodically. Is this mile 11 water station like displayed on the live map? This... Yes and no. <laughs> this is not actually it, it's on the map but it's not correctly labeled basically because the aid station was moved down yeah 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 so this is in addition so what is labeled on the map at mile 11 has actually moved to mile eight yeah um and that is like the water only aid station they may have more than that there now given where they're at i'm not 100 percent sure but this uh is something that was added in addition so runners have the mile 11 water station got moved to mile eight which was displayed on the map. This is uh, at mile 11 and is uh, in addition to. And now runners will not have, they will, there is a water drop mm -hmm. um, at 23. 23 or 25, somewhere in there. So that's something that was not available in the inaugural year um, that will be there. So. They will have uh, they will have water at around the mile twenty three mark. 
before they hit Lane Mountain at around the 50k mark, maybe around mile 32, 33, um, something like that. And that first 33 miles is really the going to be probably the most challenging and arduous of, uh, of day one, although that stretch down the Senator Highway can get pretty toasty oh, yeah. as well. So. Well, we saw, that was one of the most... Uh, um, most, I guess, striking visuals that we saw. Uh, Senator Highway, we saw, uh, I believe it was Pete Mortimer, um, Drew Fraze, and uh, Dax Hawk heading up the highway. And then all of a sudden, as we're just commentating on the drone shot and having the ability to watch runners from overhead, we all of a sudden saw Dax have a bit of a reversal of fortune and his stomach betrayed him on the side of the trail. Uh, I see a couple of runners there. One of them in the middle is Pete uh, Kostelnik. Uh, of course, Pete has uh, um, been a uh, multiple-time bad water champion, uh, so uh, this is uh, this is nothing new for him. I believe that's Sally, uh, bid number six. If that is, that is indeed Sally McRae on the right-hand side of your screen. Yeah, that's Sally right there in the white on the now to the left, I believe. So that might have been Don Greenwald, I think, that was earlier in there. I wasn't quite sure. I I what didn't want to say anything, but yeah, I think that that was Don Greenwald that had come through earlier. But Sally McRae uh, coming through now. Uh, she's actually just on the other side of Ken at the table uh, in the. One of the people in the white hat moving right to or left to right and heading out of screen view. And Pete Kostelnik moving from left to right, uh, getting ready to head out. That's Leo Fung right there, uh, that's heading out as well. Uh, Canadian runner. Uh, winner of the uh, inaugural Fat Ox 48 Hour, Leo Fung was. I believe he dropped about 175 miles in 48 hours at that event a couple of years ago. Uh, he ran Hard Rock last year as well, so uh, he's no stranger to big miles. Yeah, Jordan Wright, a lot of uh, white hats and shirts. Uh, frankly, I'd be wearing uh, that kind of gear myself if I were out there on the trail today, no matter how many miles I was doing. Definitely want to stay covered in that Arizona sun. Um, I'm a big proponent of full arm sleeve coverage uh, when I'm running out here in the desert, whether it be for three miles, 30 miles, or whatever. Got a group of runners coming in. There's uh, Andrew Glaze, right? Yeah, uh, I think so, yeah, yeah. Good to see him out here. Uh, coming right off the heels of uh, Canyons. Yeah. So he's doing, uh, he did Canyons 100 mile and he's adding to it. So when all is said and done, uh, when Andrew finishes Cocodona later this week, he will be at 350 miles in two races over basically a seven day period. Legend. Yeah. I think that at this point we're going to see a steady stream of runners in and out. And uh, as has been noted, the temperature is starting to creep up out there. I believe it's gone up about nine degrees in the last hour. Um, I don't know, is our temperature still pulling from Black Canyon City? I would assume so. Because there's uh, no. Yeah, it's not dynamic. So yeah. it's going to be. We'll have and, to update it each. And they're not moving fast enough that they're going to be out racing the, the weather, so to speak, at this point. I mean, it's going to be fairly warm from here on up to Crown King. Now, Crown King might be a few degrees cooler, but it's not going to be uh, a huge uh, um, a huge drop in temperature. Mm -hmm. 
And there you see one of the uh, Cocodona Sun shirts uh, by the gentleman in the brown shorts. Andy Glaze is my spirit animal. <laughs> I think that he is a lot of people's spirit animals, probably. Well, he's an animal, period. <laughs> he's an absolute animal. Uh, naked dude. I didn't. I missed naked. Was there a naked dude out there? <laughs> No, I, I don't know. Not that I've seen. I hope not. Yeah, I, I, I didn't hear about that one. Usually that's something we would know about. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's interesting. I, I hope where the, there's no naked dude. I wonder where the, uh, the weather station at Crown King is. I wonder if it's on top of Lane Mountain. Yeah, that's a good question. Because if that's the case, it would probably be a, even a couple degrees cooler in Crown King. I hope that these temperatures hold because, I mean, you remember 2021. It was absolutely brutal for these runners out there. And, and obviously adding multiple water stops mitigates some of that, uh, uh, that concern. But at the same time, it's hot's hot. You know? And these runners are, are required, I believe, through the... Um, runner guide to carry a minimum of four liters of water over this next stretch, which is a lot if you think about it. I mean, just think about carrying two two liter bottles in a backpack. You know, that's that's a lot of extra weight, but they're going to need it and they're going to be happy they did. Tiny shorts, no shirt equals naked dude. Coca Bona. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's. <laughs> That's an interesting outfit choice, hey? Uh, to go... Uh, Latoya Davis, thank you for the super chat donation. Uh, your husband is number 56, Justin Davis, and a first-timer. That... Tell Ken to save him some grapes. Yeah. Oh, I can promise you that Ken will have no problem uh, making sure that runners are, uh, are sold on the frozen grapes. Popsicle R, four liters equals eight pounds, eight plus pounds. So Justin Davis from Florida. Uh, David Meow, uh, ultra grand slam finisher. So. Oh, fantastic. 58 years old, according to the chat. We're just, you know, sourcing our, crowdsourcing our information. Well, that's what we have to do. There's a lot of runners that we're not necessarily familiar with. Uh, I mean, you know, we're pretty quick with the, uh, the Google machine and the ultra sign up page and everything. But at the same time, you know, we're being introduced to a lot of these runners for the first time. And, uh, over the course of the next five days, some of them we will get to know very well. Uh, we learned about, uh, you know, talking about runners in the mid and back of the pack. Runners such as uh, Stephen Park, of course, last year's final finisher, and the uh, Vitrios, the couple who finished uh, just in front yeah. of him. Saul and Colleen, right? Yes. So, um, you know, we'll get to know these runners uh, quite well um, over the course of the next few days. Andy Glaze needs to get kicked out of there way too much time. I'm not going to tell Andy Glaze how to handle a race. <laughs> I love that Ken also had the... Uh, the forethought to bring a uh, a little umbrella, yeah, an umbrella uh, thing with him. <laughs> but he's not even using it to shade himself. Yeah, no, the, that's that's for the runners so that they can, you know, enjoy some shade and some frozen grapes.
Oh, yeah, Florida Trail Runners. C. Sawyer was a guy last year. He was a barefoot runner. Had to pull out this year. Hopefully we'll see him back next year. We'll be here. Yes, we will. Yeah, I think that, you know, some of the runners are uh, taking their time. Others are, uh, a couple of have declined the uh, frozen grapes, which I feel Ken might take personally, but... Uh, yeah, it's like the, uh, it's like the Michael Jordan meme. From the, uh, <laughs> and I from took the that personally. And I took that personally. Um, Carrie Henderson yep. right there putting the water on her head that might be Desiree Clark on the left as well in the yeah. yeah that's that that is that's definitely Desiree Clark uh, Desiree Clark uh, former uh, Mogian Monster 100 podium finisher, uh, former Air Viper racing team member, um, uh, moved out from the Beast Coast about six years ago and uh, has uh, acquitted herself well here in uh, Arizona races. Let's see, we got some, uh, we got some love for Carrie in the chat. Carrie uh, making her her long journey home, Flagstaff native. Yeah, um, Chasing Cutoffs mentioning that it has got to be warming up out there. While our temperature on screen might not necessarily be accurate because I believe that that's still the nearest um, uh, weather station, you can at least take the rise in temperature and kind of apply it. So even if it's, you know, even if they've lost a couple of degrees due to heading up into the Bradshaws uh, somewhat, it's still gone up several degrees, no matter where they're at. Now, the, the temperature is, is at the Black Canyon City Weather Station. And as runners start to approach Crown King, probably uh, when we have our first runners hitting um, the next water drop or thereabouts, we'll pivot to the, the Crown King um, weather station updates. Mary, do you have to do qualifying races after this? No, but it is probably extremely highly recommended that uh, you be at least familiar with uh, 100 mile distances and perhaps beyond. But uh, no, we've had runners who are doing this uh, distance for the first time. Um, I don't believe that there is any sort of minimum qualifier. I mean, we literally have a runner who has no ultra sign up. Yep. That is correct. There are no qualifiers <coughs> as of right now, which is uh, one of the things that makes this race so interesting. Um, it's like you get such a dynamic group of, uh, of individuals, right? And then Amanda in the chat asking if that was Alex Lamb uh, who was with Carrie. That was uh, Alex Lamb, the uh, Arizona native. It's uh, Sean Barnes down there as well in the yellow, I believe, uh, uh, taking his time. <clears throat> we had a few people uh, cheering Sean on in the chat earlier. Uh, the Idaho native uh, come down to the desert. It looks like do have some more shots on the drone here. This is still around that mile eight mark. Um, so we've got visuals on some of our mid and back of the pack or back of the pack runners here. And now we're this uh, shot here at the, the grape station with Ken Rubley. This is around mile 11.
Oh, looks like Ken might be, uh, he was peeking up at the camera. Let's go there. live again. Ken just, uh, Ken just sends me messages and, and tells me when he's ready to talk. That's how I know his music's down. We've got, uh, we've got Ken's audio back up here whenever he wants to, wants to chat. Ken the Great Ape. Uh, we're warming up out, out there, Ken? Oh, we're live. So, at the water only station, I mean, we're on like our fifth pound of frozen grapes, but <laughs> look at this. Clean, cold, terry cloth towel. These are almost as popular as the frozen grapes. Would you like to wipe down? No, I'm good. Live on camera? No. No? Come on. No, Help me sell it. No, oh, because, because, because. I just put suntan on. Oh, the lotion, yes. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, and, and you'll be taking it off. That's right. There's, so a, there's a trash, trash can off the trail, yeah. You want to can you take a little can, a little thing of grapes? Take a little can of thing of grapes, yeah. A little thing of grapes, there you go. Okay. Thank you, man. You bet. Have a great race. Appreciate it. Yeah, so we keep reminding people about the character building 20 ish miles after this, so everyone's taking their time. Frozen grapes. Water oh, only. Clean, carry cloth, cold towels. Oh, water only station, right? Yeah, whatever. Water only. Frozen grapes with turbo rockets. Right here. Carry cloth uh, towels. You know? <laughs> so, sit, wave to the camera. You guys are live. Say hi to your parents, oh. friends. Hey. Hey, you're right there. Hey. Sorry you're at work on Monday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> on Monday? Yeah, right. there you go. It's a good thing they see right over me. So, there's a garbage can up the trail. If you want to take, take it with you. Thank you. Up the trail. You're all right. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. He's, he's, a got pro. Frozen he's an absolute pro. He knows what he's doing out there. You're not going to have that at the big fancy station. <laughs> You're going to have warm watermelon, not frozen grapes, man. I tell you, you know, but you have some character building miles ahead of you. So, <laughs> then it looks like Jason Kanan, bid number 124, heading out of the A yeah, station. Got a long haul after this. We're going to get the music back down. Oh, okay. We're losing the mojo. We're losing the mojo. We're not live, so are we? Yeah, yeah. we are. No. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so, all right, we'll do these couple now. We'll be fun. You're live. You gotta say hi to family. You're literally live right now. Wave, wave to family. Water, frozen grapes. Say hi. Say hi to Silva. Say hi to Silva. No, come on, more than that. Say hi to Mom. Can they hear us? Yeah. The live stream is. Yeah, we're here, everybody. <laughs> we're watching from the Cocodona Studios. Love you, Sarah. See? Yeah. I didn't know oh, they could hear us. Man. Oh, we can hear you. We're, yeah, we're, we're gonna. We're loving this. This is awesome. Yes, Arizona's only frozen grape tree. Turbo rocket, frozen grape, frozen grape. Please, Terry, for the whole time. Boom. And Thank you yeah. for being here. This is Don't awesome. Don't remember frozen grapes, and they give you warm water. Thank you so much. Who is that that just got here? That was the yeah, number eight. Garbage can up the trail. Great race. Garbage can up the trail. All right, all right. Thank Thank time you have. Right. Terrace for building trail ahead. We need the music back. <laughs> we are. We're getting the yep. Is that Alice Spatchek right there? Or was? Okay. All right. All right. I can't waste the water. Stop crying. You know, the hard part is it's hard to put inspirational And we're going to, we'll go ahead and mute the audio here so that Ken can, uh, <laughs> Ken can get the music back on. <laughs> Yeah, that is L right there. Yeah, uh, right in the center of the screen. Yeah, let's keep it. Let's keep it. Yeah. Until he, he'll let us know by turning on the music. I kind of like this. All right. Rhea, I would buy anything from this guy as well. Ken is truly a master salesman. We got traffic here. All right, we do, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the Peloton just arrived. Oh, no, yeah, take your time here. You got some character building trail ahead. Which means it's the hardest one. Character building trail, that's one way to put it. Turbo rocket, popsicles, frozen graves, and water at uh, mile 11. I said, you know what? I take that message. Okay. 
Yeah, the aid station is hopping right now. I, I love this energy. I so appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much. Turbo rocket, great. And this is, as, as Matt mentioned, this is something that Ken basically raised his hand to do, if, like, on a very short notice. So it, it, it speaks to how awesome he is. Well, I don't even know there. if there was even a request put out. I think, I think Ken was like, hey, can I do something? Yeah, that sounds like, that sounds about that right. sounds very much like Ken. Yes. Yeah, right. I'm going to wipe you down. I'll wipe you down. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dilly, that's usually how it works. He's getting louder the more people show up. He's, uh, he, you know, Ken brings the energy, but he also feeds off the energy of everybody else, too. It's absolutely such a treat to hang out with him. Yeah, we're actually, looks like that feed is cutting up. We are going to get off Ken here. And we are going to let them put the music back on and send it to our drone here. And again, this is back a, a little bit from, um, a little bit back from the mile eleven eight station. So between or around the mile eight eight station, I believe. Yeah, J uh, Jason. Uh, our drone pilot here is. Uh, this is his first time working with us, and. Just absolutely fantastic. He knows the those sights and those shots that we crave here in the studio, and uh, that the audience appreciates. Um, you know, this is the you know th this is a semi-maintained uh, uh, service road that uh, the runners will traverse, and there's a there's a fair amount of that. There's also an awful lot of single track, um, and then when the runners actually are heading through. The various towns and cities on their way from Black Canyon City up to Flagstaff, uh, they'll encounter some some blacktop and asphalt as well. But uh, it's largely going to be Forest Service Road and uh, single track uh, along the way. So uh, things are starting to heat up uh, down at Black Canyon City. The temperature is up about 18 degrees from when we started our broadcast. So. Well, it might not be 18 degrees more now for the runners as they've ascended a little bit of climbing. Uh, it's still definitely gone up uh, a, a noticeable temperature, I'm sure. And we will, uh, let's, yeah, we will check back into this aid station. Again, this is the first time we've ever had footage from this location between Cocodona and Black Canyon live It's the first time we've had so the ability to do it. It's This is a very remote... I, I don't even... I'm surprised he's getting any signal out there. Ken, Ken always... Ken finds a way. Ken, Ken knows a guy. Well, I don't know how he is getting signal and planted a frozen grape tree. Yeah. I, I have not seen a frozen grape tree in Arizona. I don't think ever. And yeah, I hope that uh, Ken hasn't uh, spoiled these runners to the point where they uh, are going to expect uh, frozen grapes at uh, every aid station along the way. I see uh, Clifford Matthews out there, bid number 164. Cliff has run with our local running group in uh, times past. Uh, he is a New Mexico native, but uh, he has uh, come out to Arizona to run quite a bit as well. So. Bid number one, two, three, Jared Buchanan uh, at the A station as well. Now it looks like we're back on some runners making their way to mile eight here.
send it back. Looks like our drone pilot's going to be swapping batteries soon, so let's check back in at the aid station here. What station number is Ken on the map? Ha ha ha. Ken is not on the map. Ken is, uh, is just a, a little bit extra. He's at mile 11, which is, on, in fact, on the map. But the mile 11 aid station had to be moved forward to mile 8 um, due to basically not... The, the road to get out here was very rough and rugged, so we weren't able to get like aid station vehicles out here. Ken, uh, in his souped-up Jeep, was, uh, was able to make it out. So Frozen grapes, turbo rockets, and all. <laughs> Eighty-four Andrew Barrett there at the aid station, um, stopping in. Yeah, and this is this uh, this water station is roughly eleven miles into the race. People loving the uh, guy in the orange mud shirt. Bit number fifty-eight might be best dressed, is what uh, is what they said. Bit number fifty-eight. That's Chase Hammond right there. That was briefly on the screen. Uh, right there, uh, moving from left to right. Bit number one six eight. Tommy Jacobson, the uh, uh, runner from Denmark, uh, who out here in Arizona for the first time. Uh, when I was talking to him uh, in uh, downtown Flagstaff, uh, I let him know that it is going to be about most important to stay cool out there. He wasn't quite sure what the weather was going to bear, but uh, in that case, I think that uh, looks like he's pretty well geared up. Looks like our drone is heading back out around the mile eight aid station. So we will keep our eyes peeled for some of our back of the pack runners as we still have runners coming through. Looks like runners in here.
the mile 11 grape station as we're now calling it yeah courtesy of uh ken rubley yeah, got a frozen grape tree out there and everything uh sounds like you planted some popsicles out there too yeah i mean he's still gonna have several dozen more runners it looks like maybe just under half of the field has actually hit uh um great aid Frozen Grape Gulch. That place? That's what uh, another proposed name in the uh, for the aid station in the chat. Do we have uh, the possibility, can we check to see if we can grab audio from them if they don't have their music turned up? Come on, come on. Oh, darn it. Yeah, Ken usually tells me when he Oh, when okay. he oh I didn't realize off. that. Uh, and he's busy right now. He's got... Uh, he's got a little party going yeah. at the aid station. Yeah. I mean, frozen grapes, popsicles, and Metallica. What more could you want in the middle of the desert? People come from miles around. Yep. To hang out at this aid station. You know, a global, a global experience right here. Yeah, this is about mile 11. Yeah, Aaron, this is not the aid station. Yeah. This is the grape station. So that's where the confusion lies. The grape station is Ken Rubley's project. It's it's not on the map. It's a super secret uh, uh, tech. So we don't have people going out there to chase the wild or the uh, frozen grape tree because they are pretty rare out here in the Arizona desert. Ken's trying to keep that a secret. There are runners still coming towards the mile eight aid station, which you can see here. Those runners are approaching approaching the mile eight aid station, which we don't have a shot of that aid station. This shot here is the mile eleven grape station. Yeah, our drone. Our drone pilot's going to be uh, playing leapfrog with the runners and each other throughout the race. So, um, you know, we, we grab what we can when we can grab it. Sometimes we're limited by uh, signal, uh, the level of signal that we get. Um, we do have some uh, um, boosting technology out there, but uh, we are still out in the middle of nowhere, hence the fact that sometimes we do get some some shots that are not the most uh, dynamic in terms of uh, frame refreshing. I think that Aaron Swank in the chat has just verbally committed to signing up for the Dome 250 next year to, uh, to take on the running adventure that is 250 miles across the great state of Arizona traversing some of the most beautiful landscapes the state has to offer. Uh, this is, it, it, it's an amazing experience for sure. I mean, I've never run this race, obviously, but I have done enough of this course and been out on a lot of these trails because this is, this includes segments of uh, the Black Canyon Ultras. It includes uh, bits and pieces of the Crown King Scramble of Man Against Horse, um, you know, even the Jerome Hill Climb, um, you know, uh, the Big Pine Race. I mean, you get a little bit, of, and, and even Sky Peaks, you get a little bit of everything. Like, there are segments and chunks of all sorts of other uh, big time Arizona races that uh, these runners will experience over the course of their 250 plus miles here in the Cocodona 250.
Michael Langwell, part of the uh, Goldberg clan in the chat. He's committing to watching the entire 2024 Kobe Donut 250 live stream. Shout, yeah, out that's to, a, uh, that, shout out to Michael. That's a commitment too. Trust me, um, being a part of this uh, this live stream is exciting and it's fun and it's rewarding. But uh, it's a it's a big week. I mean, I've got uh, I'm going to be uh, pivoting from. Oh, we do have the uh, this aerial is the mile eight, yeah. mile eight eight station. I can change that tag on the. Um, but yeah, that's uh, Cottonwood right there. Um, you know, I'm actually going to be departing here in a short bit and uh, going to work my day job for about eight, nine hours, and then I'm going to come back and uh, we'll be doing our a little thing we like to call Air Life After Dark, where anything goes, but it really doesn't. Sun goes down, but the mics stay hot. Oh, well, that's one thing uh, that uh, you always have to assume is that the mic is always hot. Yeah, and so once Chris steps out of here, that means uh, you guys are going to be stuck with me for the next few hours or so. Uh, until we are graced with the single track team of Finn and Brett at about noon. As again, we are taking a look at the Mile 8 aid station. Yeah, these runners are, are definitely uh, mid back of the pack, but I mean, it's still early in the race. It's not like they're in danger of missing any any cutoffs or anything. The cutoffs uh, are pretty uh, generous throughout. As long as they keep moving, even at a modest pace, uh, they'll be able to keep up with them. So we are taking a look above the mile eight aid station here. And we will, as we get more camera feeds pulling up we will uh, make sure that we check in we should have a little jam cam coming in in not too long he is at about mile 16 and a half so he should be seeing runners soon yeah Liam uh, I hope that uh, GM Ben Feingold uh, sneaks in as well it's always cool to see uh him in the uh, in the chat uh, for those not familiar Ben Feingold is one of the uh, top uh, chess players in the, the country and has been a uh, uh, very notable author and coach for decades and uh, as a former uh, scholastic chess player it was it tickled me to see him in our chats apparently he's a huge trail and ultra running fan so love it Who would have thought? Chess and ultra running. Yeah, well, it's it's a very analytical uh, uh, endeavor. I mean, it's problem solving, and uh, and so I can kind of see it. Can you switch to mile eleven station, please? I would if I had a camera feed currently there. Their feed went down, so we're uh, working on getting that back up in just a few minutes, hopefully. 
In the meantime, these are gorgeous shots here of, uh, of the early miles of the Cocodona 250. The d we did have a lot of uh, rain in this, uh, and snow up on the high country this spring, er, in this past winter. And so uh, we've had a very lush, very green desert uh, here um, uh, this year. It's been uh, pretty amazing to see. Uh, looks like we do have uh, that shot back up. Looks like there is no audio currently, though. their feed over there for us to be able to get them back in. I know that they're, they are working on it. So again, here is our, here is our drone that is going back on course from the mile eight aid station. Uh, Maria with the super chat donation uh, wants to grow her own frozen grape tree. I can't blame you there. Yeah. It would be nice and convenient to be able to do that. Now, Kevin in the chat, a very valid point. Grapes grow in a vine. But, no. But frozen, frozen grapes, grapes grow, grow on a tree. tree. Yes. Don't come at us with your facts and science. <laughs> Don't come at us with your logic. <laughs> There's a frozen grape tree in a small secluded area of the desert that uh, <laughs> Ken just doesn't want to share with anybody else. Can't be letting every. It's it's one of those hidden things that uh, you know only the locals know about <laughs> the frozen grape grove down in uh, Black Canyon. It's like. Uh... It's like the moonshine in Tennessee, right? When you, you have frozen, frozen grape trees of Arizona. You happen upon like a still in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we have a brief pause in the action here, we are going to get a little uh, word from one of our incredible sponsors here so we'll take just a short break and when we come back we will hopefully uh, be able to take you back to that mile 11 grape station so let's uh, let's hear from our good friends over at speed length <laughs> incredible little video from our good friends over at Speedland and now we are back at the grape station big fan of Debo big fan of Debo that's uh, I don't know where the audio we're not getting any audio from uh, from Ken so we'll have to work on that but we do have um, We do have um, 
There we go. Now we've yeah. got some audio. I was going out there again. Now it looks like we aren't getting any audio from there. So that is okay. But we will work on trying to get that audio fixed if we can. Yeah, at this point, uh, probably half or a little bit uh, more than half of the runners have hit the uh, grape aid at mile 11, the impromptu uh, aid station that uh, friend of the community, Ken Rubley, as you can see in his popsicle suit, uh, has set up to take care of runners. Um, this is foreign number one out of uh, Ken just being awesome. Oh wow, look at that beard. <laughs> what is that, bib 45? Bib number 45, the rock of the beard. But uh, Ken Rubley, uh, you know, basically put it out there that he'd be happy to help these runners. Kenny Krieger is the beard in question. Um, but uh, but he's out there. Uh, they were going to do, you know, they added a, a couple of water drops and and Ken just kind of put himself out there as willing to do it. So, so he's out there uh, on his own or of his own volition. I mean, he's you know been involved with the running community here in Arizona for a long time, far longer than me. But uh, he's just a fan of watching people do amazing things. So, you know, and he wanted to be a part of uh, Cocodona. So I guess uh, somebody's asking about Garmeyer. Um, Garmeyer's tracker is showing that he is roughly 150 feet from the start. We're going to try and figure out what's going on with that because we know that he is close to the front. It sounds like the signal that we're getting is from bib number 105 rather than bib 5, but uh, we'll confirm on that. Uh, we'll see what happened there, and of course we'll be seeing more of Jeff Garmeyer as the week progresses. try to work with uh, our race command team just to see um, what is going on with uh, with Jeff Garmeyer's tracker here as we mentioned for those just tuning in we do have runner tracking that is right below the um, video window on your YouTube uh, you can see uh, right below you've got the Copadona com slash live runner tracking the actual Cocodona website for information and a lot of uh, frequently asked questions can be answered there including a copy of the runner guide as well as uh, Cocodona merch you can pick up uh, Cocodona merch uh, on the website as well for Mountain Outpost um, and also as well as uh, other era viper running and uh, steep life merchandise too Looking at the runner tracker, uh, as I cannot stress enough, it is way too early to, um, to take anything of note from the runner tracking, but it looks like the front of the men's pack uh, looks to be uh, Killian Korth, Michael Versteeg, and Nathan Williams. Uh, on the women's side, it looks like it's Megan McCarty, uh, Sarah Ostazewski, and uh, Eliza LaPierre. Uh, but again, these are um, these are all dependent on satellite pings. Don Greenwald uh, is uh, showing as being with or right around Eliza Lapierre. Don Greenwald, the highest uh, returning finisher 
uh, to this year's Coca Donut. Having finished second in the inaugural year in 2021, uh, Don was somebody that uh, when people that I talked to were trying to uh, you know, offer their um, uh, predictions, uh, I felt like Don had been kind of slept on a little bit because nobody beyond me had her as uh, one of their potential uh, podium picks, but uh, having seen Dawn run this race in 2021 and knowing that she's done in an inordinate amount of training on uh, these trails as a Flagstaff native, I feel like she's going to show very strong throughout the week. So uh, that's a name that you're going to want to keep your eyes on. Uh, one of the people that she trained with is uh, Desiree Clark. So, uh, you know, both of them are pretty strong. And uh, we'll see where uh, where the, the week takes that. Yeah, so people still asking about Jeff Garmeyer. Garmeyer's tracker is working. Huh. Um, so it's got him at 14, mile 14.7. Okay, yeah, because uh, it was, somebody was saying that, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's at mile 14. He was seven. having tracker issues okay. earlier on, so, um, but those have resolved. So Adam Williams uh, is, in results. fact, Adam Williams and not Jeff Garmeyer. Correct. And so yes. Adam Williams is chewing up dirt right now as he is hanging with that lead, with that lead pack. But yeah, I think we're, you know, 15, 16 miles into a 250-mile race, so there's a... A whole lot of uh, running and coverage left to go. Uh, you can see uh, Ken was helping out with bib number 143 there. That was uh, Bruce Gungle um, uh, from here in Arizona, uh, from Tucson, from uh, down south. Probably uh, knows the uh, the Pima Pirate uh, running contingent down there in Tucson. Yeah, a really strong uh, running community down in Tucson, Pima Pirates. Mm -hmm. They did. Uh, they took over the the Munns Park Aid Station, I believe. Oh, sweet! Last year, last year. Oh, okay. I, I'm not sure what they're doing this year. I'm surprised more of them haven't uh, partaken in Cocodona. Um Some of them are very used to long distances. And it looks like we've got a jam cam sighting here, so let's see. I'll have to fix that real quick here. And then we will send it over to Jamil in just a second. This will be our first. Uh Jam Jam sighting potentially, if we can uh, pull that up, uh, but we'll uh, make sure that we've got it ready to go. Yep, and we do have it, so let's see if we can check in with Jamil here. Jamil, how are you doing? Hey guys, doing well? And up I'm here, mile 17. One in. second here. Jamil, can you hear us? There we go. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? We can. Yep. Good morning, Jamil. Where are you at? Oh, looks like we lost Jamil. He is out in the middle of the desert, so it's uh, not surprising that there might be some uh, issues with uh, the signal, so. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll send it back to Jamil here. There we go, we've got you now, Jamil. Hey, Jam Jam. Jamil, can you hear us? Looks like maybe Jamil can't hear us right now. So we will uh, try and get that sorted. In the meantime, these are shots from uh, the uh, grape water drop at uh, mile 11, which was not originally meant to be a water drop station, 
but uh, the cottonwood aid had to be adjusted because of rough roads to get out there. Luckily, we have a friend of the family, Ken Rubley, seen there in his popsicle suit and uh, American flag hat. Uh, Ken volunteered to go out there because he just wanted to be a part of everything. That's the kind of guy he is. He's uh, a positive, supportive member of the community. Hopefully, we'll get some more audio of him doing the hard sell on, uh, on some of the wares that he has to offer uh, between the water, uh, the frozen grapes that he plucked from his own frozen grape tree in a secret, undisclosed location of the desert, as well as uh, popsicles. Uh, he's taking care of those runners out there, and uh, basically that was something that he, he basically told uh, Jamil and Steve Adderhold, the race director, that he wanted to do it. So he's out there doing it. They said, sure, that's great. What a what a legend. We'll see if we can get Jamil's feed working here. Jamil, can you hear us? It's a beautiful shot right there. Yeah, but we aren't getting any audio from Jamil now. He's muted, unmuted. Looks like he's parked himself in an area waiting for runners to potentially come over that ridge right there. I'm not sure where he would be. Probably close to the water drop at mile 23. Maybe a little bit before that if he's uh, out there anticipating where they're going to be coming in. Yeah, and we may need him to fully refresh his feed. So we're not getting any audio there. Not getting any audio from Ken. So we will uh, we will keep trying to uh, sort that out. I think somebody was asking in the chat if uh, Jamil is still going to run Stone at 125. I don't believe so. I believe that uh, he has decided that he is going to help. Uh, uh, people don't realize that Jamil is doing a lot in an event like this um, behind the scenes. I mean, he's doing a lot of drone piloting. He's out there filming on the ground. Um, you know, so you know when he has the opportunity to to run his races, he definitely you know takes that opportunity. But he also will be doing some uh, work behind the scenes and possibly joining us in the studio as well. As you can see, uh, Ed, the jester Eddinghausen hitting that aid station. Um, Ed decked out in his full gear. Uh, those that aren't familiar, Ed is a true legend of the sport, having uh, completed in excess of 200 ultramarath or 200 hundred milers. Ed keeps uh, all of his buckles on a, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, a giant keychain. And uh, that keychain is extremely heavy. So I'm uh, nice. uh, glad to see him out here uh, on the Coconona Trails. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, um, when we realized that he was running the race, this is not his wheelhouse. So I'm kind of curious to see how he does. This is a much more uh, rough and rugged course than he is typically to run. We see him at Havilland 100 most years. We'll see him at across the years and logging monster mileage, 400 plus miles in a six day race is not uncommon for him, even as he is, uh, I believe in his early 60s at this point. Oh, I bet Ken loves, uh, Ken loves this outfit. Oh yeah, I mean, well, you know, and, and he and the gesture have known each other for a long time. Let's, let's uh, just check with Jamil here. Jamil. Are you able to hear us? We still can't hear you. I think that that's our... Yeah, so we will have Hopefully to keep jam, working jam, on that. Let us know, but yeah, uh, 
I, I guess I'm kind of surprised that there seem to be a, a lot of people in the chat who are not familiar with ag. Um, I mean, you know, if you're not familiar with the, the, the history of the sport of the last decade, you know, you might not be familiar with them, but uh, ag is um, a very, uh, very active, very positive guy. I know he's won, he's won as many as 400 milers a month. That's uh, crazy. Yeah. Uh, he's been known to run as many as uh, 500 milers in a month as well. So uh, uh, he, my first encounter with him was at uh, one of our Nagini Manor races, uh, Hotfoot Hamster, the inaugural Hotfoot Hamster. And I wanted to follow along with him just to see what made him tick. And I watched him and I said, you know what, I can keep up with this guy. No, I can't keep up with this guy because for 25 miles, yeah, I can keep up with him because he's walking extremely fast, but you don't realize how fast he is uh, over the long haul until 12 hours into a race, he's walking an 11 minute mile while eating a bowl of chili. He's uh, truly a unique athlete and somebody who didn't get involved in the trail and ultra running scene until uh, later in life. I believe he was in his late 40s or early 50s the first time he ran an ultra. So for those of you watching that are thinking that it's too late to get involved in this, Ed jumped in and uh, you know, 200 plus 100 milers later, he has not looked back. He logs an average of about four to 5,000 miles a year uh, in terms of training and racing. So and we do have Spark. Jamil now. There we go. We've got audio from Jamil out there. You guys, we had our leader just go by. Do you know who, uh, who we have or What's what their number? 29. So that's Killian Korth out of Colorado. Yep. Killian Korth. And Jamil, where are you at on the uh, on the course? Uh, mile seventeen. Mile seventeen. How did uh, how did Killian look out there? Looks like we've got second place coming up here. Yeah, I think this is versus Michael. Yo. Hey. See ya. Good job, man. It's gone so far. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so Killian Kor followed by Michael Versteeg, as we mentioned, Jamil is out at about mile 17 of the course, and he's able to pick up these runners as they uh, uh, come over that ridge. Beautiful shot, though, of uh, of the I guess the they've started the ascent into the Bradshaws at this point. Jamil, what elevation are you at right now? You might not be able to hear us, but there is a suspect um, uh, coverage out there as far as uh, signals. So we'll take what we can get. Hopefully we'll uh, be able to catch. Uh, I think he'd run. I think Jamil would run up trail a little okay. bit. There he is. <laughs> can you guys hear me? We yeah. can, yeah. Yay, we got it working. Oh, yeah, oh. I was, uh, I got like a really good little spot of service here. So I, oh. I'm gonna leave the camera here, but I'm kind of running up the trail a little bit. We got I think your we audio, just, we we lost your person. video. Yeah, we just lost the video feed, Jamil. <laughs> we have audio. There we go. Yeah, there we, there go. we go. We back? All right, yeah. nice. Woo, mile what? 17. We're up above 4,000 feet here. I'll tell you what, the climb up to this point was getting hot, um, like, or at least warm, kind of trending on hot. You're in the canyons, saguaro cactus, absolutely beautiful out here right now. So many, it's so green, it's so different than two years ago. But right as you crest this hill, I can actually, over to my right, I can see Black Canyon City like where the start of the race was 17 that's miles ago. Amazing. And that's why we have service right here. So I'm just gonna, gonna park it here for a while, give you guys this vantage point. Um, but there's a little bit of a breeze here. There's kind of a lot of gnats flying around, but like the temperature is so much better than even a half mile ago when you're kind of tucked in that canyon. How does the trail conditions and the temperature compare to uh what you what you went through in the inaugural year through this section 
the I mean, the trail seems rockier and more washed out due to the rains. You know, part of the reason we had to move that station back. Um, temperature wise, you know, to be honest, I don't know that I remember what the temperature was that first day. Um, <laughs> maybe simi similar, possibly. Really? I'm actually surprised because uh, it seemed like it was cooler. Now, obviously, it's still early in the day, early in the race, but uh, I just remember was it how- You're saying it was cooler in the inaugural year or this year? This year, at least that was my oh, understanding. Okay. Yeah, well, and actually there are some clouds that are kind of rolling in, like the sun just went behind something over here. So as long as those kind of keep moving throughout the day, I think that's gonna really help people a lot. Well, it definitely helps to uh, I, to have the runners able to be, be able to hit uh, multiple uh, aid stations on their way up to where you're at right now. Obviously in 2021, you had the one aid station, the Cottonwood at mile 11. Now you've got mile eight. And then uh, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but Ken Rubley has been uh, turning his uh, water slash frozen grape drop into an absolute party and the runners are loving it. And uh, you can tell that they're having a great time. And I'm hoping that that has helped set them up for success uh, both physically and mentally as they get to where you're at. Yeah, when we got there, he was booming his music in that canyon. It was already a party before, right when I left at like six, whatever. You know, he keeps saying that you're not going to get frozen grapes at these fancy aid stations. You're going to get warm watermelon and all these other things. So Ken's, uh, <laughs> Ken's having a great time down there. Yeah, it looks like there's a bit of a separation already between Killian, uh, Michael, and the rest of the field, but... Hopefully that just means everyone's playing it smart. I think that, you know, people know, I think what to expect now based upon the stories from the first year. I think people are playing it real smart. Of course, we have the mandatory water carry now of four liters. And then we, we had uh, pack horses bring in another liter for every runner that'll be at mile 25. Um, so that's about, you know, eight miles from here. Um, I know I started back at mile 11 with four liters and, you know, I, I don't think I've gone through a liter yet. So, you know, we're, we're thinking that people are going to be, you know, way better prepared this year. Yeah. I'm actually surprised about the separation at this point. Um, you know, with the runner tracking, obviously it depends on where they ping, but, uh, it seems like it's been several minutes since we've seen somebody, uh, roll through and, uh, based on what we had seen, everybody had been pretty tight, wound, tightly wound um, prior to this, but it looks like uh, based on what we're seeing now, if the tracker is thinking correctly, that you might find a glut of runners here coming up in the next uh, minute or two. Awesome. Yeah, well, uh, once they come through, I'll get out of the way. I'll probably chase them up the trail a little bit. So, um, awesome. yeah, it's been great so far. Hey, Jamil, do you remember when uh, in the inaugural year how much water you took with you when you left Cottonwood that first year? Yeah, so I went a little overboard. Um, I had six liters with me, and I gave away at least a full liter in route, so I probably consumed about five liters, which will be about probably on average what folks have this year. If they leave mile 11 with four liters, they get one more at Milk Ranch. The other factor this year, I think some people will carry more than that just based upon personal preference. And I, there was definitely a little bit of water running back there, but there should be more, more creeks and streams ahead as we go. And so there should be a good chance to filter some more water on top of the amount we're providing. Yeah, one of the things that I, I spoke with a few runners as I was uh tooling around town yesterday in Flagstaff, and a couple of them had mentioned that this is the first time that they were actually carrying a filtration system with them. Uh, so I think that uh, people are learning from the lessons of years gone by and seeing, uh, you know, that, like you said, it's better to be a little bit over prepared in terms of water because, you know, not, not everybody's gonna have the opportunity to uh, find somebody who's got a, a liter extra on them. And uh, with the other, the additional water drops that's going to help but at the same time it's it's good to see that the runners are approaching things a little bit less cavalier than perhaps they would have in 2021. yeah i mean a filter doesn't weigh a whole lot these days it's pretty great technology and so it's just a little insurance policy to have one with you well, um, and there are so many like soft flasks that have filtered tops to them now that i think 
that that's like a real advantage. I think that the, just the technology of um, packs and hydration has come a long ways that like helps really support these kind of endeavors. Oh, we got runners coming, but yeah. I mean, when I hiked the Arizona Trail, I was using the droplets. You had to let it sit for a half hour, so. Awesome. I'll get out of the way here. Oh, Thanks, sweet. Jamel. We see people coming over the hill. We'll uh, try and uh, get uh, bib numbers as they're coming by. Whoever that is, they're moving pretty well for, uh, I mean, they're third place in the race right now. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I'm kind of shocked at how much of a gap uh, had formed there. Morning. Going today. How are we doing? Good, how are you? What's your bib number? 31. Bib 31. Bib 31 is Nathan Williams. Uh, Nathan Williams. Out of uh, Sandy, Utah. So no stranger to uh, uh, the Woo. high desert conditions. Nice work. Hey, thank you. What's your bib number? Uh, 105. 105. 105 is Adam Williams. So I don't think nice they're related. Nice work, man. But, How's it going so far? Uh, awesome. Yeah, Adam Williams. Uh, hitting that uh, mile 17 mark where uh, Jamil is positioned. And uh, we should be having our first uh, woman coming through here momentarily as well from the looks of things, so. As you can see, uh, Adam is the uh, fourth male. Uh, we have a, uh, a dynamic runner tracking system this year in terms of our, uh, what we're able to show. Uh, yep, we got another Sarah. Runner. We got Sarah O coming up. Sarah Ostaszewski, uh, my uh, pick to win the Coconut 250 this year. Flagstaff's own Midwest representing. And while it is early, hey, Sarah is uh, uh, last from mile 11. Yeah, it's like the perfect day. It's great, huh? Yeah. Sarah O and. I think that was uh, Don, Don Reichelt there. Um, but yeah, Sarah O, oh, um, you know, is she going out pretty hot? Possibly, but she led Mogian Monster wire to wire. Did you hear her, did you hear her there? She, yeah. She's like, oh, it's a, a perfect Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Right? Like, the, the attitude and the spirit she had there was, I think, really promising, uh, showing that like, okay, she probably went out under control um, at a minimum. Yeah, I mean, she's a very smart runner. And also she is, uh, she's learned over the times running this race, uh, you know, how to better prepare herself. And I think, like I said, it's just a matter of time until she wins this race. And this could very well be the year. That looks like that is uh, maybe Mike McKnight. Yeah, that's that's Mike McKnight right there. And again, the the um, places <coughs> haven't updated on these cards here, so um, if the place is incorrect, uh, those will update. Those will auto update throughout the course of the uh, day. And I wonder if that runner who came in prior, you said you thought it was Don. It might have been uh, Don. No, uh, no, that's not who I wanted. Sorry. I thought it was Mike Grown. It could be because Mike that's, was actually towards the front. That's who on. it. The hair looked similar to this photo, so yeah. I apologize uh, for uh, for missing him earlier. If that was him, if that was not him, yeah, Mike I definitely apologize taking for that. the sun and the heat seriously this year. Uh, of course, he finished second last year at Coconut 250, but in 2021 he did not have a, a good race at all. Uh, Mike had uh, succumbed to uh, the heat exhaustion and uh, actually uh, had to get medical attention. Um, if you watched the film Inaugural Year, our film about the first Coconut 250, uh, Michael spent uh, a little bit of time. Oh, that's definitely Don. There we go. I can almost guarantee that. Um, he had the uh, speed had lands spent, on. That looked like him. There we go. Um, Mike had uh, spent a, a little bit of time in medical care due to uh, rhabdo, I believe. Yep. Yeah. So, but uh, I think that runners, uh, especially the veterans who have, have traversed this race before, uh, they're going to get you know smarter and smarter and and, and better prepared for uh, uh, for this race. 
and for just a minute we're gonna send it back to everyone's favorite person to the mile 11 grape station in just a minute I have to get to the right screen we're gonna send it over to old Ken Rubley here let me see if I can get his audio working right now I have no audio so if they can no magic potions no fairy dust no one to do it for. <laughs> that's awesome they may need to uh, just make sure that you are unmuted on your end and you may need to just refresh your browser um, if you can we are not getting any audio from we have runners coming up on uh, Jamil's side if we can pivot over yep. there real quick Looks like we've got a few. Of oh, them. there's that big Goldberg energy. We've got our second female. I couldn't get a bit. That was Mika Thuz. Mika Thuz. Yeah. Thuz. Is. Bit. Fifty. That's Kevin Hadfield. Looks like uh, we might have. Uh, or I thought we had Ken. I was mistaken. We've got a lot of screens. We've got a, <laughs> we we have a lot of screens. So we're looking at like no less than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, counting our uh, phones. Um, uh, here in the command center at the uh, at the Coconut Studios. Looks like we got another runner. This shot is so perfect because it shows you how rugged this trail is. That but you can also see the runners as they kind of crest there. Pretty sure that's Megan McCarty coming up uh, if it's yellow shorts. Yeah. So Megan McCarty, our third place female at this point. Yep. And the, one of the fun things about this race is that just as you get comfortable and familiar with what they're wearing, they go and change clothes the next day. So yeah. you have to learn it all over again. And there's Jamil heading down the course for... Uh, I, he's probably got like four or five different cameras going. Like he might be doing some still shots on a timer somewhere else. He's got this static cam. Uh, on this section of the trail, and he's going to film something for uh, something he'll create later on. Uh, he's he's got so many irons in the fire, even in a single race such as this. This is coming into view. I believe that was Christopher St. John, but yeah, I think that's right. And as we mentioned, the, the placings might not be exactly accurate, but at the same time, it's because a lot of the, uh, it's when the GPS tracker pings, we're kind of at the mercy of technology on that one. Do we have audio from that uh, spot on the trail? That nice little uh, foot crunch that we get as uh, the runners go by? Yeah. There is something very comforting about that, I have to admit, to, to be able to hear uh, the runners come by. I think that was, was that Dominic Grossman right there? No, it wasn't Dominic Grossman. That was, um, I believe, Jared Bird. Tell you what, we're uh, uh, getting so into it. <laughs> you can hear the flies yeah. and the gnats as Jamil was mentioning. Uh, uh, they're no joke out there. Yeah, 
hear some birds chirping in the background. This is very, uh, very comforting. It is 80 degrees, but it's that desert exposure that makes it feel so much uh, more brutal. I did uh, the Elden climb yesterday and uh, it got up to about 85, but it felt like that true Arizona desert when I was up on uh, some exposed parts of uh, um, Mount Elden. We're just having fun hanging out here, Clint. We're, you know, having a good time, you know, taking in the views. Trust me, if I if I could be out there just hanging out, I would be. One of my favorite things to do every year is to go and hang out at Hard Rock and have no responsibilities. I just go out there and hang out. My son comes with me up to Silverton and to Uray, and I go and give the kid some cash to go over to the hot spring, uh, water park over there and uh, then I just hang out at Uray Aid and watch runners go by and, and make friends. Looks like we may have... Oh, I'm loving again. these birds. Do we have audio on Ken at uh, the Great Aid? No. We got somebody. Got another runner coming into our main feed. This is about mile 17 uh, as the runners have uh, eclipsed the 4,000 foot uh, elevation mark and are heading uh, from Cottonwood Aid up to live Crown stream. King. Hello, live stream. <laughs> Hello. This is the hill of 10,000 rocks that move. <laughs> There's Dom Grossman. Oh, wow. Don Grossman, and then that was Bib 103 right behind him. Uh, that was uh, Adam Arthurs, and now we've got Jam Jam coming back into view. How are things looking out there, Jam Jam? What's that? How are things looking out there? Pretty good. That was uh, Dom Grossman just went by. He said, pretty hot in that canyon. But honestly, right when you hit here, you get up on this ridge, you can start to feel the breeze blowing over. We got the clouds rolling in. So hopefully that. Uh, is some optimism for the rest of the morning here. But yeah, so far people are in good spirits. Sarah was saying how much easier it is this year from two years ago. Mike McKnight was saying the same thing. He says it feels 20 degrees cooler to him, so. Good. Well, he also has a lot better uh, heat mitigation as far as his outfit goes this year. I mean, he's decked out all in white from head to toe. Like, whereas- Oh yeah, like, he's all, you know, he's covered up. He is, he's looking smart, yep. Yeah, I believe he was wearing a black t-shirt out here the first year, so, uh, and uh, that uh, was probably not the best gear for that day, but uh, glad to see he's doing a lot better. Yeah, amazing how the times have changed. Do you think that, have you seen, um, maybe I'm just, you know, anecdotally observing this, but it seems like people are wearing sleeves a lot more than they did two years ago. I mean, everybody is kind of seeming to learn from uh, what runners that have been here been here in the past have done. Yeah, I mean, the collective wisdom starts to add up over time once people get out here. I'll get out of the way real quick. We got someone coming. Yes. Hi. Sorry, I would have been here sooner, but I just took a cactus bike right to the bottom of the foot. Oh God. Oh no. Good. Hey, Go get it. Thanks, man. Good out here again. That's Andy Pearson. The legend. Andy Pearson, uh, bid number 41. For those uh, that are following in the uh, YouTube channel, you can uh, search out runners by checking the coconut or runner tracking that is pinned to the bottom of the video display on YouTube, as well as check out the coconut website and our coconut merch, as well as other steep life and air viper running merch that is available there too. 
of course, uh, Matt and I will be modeling this stuff all week. I brought a bunch of clothes. I brought a bunch of Copilona gear and stuff. So I love it. I'm excited to show some of it off. I love it. I'm really enjoying the soothing sounds of the trail right now. This is a, a very nice feeling to, to have this in the background. But I'm actually going to have to take my departure for the morning here in just a few minutes. Uh, it's been fun uh, hanging out here this morning with uh, you and a couple hundred of our brand new friends as they start their journey from Black Canyon City all the way up to Flagstaff, Arizona here at the 2023 Coconut 250. Uh, folks, I will be joining you later this uh, afternoon slash evening for Aravipa After Dark. Uh, for those who have never been a part of it, uh, it's anything goes. It's anything can time. happen in Aravipa After Dark. Uh, Matt, uh, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, pleasure I know that you'll keep the car on the road and uh, we'll see you. We'll, we'll do our best to uh, keep the ship sailing. So. Folks, stick around. It's going to be pretty great. Uh, I'll uh, join you here later this evening and uh, keep on uh, cheering on these runners and uh, letting them know how excited you are to follow them. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so did. Yeah. Now I'm going to work, work. <laughs> and we are back out at the jam cam at about mile 17 as we've got a runner coming here. Nice work. Way to go. Thank you. It's 122. Bid number 122. Ryan Janzik. The Arizona native. Looks like things are slowing down over at Ken Station, huh? Yeah, they are. We we keep trying to uh, check in with him over there because he's the you know the people's favorite as expected. Uh, big ball of energy over at the Grape Station, um, but we're having a little bit of audio uh, issues over there. I know that their phone uh, is also heating up quite a bit, so. Um, you know, they've already had it overheat once, so that could also be playing a role uh, as to why uh, why we can't um, why we can't get a, a little check in with Ken. He's looking dapper, though. That's for sure. The popsicle suit. All right, right we got a big pack of runners coming through. Got a pack of four. Looks like Jeff Garmeyer is part of this team. We've got a whole group there.
but if you like want to leave here and go there. Uh -huh. Ow! Yeah! <laughs> and then we saw that was Don Greenwald. a whole crew of, uh, of people coming through here. in the chat. Did I miss Sally? I shouldn't have gone for that third donut. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, I don't know that I have seen Sally come through. I could have missed her, but my guess is I would have heard her very distinguishable voice as well. So Eddie, you might be uh, you might be in luck. You may not have missed her quite yet. Yeah, she just pinged at mile sixteen point two. So we are at mile seventeen. So she should be uh, should be coming up as we got another pack here. Look at these guys in great spirits. Thank you, thank you. I love it. Jumping around the house with. Uh... Just saw Eliza uh, LaPierre there. really interesting from this vantage point obviously you can see more of the mountains off in the distance kind of in the left hand corner of your screen there but when I'm not talking you can just hear the wind and the breeze that runners are getting uh, as they kind of crest this uh, this ridge here like we've got another runner coming up here.
How's it going? How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Nice work. I'll see you later. Yep. That was number 12, Jimmy Strayhorn. Jimmy Strayhorn. We had a nice group back there. You had Jeff Garmeyer and, and uh, I believe Josh Perry, who I think is the was the Arizona FKT holder, I think unsupported, or he still has it. Yep, yeah. He has a uh, pretty stout um, through hiking FKT background. But not a lot of races, if any. They, I think they were saying this might be his, his first race or his first race in a long time. So, you know, real interesting candidate, you know, kind of like, I mean, we had a Arizona Trail FKT holder first year and second year win this thing. So goes a long ways. Well, you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of AZT uh, FKT holders on course today, yep. don't you? Uh, yes. Garmeyer, Perry, Versteeg, uh, Mike McKnight obviously attempted recently, so you've got a lot of experience uh, on the Arizona Trail, at least on the men's side. Should be also it sounds like self-supported is what the live chat is saying. Oh, the uh, PCT self-supported and the long trail. Long Lots trails. Yes. Hey, Way to go! Thanks looking. for sharing this beautiful country with us, man. Yeah, looking good. Keep it up. It's been 51. So, Matt, I got to just shout out uh, Chad, Satisfy. Right. Yep. You guys shout out Satisfy. They, uh, I saw Brees, the founder of Satisfy. He's out here. You know, they've got this, this big extravaganza plan for the Mile 108 station. And uh, he gifted me this sweet shirt right at the start line and this hat. And it says, like, Fain Ranch Aid Station. It's got the Coca Dona 250 2023 and then this awesome artwork on the back. That's awesome. So there's people already, like, there's a buzz on the course. People are looking forward to mile 100. I love nice it. work. Good. Great. How are you? Awesome. Got that breeze coming in. I know, right? When you get up here, yeah. it starts to get real good. Got that pop springs early on. And now we're cool. Yeah, man. Keep it up. Thank you. 97. That was Rolando Mendoza. Rolando Mendoza there, the California native. Uh, the live chat, uh, we've already played the Floda commercial uh, one time <laughs> here on the live stream, and the live chat was, was loving it. Uh, so... Satisfy may need to, to build some partnerships with Coca-Cola to really expand production of, uh, of Flota. Have we, so now that it's the cats out of the bag, have we, have you guys talked much about Flota? No, no, we've so, talked okay. more about Verstique's smile at the end of the commercial than, uh, all right. <laughs> so rumor has it Flota will be launched at the Fane Ranch aid station starting tomorrow morning and it'll be available for all of the runners of Cocodona first first chance so we are as soon as we can get uh like maybe a case or a few cans we're going to try and get them up to you guys in the studio in Flagstaff for some on-air taste tests because I'm really curious I haven't tried it we hadn't seen we had just heard rumors until we were set the commercial and my, Matt, we might have to play that by popular demand at least a couple times during each broadcast. Yeah, no, what, we definitely will. We definitely need to get some Flota up here. Uh, maybe maybe have to take a Flota out of a beer bong or something during Aravipa After Dark. That seems very <laughs> on brand. Yeah, a little Flota and whiskey maybe. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Liam, 8th Station Fireball wasn't here for the Flota commercial, so... 
He's oh, gonna have to. Man. He's gonna have to stick around. You know what? I think we've got a. Uh, I think we've got time. Let's go ahead. Can we do it? All yeah. Right, let's. I'll get, uh, I'll get, I'll get, I'll, let's do it. Let's hit this flow to commercial real quick. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Floda. Matt, are you getting are you getting the audio output on that for the fans at home? I couldn't hear it on my end, but hopefully they could. Um, I believe so. Uh, it, could you if the if the chat will let me know if you guys couldn't okay. hear it. Because there was uh, some, like, the, the audio experience of that commercial, I think, is it makes the it. beauty of it. It makes it. Man, I'll tell you what, as soon as it starts to feel a little warm up here, the breeze kicks up, the clouds roll in, and I'm getting, like, a little bit of a chill. So I think that's a good sign for today. Yeah. Especially yeah. for those folks that are coming up the hill. Yeah, so, Jamil, they could hear it. Um, but I don't think the audio would be shared to you. So I think the audio is just going out. So awesome. But they heard it. They loved it. And that's all that matters, really. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's Michael Versteeg, uh, I don't know, at his peak, maybe. Well, I think that's one of the only times I've ever seen him smile. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's definitely giving me the like the liquid death vibes from a marketing perspective. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. But uh, I mean Liquid Death is partnering with like Travis Barker and uh Satisfy is partnering with Michael Versteeg. They're like rock stars in their own right, you know? <laughs> well, and I do mention well, we saw Andy Pearson go by. We yep. shout out to Liquid Death. We've got it in the studio. It will also be at the Fane Ranch Aid Station, the Satisfy Aid Station, Mile 100. Love it. But <laughs> we're, yeah, we're going to for sure, tomorrow morning, I'm going to head over there probably between 7 and 8 in the morning, and I'm going to do a whole tour of the runner experience that is the Satisfy Mile 100 Aid Station that is already getting a lot of hype. Um, from what I know of it, it sounds incredible, like no other aid station I've ever heard of before. So we're gonna do at least one walkthrough, if not more. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to try some of that flow to firsthand. Yeah, you're gonna have to give us like an MTV Cribs tour of the uh, the Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station. My hope is that Brees, the founder of Satisfy, will walk us through. He's, it was a lot of his vision. So um, really looking forward to what those guys uh, put together. They put a lot of time and attention into everything they do. It's very unique and yeah, really excited to have them, you know, taking a role in this event this year. I think it's gonna add a lot for the athletes out here. Yeah, Jamil, I'm I'm not gonna lie. That Floda commercial, maybe a little bit better than your Satisfy uh, video that you're in. <laughs> well, that was the early days, so you know. You were the guinea pig. <laughs> All right, we got someone coming up. We should be seeing Sally McRae uh, coming up here shortly. Oh, this looks like Pete Kostelnik, maybe. So Pete, hey, Jamil, yeah, how you yeah. doing? Good, how are you? Castle hey. Nick here. Nice work. Looking strong. Runners are probably starting to feel really good once they uh, kind of crest this ridge and get some reprieve from the uh, from the heat. Yeah, I mean that whole valley. You're just crisscrossing over in a canyon. There's very little breeze. It's extremely rocky, extremely steep coming up through here. And right before you crest to this spot where you can see Black Canyon City behind me, 
flattens out a little bit and the breeze just crests right over. And like I said before, we're above 4,000 feet here. The vegetation's starting to change there. You know, I can't see any saguaro cactus up here. Whereas it was, there was like hundreds of them down there in that valley. And now we're starting to see some like scrub oak, maybe some starting to be some junipers up here. And we're trending towards the pines of Crown King where we'll be shortly here in a couple hours. We've got more runners coming up right now. Woo! All right. Oh yeah. Clouds keep coming in now. Has it been that giving you some reprieve down there? Yeah, it was great. That's great. Yeah, nice thanks. work. It's 27. That is Alicia Jenkins. Bellingham, Washington. She has made her way about 17 miles or so uh, into the race here. some Alicia Jenkins fans in the chat, so cheering Woo! for her. I'm ready, I'm ready. You look like you're ready, all right. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was... David Meow. Yep. He is pumped up. It's looking <laughs> good. A lot of energy. I saw him shirtless at the start line. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I hope he's got a lot of sunscreen on. Jamil, how are you? Good, how are you? Not bad. There you, you go. Know I spoke to you briefly a few weeks ago, or like yeah. a few months ago. Yeah. Jeff, nice to meet yeah. you. Great to meet you. you. Told me about the platypus, the two-liter yeah, bag. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Great to be out here. Yeah, sweet. Appreciate it. How yeah. are you? Good, man. Yeah. Yeah, just out here trying to support. Cool. Let's see if everyone's doing all right. Yeah. Seems like we got some good cloud cover today, yeah. right? It's better than... Well, and that canyon was a bit rough, but now that you're up here, like, I'm, I've been feeling some nice breeze since I got up yeah. here, so hopefully that continues. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm curious, how far how many people are, are, are like, ahead? Oh, man. Here, you know? Wow, I haven't kept track 40 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, I'm going to keep trucking. Keep it up, man. All right, thank you. Yep. Take care. Yeah. Way to go. It's 203. Yeah, but that was... Uh, Jeff Kent coming through there. Sounded in uh, sounded in good spirits. Yeah. Now I was trying to point you down there. I don't know if you can see, but down there's Black Canyon City. Yeah. Down that can, direction. We can see down into that direction. So start line is somewhere down there. Yep. And if I pan pan this way, this is sick. Oh, and you can see the cactus. You can see the brat. They just keep. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a lot of wildflowers out here. Oranges and purples and pinks and everything. It's it's fantastic. Looks like. 
back on that static shot there. Got a couple runners coming. Woo! Nice work. Hey, way to go, guys. How we feeling? Good, good. Sweet. Thanks for being out here. Hey, good, sir. nice work. Keep it up. Thanks. I hear Sally, I think. <laughs> like, like, I haven't been out here. Wild, huh? It is so beautiful. I was like, hollering and talking to the sky, yeah. like, that will be. Yeah, it's epic. Yeah. That's like starting. This shot here, Eric, is uh, at roughly mile 17. Looks like we've got our next runner coming up here. I'm not sure who that was. Looks like our feet is a little choppy.
Yeah, and for those in the chat, yeah, we uh, are obviously aware that the video quality is lagging a little bit. We are working on trying to get that fixed. Thanks for being such a good ambassador for the sport. Man. Right, so much. Of course. Looks like that was Wes Plate who just came through. Again, we'll see if we can get the video feed cleaned up a little bit here. And as soon as that comes back, we will uh, take you back to that feed. But for the time being, we are uh, going to keep our eyes on the live tracker here. And looks like we got the jam cam back up and going. We just don't have audio now, so we've got the camera feed. We'll work on getting the audio sorted here in a minute. For those of you just tuning in, this is about mile 17. Um, Jamil is up there with a the camera. Currently lost our audio, but we will uh, work on getting that back. But the video feed is cleaned up, which is probably the most important part as we have another runner coming through here, a couple runners. that those were some nice shorts I'm not sure who that runner was I couldn't get a bib but as soon as we get audio back up we will uh, we will be able to check in with Jamil I'm not getting any audio from you still, Jamil. Looks like. So we've got more runners coming through here. Shout out to Deb in the chat. Still no audio, but we are getting a good feed of runners coming through here. Looks 
is going to work on getting that taken care of. We're back checking in at the aid station with Ken. I don't think we have any audio there. So we will see if we can keep getting this audio situation sorted here on the uh, jam cam. So we've got another runner coming up right here. That looks like bib 131, 137. Looks like that was Dave Brownrigg. We have 131. That's Andy Glaze, legend in some uh, faux denim shorts, I believe. to see if we can get a read on the bib there. Looks like bib. Twenty-four maybe? Uh, that would be Matthew Moore. Classic shot of the trail greenery. So we got another runner coming through. Couldn't get a read on that bib. Yeah, Mike Darris in the chat. Snake point of view. That's right. That's what the, uh, the little guys see. Hey. Jamil's beautiful face here. Again, trying to get some audio issues sorted here. So we've got the video, but we have no audio from Jamil. So again, we will uh, we will keep working on that. Brian Beal in the chat. I think you're right. I think that this should be this should be regulated uh, completely, probably. Um, you know, I think we should mandate where the bid placement is, just like in uh, track and field, right? No, but I think uh, I think Hopefully we'll uh, just continue doing a better job of, uh, you know, identifying as many runners as we can as the race goes on. with this race is runners are gonna you know change outfits or take on and off layers throughout the course of the uh, of the week so it uh, it continues to be a, a game of you know just trying to identify uh, trying to identify runners you think you've got it dialed in and you can't it looks like maybe I do have audio over at Ken 
Rubelli's aid station now, so as soon as we can get that camera turned horizontal, we will uh, we'll check in with Ken for just a minute while we wait on Jamil to uh, bring things back. So, Ken, how are you doing? Hey, so, uh, you know, I, I, I heard Jamil talk about this 100-mile station party coming up. I got to tell you, so we got this sign that says no magic post and no fairy dust to do it. Um, just you, just one determined foot in front of the other. However, we came up with a uh, magic potion. You put the dry ice in the towel bucket and you will have the coldest what? towels. Come here, you're live, come here. Would you like a cold towel? We're <laughs> live, say hi, say hi to mom. Hi to everybody. Take a cold towel, come around. Drink some water. So yeah, so we were getting ready to close up and we realized you take your dry ice you put it in the bucket, and they are the coldest towels in the whole desert. Doesn't matter what they have at mile 100. These are the coldest towels. But any event, to wrap it up out here, everyone was looking great. Um, we convinced everyone to take more water because we lied. We had more than a liter. So everyone really, really filled up. And um, yeah, it was a good time out here. So uh, um, if uh, to my fellow aid station people, if you have dry ice, Put it in your wet towel bucket. It's the coldest towels you'll find. I love it. Thank you so much for being out there, Ken. And one quick question. Did you did everyone get frozen grapes or did you run out? Oh. Dude, so in an ultra, you don't make negative comments. So you don't have to talk about my eight pounds of frozen grape because I was like the new popular dealer on the street corner. Once everyone's like, hey, the dude on the corner's got those grapes. Um, no, we trickled out of them, but we had turbo rockets for everybody. Did you want a turbo rocket before you leave? You probably, yes, yeah, you do. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. so no, the frozen grapes were hit. So if you're doing an aid station later in the race, get frozen grapes, dry ice for the towels. So um, yeah, any event. Well, we had a blast. So we're gonna sign out here. We're gonna go clean up our little station. And uh, any questions for the, for the uh, gods at mile 11 here? No, I think that everyone just loves you. I think next year you're going to have to make an entire week out of it, Ken, and just move further and further yeah, down funny, course. Why don't you say that? Because uh, I told Jamil, you know, my fee for service was one run steep, get high, men's large sweatshirt, and I get first right of refusal on this aid station. So, yeah, we're going to come out earlier next year and have even more fun with it. So thanks I for having it. us, and good luck to all the runners. And uh Great job, Matt, you in the studio, Jamil, Enzo, all the guys. Good good job out there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ken. Have a good yeah. one. All right. Cheers, buddy. See you later. And there you had the legend himself, the people's new favorite uh, grapefruit aid station captain, uh, Ken Rebelli, owner of Beyond Limits Racing. Uh, he was the race director for Jackpot Ultras. Um, before Era Vipa purchased that event from him, good friend uh, of the of the Era Vipa family here, and uh, yeah, just an absolute legend. If you haven't done one of his races before, you certainly uh, certainly should. So we are going to continue working on getting some of these feeds up here. It looks like Jamil is on the move here. So we will see what we can get. Yeah, so we've got Jamil's cam on the move here. And again, we might not have audio, but you'll be graced uh, with my voice here. Um, as Jamil kind of gives you these shots. I'm not sure where at on course he is, whether he's going away from where he was at at mile 17 or whether he went back down and is coming back up now. But you can just look at how gnarly uh, this stretch of trail is in sections. Just a lot of loose rock.
Chad, has West Plate run by yet? Yes. He has been, and that's bid 88 here. That's Ed Shelton that you see on your screen. Watching Ed Shelton and Steve. What mile is the cam at? This is going to be looks like just prior to where Jamil was at a little bit ago. So he went down. So this is just before mile 17. So once runners get up onto the ridge there, that is um, right around mile 17. So again, this is coming back up to the ridge where Jamil was at a little bit ago, right around mile 17. So once runners get through that mile 11 uh, station where Ken was at, who we just uh, heard from, they will kind of start to meander their way up this climb um, before kind of topping out around 4,000 feet of elevation uh, at about mile 17. we have a minute let's go ahead and take a we will keep it on the footage here but let's go ahead and read an ad from one of our beloved sponsors Katula the Flagstaff based company where all the runners are uh, are gonna be finishing so travel farther faster with the Katula instigators Built for trail running, the instigator is light, breathable, while protecting your feet from the elements like dust, dirt, and debris. With a thousand mile warranty, the Duralink instep strap can stand up to anything you encounter on the trail. And for a quick getaway, the gator can be kept on your shoes as an entire unit between your adventures. To keep your feet in tip top shape, order a pair of instigators at Catula.com. So huge shout out to our good friends over at Catula. Uh, they've been big supporters of all the things we're doing here at Aravipa, and we can't thank them enough for sponsoring these uh, live streams. See if we can get a bib here.
so we've lost Jamil there for a minute. We will work on bringing that back. As soon as we get the feeds, it looks like maybe we have Jamil back. No, nope, Jamil is going to be in and out for a little bit until he gets back up to that ridge. So while we have a minute, let's go ahead and take a look at the end destination for this journey as we have a little word, a little commercial from one of our sponsors at Destination Flagstaff. My name is Eric Sensman. I'm an ultra runner based in Flagstaff, Arizona, and this is where I do the bulk of my training. Buffalo Park is iconic in Flagstaff for really people of all walks of life, not just runners. It's just a central place that allows you to access all these different trails and areas north of town. Buffalo Park's a, an iconic meeting point for, for runners and walkers and, and visitors alike. Because the trails are so accessible and so prevalent in Flagstaff, it makes it really easy to go for a run, be in the woods, get out of town, but be able to very quickly come back and finish in town and meet up with your friends, go to a brewery, get a beer. It just feels like the town has evolved to adapting to and welcoming in runners and outdoors people as it's grown. I hope I can I can stay in Flagstaff forever. And there you have it. That is the end destination for all of these runners and uh, they will be very excited as they get closer and closer to Flagstaff. The temperatures start to cool down for them. And we got the jam cam back again. On this climb, he's going to go in and out of service uh, a little bit. Looks like we've got Carrie Henderson there on the left in front of the gentleman in the blue pack. We've got bib 121 and 124. We will uh, see if we can pull up the tracker. Bib 121 is D. Wu. And bib 124 is Jason C Cannon. Er, that might not be 124. Four, that looked like maybe 127 that makes more sense that's Alex Lamb it looks like which makes sense he was right with Kerry Henderson the last time we saw him earlier in the race again we will we will work on Continuing to get this feed improved here. As you can t see, it's a pretty remote section of the course. Harry Henderson, Alex Lamb. And that is Jason Kanan. So you can see as soon as they start to get 
closer to this flat section and then onto this ridge. That coverage starts to greatly improve. Again, we don't currently have audio on Jamil's feed here, but we will work on getting that refreshed. I believe that might have been Desiree Clark who was with uh, with that group as well. Yeah, that was her. Jamila's confirming. Couldn't get a read on the bib, but I remember what she was wearing. We got some more runners coming here, and Jamila's back in the in the beautiful spot here, right on the ridge. Let's see, oh that was bib 88. So that was Ed Shelton. Not, that might have been bib 82, uh, just in front of him, Martin Colombo. I'm not a hundred percent sure there. There. I did not, I didn't get a bib there. be able to eventually we'll try to figure out if we can get that audio back up but for now we are going to be blessed with a nice view of runners as they come up along this ridge See if we can get that feed back up here. There we go.
we've got a lot of good questions coming through in the chat. Good conversation around the use of polls. Love to hear it. I think a race this long uh, and on this arduous of terrain, polls are, are the, the sensible choice. Um, whether you need them at the beginning or not, I think it kind of helps save the body just a little bit uh, for those later stages. Let's see who we have. Bib number eight, I believe that's L Spacic. That is. Shout out to L. And then we've got bib 132 is Brian Burton. I didn't get a read on the number in front of him, but that could have been Dave Stinchfield. I believe that was Dave. Yeah, that is Dave Stinchfield, bib 135. Where on the course is this? This is, I believe, uh, just a little bit past where Jamil was earlier. Um, so a little bit past the mile 17 mark. Brooks in the chat. Everyone, can we uh, can we give Bryce a round of applause for the excellent coverage he gave us uh, in the early stages of the race? Huge shout out to Bryce. Bryce, I believe that the lead runners will likely be in Crown King, hopefully in the early afternoon. Um, it's still a little hard to, to tell just because we haven't gotten a lot of good reads on where they're at. Um, but we are almost five hours in, and Versteeg and Killian Quarter closing in on 22 miles. Um, so another, yeah, that, that math sounds about right, probably around one-ish, give or take, uh, a little bit. And yeah, Liam, that would be, um, yeah, Arizona time. So we're on Pacific time. chap yeah we saw Sally come through the um, the 17 mile mark um, not that long ago uh, when Jimmy was still stationed there so she is ahead of this group of, of athletes by quite a little bit
Yeah. I, I love the, uh, the reference to the inaugural running of the Cocodona 250, where Mike Versteeg referenced hiking poles as European cheater sticks. Again, I think that, oh, I haven't heard any comments on mullets or mustaches yet. Well, there have been a number of comments on, uh, on mustaches. That's, uh, that's for certain. Bring it back to the studio while we await Jamil's feed to come back up here real quick. like that feed is back. Jamil is following one of our runners here. That looks like couldn't get a good look on the bib. But we will keep tuning in here trying to see what we are able to um, what we're able to get here as soon as any more feeds come up we will do our best to, to uh, bring those to y'all oh here we go chasing cutoffs in the chat Matt what took you to Australia uh, my wife is originally from Australia, so we uh, went over to visit her family for a couple of months. We were over there basically in between Black Canyon and Cogodona livestream. Uh, it was our first trip back to Australia since uh, Christmas in 2019, so it was nice to, uh, to be over there. Both of us were working from Australia, so it um, wasn't all fun and games, but it was a lot of fun so yeah that is uh what we were over there for and again we will keep working on getting you some more video feeds up and running here see what we're able to what we're able to bring to you all here in just a few moments we hope e train in the chat anyone joining in on the fun for the 125 or 36 mile races if you're racing any of those, let us know in the chat here. I agree, the 36 mile, Elden Crest 36. It's 
one that I would love to do one of these years as well, but who knows when that'll be. Really uh, incredible kind of tour of Flagstaff uh, as that race runs for, along the course, basically from Fort Tuthill through Walnut Canyon, um, over up and over Eldon, through Buffalo Park, and down to the finish. Aaron Berger running the 125. Skyler in the chat heard that I'm running the 36 mile to get ready for Big Pine. Yeah, maybe, maybe one of these days. I do need to make a return to, uh, to Big Pine. Maybe I can uh, pull Rob Ricardo out of retirement to uh, put a shellacking on him once again. Let's see. I should be able to. Hmm. Hold on one second. Okay. I am going to See if I can get this overlay here for you. There we go. So this leaderboard will update uh, throughout the course of, uh, of the day. So this early on, this might not be 100% accurate. It might depend on when people have pinged or um, crossed aid stations and don't mind the 0, 0.00 mile distance on the leaderboard. Um, and we have the ladies leaderboard here as well. And so we will show you those periodically as we, uh, as we move throughout the day. Let's see what's going on in the chat here. <laughs> Arthur Ludwig, no more grape station videos. No, I believe that aid station is uh, shut. I think that that was the final finish, or the final runner that we saw through there. So everyone should be out there. Speaking of Rob Ricardo, what is he up to? Rob is making music uh, and he works in copywriting. He uh, just released, actually this is a good, uh, good time to plug this, he just released uh, his new song, or, yeah, new song The Long Way Home on Spotify. And so that is the kind of title track uh, that he created for last year's uh, Cocodona film that featured Eric Sensman. So highly, highly recommend everyone going and checking that out on any of your streaming platforms. Again, Rob's still super active in the community. I'm gonna, I not only need to talk him out of running retirement, I need to talk him out of commentary retirement as well so that... Uh, you know, maybe we can get him back, uh, back on a microphone here one of these days. So again, we are going to work on getting video from the course. Thank you, Dave. You, uh, you asked that question as soon as I was answering it. We currently don't have any live video feeds 
right now. Um, I believe Jamil is out of, yeah, he's out of cell phone range. Um, and we'll be looking, the next time we will see runners will be um, at Lane Mountain, which is around the 50K mark. Um, runners still have uh, the race leaders anyway still have um, they're about eight miles away from uh, from the Lane Mountain Aid Station so you're looking at probably another hour and a half to two hours probably yeah an hour and a half to two hours um, before runners are at Lane Mountain Aid Station And we can kind of take a look here at the main map here. So this live tracker is available. You can, anyone can access this on cocodona.com. And you can kind of scroll through the map. And so in just a second here, I will start pulling everything in. along this live tracker and again most of the the um, tracker especially in the early parts um, will de be dependent upon kind of who has pinged more recently so you've got Killian Korth who has uh, his last ping was 10 minutes ago and he is at mile 23.3 See if I can get in there on Versteeg. Is that also at mile 23.3, but he pinged one minute ago. So you're seeing about a nine minute spread between the two. And uh, let's take a look at so if you go back a little bit further, it looks like the next runner is Sarah Ostazewski at 22.7. She pinged one minute ago. And so she's going to actually be, Mike Grunwagen might be ahead of her. He pinged six minutes ago at mile um, 22.5. So again, any of you can kind of take a look at this if you want to see where your runners are, but you can see we were, uh, the last look we had was back here, right in this little climb here, is the last time we saw these runners. They're just going to kind of keep meandering their way up the side here. She just saw Goldberg. And then at mile 26, they're going to have another runner drop. We should be able to cap, like, uh, see the leaders there uh, via our drone coverage. So. Uh, we will work on getting some feeds up to show you all. And for just a moment, we are going to uh, have a little word from our good friends over at Tonry, the sunscreen provider, sunscreen partner for the Cocodona 250. Couldn't think of anything more fitting right now. So let's go ahead and listen in.
go. What a great a little uh, little commercial there from Tonry. And we are back taking a look at our live tracker here. And we can look at our updated what it looks like. Yeah, based on when they pinged last. So here are your updated men's podium. Mike Verstee, Killian Korth, and Mike Grunwagen. And again, these are all dependent upon uh, the last time their tracker updated. And then on the women's side, we have Sarah Ostazewski, followed by Mika Thews, and Megan McCarty are your women's podium. chat you all are you all are crazy Aaron Shim that ad was strange you know you got to protect your skin I think is the uh, is the moral of the story especially out there in the desert So if there are any questions in the chat that you all have, or uh, if there's anyone you want me to check in on, drop their bib number in the chat. While we don't have any, uh, any camera feeds, I'll pull up uh, some of the runners on the live tracker to try and give you all an update as best I can. Justin Davis looks like is at mile 17.4. So that's going to be Number fifty six, that's fifty eight, is right in here, mile seventeen point seven. So, still, he is past where we saw Jamil there a little bit ago. We got bib one ninety three. That is Joseph Heist. He's got no crew or pacers, it sounds like. And he, uh, he is at about mile 14. 
bib number 20 here. Garrett Nelson. He's at mile 21.9. So that's got to be putting him fairly high up there. Yeah, there's Garrett Nelson. He's in probably the top 10 to 15 runners. Emma O'Rourke wants a, uh, a Garmeyer update. He is at mile 21.5, so just a little bit behind um, uh, Garrett Nelson. Is West Plate running? Yes, West is running again this year. Bib 118. Daniel Gilliam from California, mile 17.1, so he's right around the. Um, the, uh, he's right around the kind of ridge that we saw Jamil at uh, a little bit ago. And looks like Glaze is approaching mile 20 there. So he's still still moving forward. Again, we are working on trying to get some camera feeds up for you, specifically um, at the specifically at the Crown King Aid Station, as well as a drone pilot up near Lane Mountain. awaiting some of our camera folks to get set up along the course there. It looks like we should have, we might not have visuals on the runners for a little bit still, um, but we will in fact get some visuals from our eyes in the sky in just a matter of moments. We should be seeing, it looks like, Killian Korth and uh, Mike Versteeg getting close to that, um, to that new water, water drop at about mile 25, 26. Uh, here in about a mile or so. So we should, I believe, be able to pick them up via drone from there. So uh, we should be just a few moments away from uh, from our uh, next eyes on on uh, runners. 
so we will keep it locked on our leaderboard here for the time being and while we have a minute let's go ahead and have a word from one of our sponsors gnarly nutrition gnarly has provided gnarly fuel 2o at aid stations throughout the course gnarly fuel 2o is an all-in-one vegan friendly solution for long days on the trails fuel 2o is packed with electrolytes and calories to replace what is lost during a long endurance effort it has the added bonus of HMB, which is a metabolite which helps prevent muscle degradation so you can kickstart your, your recovery during your performance and workout. Fuel 2O is ideal for trail runs and alpine adventures, especially for big pushes like the Coca Dona 250. Go over to gnarly.com and get your Fuel 2O today. That is gnarly, gonarly.com. I apologize. Over at gonarly.com, get your uh, get your fuel for all your big adventures. And again, a huge thank you to Gnarly Nutrition for uh, their partnership in helping make this live coverage and this event happen. We uh, we greatly appreciate it. Let's go ahead and see what's going on. Chris H. Sarah O was running eight minute miles at the end. Third over, she was the third female finisher of last year. Um, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, she was running that fast towards the end. The last mm, half mile or so is a net downhill, but once you get to the top of Eldon, uh, if you're kind of in decent spirits, um, there's a lot of runnable stuff still. And we got a request for the race flow. This is great comparison. Again, this is all based on the satellite ping, so um, it may be a little off right now, and I think that you're going to see this being a lot more useful as the race continues to progress, but right now you can kind of see all the different lines and the various trajectories that they are on. Again, I think as the race gets longer, uh, you're going to see some of those... Uh, some of those lines um, kind of really start to, to slow a little bit and uh, really take shape. in the chat. Sarah O in second place overall according to the map. Yeah, the map is you also have to factor in um, when people pinged last. So like now Mike Groenwagen is ahead of her but you also have Killian Korth um, whose last update I think was a little bit ago. I think it's been a while since his tracker has updated. And so you always have to uh, kind of keep that in mind. to the camera feed at mile 17 
that camera feed is moving currently and is out of self-service. Trying to get our drone in the air out towards the water station. So again, we are taking a look at our map here. It looks like Tilly and Korth should be, we should have eyes on him soon here. Send it to our drone in just a second here. As I believe we are going to have eyes on Killian here in just a moment. And let's go ahead. And there we have, we should be coming up on him and it looks like yeah there we go we got uh, our eyes in the sky here courtesy of Troy Wicks So again, we are out on course around the 25, 26 mile mark. You can see, like Jamil was saying earlier, as you get further along on the course, you're going to see more running water uh, in these streams. So hopefully um, runners built or brought uh, some sort of filtration system in order to Take care of that. And we will work on
Did the broadcaster just smoke something? LOL. No. <laughs> no, I am trying to get our camera feeds cleaned up here in addition to commentating, but I appreciate you turning in, tuning in nonetheless, Matthew. Looks like we have someone down there. That appears to be one of our race leaders that could be we'll try to get an update on who that is I know that we did have eyes on Mike Versteeg, so that could be Versteeg right here. Yeah, I think that that is Mike Versteeg. going to be springing out a second drone here, I believe. So we will see if we can get that drone back out there in just a matter of moments. Yeah, it looks like we are sending that second drone out now. So we should be getting our eyes back on the race the leaders here. So we'll have to see if we can find Killian Korth a little bit further along course. His tracker is still showing him as the uh, current race leader, so we'll have to see if maybe we, maybe we missed him. As we get that drone back out there. See if we can update our course map here. For the time being, let's pull up the iPad while we try and get that stream back up. So it 
looks like Killian Quirk may be past the water drop. And should be getting eyes on him soon. Just saw Mike Versteeg over here just a few minutes ago, right near that water uh, that water drop. Looking like Killian Cork is a little bit ahead still. to our drone and see if we can get the uh, we got to get that feed cleaned up a little bit still so we'll work on seeing if we can get that drone feed back up and then it looks like Sarah Ostazuski And Mike Grunwagen should be pretty close to one another, um, just depending on when uh, when their satellites ping the last. Mike McKnight running uh, fairly conservatively uh, early on here. I know that this is probably one of the more difficult sections for um, Mike McKnight, and then just behind Mike McKnight is Kevin Goldberg, the people's the people's favorite here uh, in the live chat traditionally. So. Um, like we've got our drone about to head back out. And again, this drone Shot is coming from this angle here, I believe, um, because I believe they're flying from Aiden Lane Mountain. Once runners hit Lane Mountain here, they're going to have a fairly nice uh, little trip down to um, down to the Crown King Aid Station. So this first 30 to 33 miles is you know, really the tougher section of the course here before things start to get, um, before things start to get a little bit easier for runners. Send it back to our drone here.
So our drone is out near the um, water drop. Looks like we're gonna try to come back and fly out a different direction. Our drone is getting hung up in the wind a little bit, making it uh, a little bit harder to kind of control and get the, the shots that we're trying to. So for those asking, Yeah, so it looks like Killian Korth at the water station was up about six minutes on Michael Versteeg. So again, we're going to try to let's see if we can fly out a different direction, possibly from Lane Mountain. Let's start to look for our first runners. Looks like we've got eyes on our first runner here, which would be Killian Korth. That is not a runner. That looks like an Aravipa staff, possibly. I think that there's around 200 runners in the 250 mile. Oh yeah, it looks like Ryan just popped it in the chat, 196. Yeah, Liam in the chat, aid station fireball. The entire Sedona to flag section is different than 2021. Yeah, there's also some small tweaks on the section between Crown King and Whiskey Row as well uh, that is different from obviously both races. 
uh, but definitely different from 2021. So uh, they get off the Senator Highway in a slightly different location. Um, it it's pretty minimal. I would say the bigger changes are um, the Sedona to Flagstaff section and the way uh, that runners leave Mingus Mountain and enter Jerome. As well, and we've got some audio. Jamil, what mile hey, mark are you are you at right now? What mile you got? Twenty one even. Twenty one. Twenty one. We're nice. here with Jason Brooks, number seven three. How's it going? It's going really well so far. You guys ordered up really nice weather. <laughs> it's a big climb, but it's keeping it you know real out here. Lots of good people, so. Yeah, awesome so far. Right. Awesome. Keep it up. Yeah, right on. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, we'll see you out on the trail. Thank you so much. I just caught a little pocket of service here, Matt. It's been uh, no cell phone out here. So we're probably about four mile, three to four miles from the water drop here. Love it. Love it. The people have been uh, missing your missing your footage. <laughs> we'll try and get it when we can, but I'm trying to make my way up to Crown King eventually myself. Nice. Way to go. That was 174, Sean Barnes. Sean Barnes. Love it. Nice work. We got number 44 here. All right, number 101, Aaron Wagner. And Pike and Aaron Wagner come through. All right, Matt, I'm going to keep it rolling. I might I might get you for a little bit. Sounds long good. Now? Sounds good, Jamil. Have a good one. Thanks for checking in. And here we are back to the drone. This is, I believe, just over... Um, just over Lane Mountain. what caused the course changes for 2023. So the course that's being run this year was actually what we had intended to run last year. Um, we wanted to uh, exit Sedona a little bit of a different way. We thought that that would maybe give runners a little bit better experience as they come through Sedona and up into Flagstaff. Um, so that was what this course is what we had wanted to run last year but had to make some last minute changes to the first 50 miles or so of the course uh due to wildfires um that caused us to yeah kind of change last year's course but this is this is the um this is the uh course that we'd intended for last year and kind of the course that we feel it's kind of best.
And I'm imagining that, you know, over time the course may continue to be tweaked and evolve just, uh, you know, as we continue to get more feedback from, from runners, but... Maybe have some footage from Jamil, but I think he's going to be coming in and out quite a bit here. So we'll keep our eye on uh, his feed. Go back to our drone shot here. Jamil, this is back round mile 2021. 20, and we're going to send it over to Stephen Crawford here, who is out at Crown King. He's going to give us a little walk around of uh, Crown King Aid Station, which we should be seeing our lead runners there in a couple of hours. Um, you can see. One of the fun facts about, uh, about Crown King here is um, the Crown King Saloon, which you can see right there, is the oldest continuously operating um, saloon in the state of Arizona. So um, it was originally, uh, like I believe, a few blocks away, and the saloon was actually moved at one point uh, to this location. But the saloon has been operating... Uh, for a really long time. Uh, so that's just one of the kind of fun facts about Crown King, just a really uh, interesting and unique mountain town uh, here in kind of central Arizona. See aid stations starting to get starting to get set up. Got plenty of tables for runners to get what they need, sit down with their crews. This will be the first opportunity um, that crews have to see their runners since the start line. And it's a little bit empty currently. We are trying to keep crews down. Um, either near Bumblebee Ranch or near the start line um, until their runners are nearing um, Crown King just so that we can uh, put a little less stress on the on the town and the roads leading up to Crown King. It's a I don't want to say it's a it's not a super remote place but it's not the easiest place to get to either so and let's see if we have anything on our drone back around Lane Mountain here. And thank you, Stephen, for giving us a little showcase of Crown King, which again, we should see runners coming in there in the next couple of hours. And here's our drone shot as we are still awaiting our lead runners as they close in on Lane Mountain. And it looks like Mike Gronawagen, Sarah Ostaszewski, and Adam Williams have all come through the mile 26 water drop. 
So it was in fact Mike Grunwagen in third place overall in 542. Adam and Sarah came through in 546 and 547 respectively. And that is about seven-ish miles from um, from the Lane Mountain Aid Station. And so we saw our race leader went through there, Killian Korth, about a half hour ago. Um, so we should be seeing him coming up to Lane Mountain, um, not the too distant in not the too distant future. going to see our leader at Lane Mountain. I would imagine um, within the next 30 to 60 minutes somewhere. I guess it's probably closer to uh, the 60 minute mark, but we will see. see some of the beautiful landscape here. This drone shot is from Lane Mountain, which you can see there. It's runners traverse up into the Bradshaw Mountains from Black Canyon City. Josh Fruin in the chat, and no spammer so far. You probably just jinxed us, Josh. Uh, probably going to end up with all sorts of bots in the chat now, but uh, hopefully not. It's been a good, uh, good morning so far. David Lindley asking, does anyone know who is leading for the men and women? So the men's leaderboard has not updated properly. The women's leaderboard here, the top three uh, are accurate. got Sarah Ostazewski, Mika Thews, or Micah Thews, and um, uh, Megan McCarty are your top three. And let's, yeah, the men's leaderboard hasn't updated, unfortunately. The, the men's leaders should be um, Killian Korth, Michael Versteeg, and then Mike Grunwagen.
overlooking Lane Mountain. Jim Moses, I paced for Stieg on three sections in 2021. It was so much fun. I can imagine that pacing uh, for Stieg at any point during that 2021 race was probably pretty awesome. Mason Boswell, the degrees up in the top left is from the start line. Tom Abbott in the chat ran a 25K today, or he ran 25Ks today, it sounds like. Shout out to Tom. We're just trying to... go ahead and send it back. Looks like Stephen Crawford is still moving around over at Crown King here, out on some of the Jeep roads that you take into town. And runners will kind of come in uh, along this road before they hit the aid station, which is right at the saloon. So again, for anyone tuning in here, we are looking at the Crown King aid station up, uh, up ahead there at the big saloon. Stephen Crawford is giving us the, uh, the sights over there. We got Rory Moynihan, Moynihan, Trail Gangsters himself in the chat. This is also, yeah, Rory makes a good point. This is the finish line of the Crown King Scramble 50K, which happens in March. Um, and yeah, is a 50K that starts down at Lake Pleasant, um, down in the Sonoran Desert, and makes its way up to the Pines of Crown King. Kind of a classic,
uh, a classic kind of old school mountain race. Shout out to KJP in the chat. Down in Phoenix, going to be going out to volunteer at aid stations for four days. Shout out to you. And it, that's, it brings up a good point. Like this race, uh, let alone this live stream, wouldn't be possible without, you know, all the amazing volunteers who help, help uh, put this on. So. Yeah, Jan Rice in the chat morning after crown king scramble is epic because chris warden everyone's uh favorite commentator here cooks breakfast for everyone shout out to chris who uh i know moments ago was tuned in while quote working his day job i don't know uh i don't know if i believe that there's much work going on but i'll just have to take chris uh at his word Well, and that's right. Rory is going to be on the live stream tonight for Aravipa After Dark. It sounds like uh, it sounds like it's going to be a good time. to follow someone by bib number. Brenda, if you go to the uh, live tracker on the Kogadona website, you should be able to search by runners via bib number and then add them to uh, your favorites. So that would be that would be what I would suggest. We're going to send it back to the drone here. Pilot, Mr. Troy Wicks, is back out on the lookout for our lead runners as they make their closing in. So it looks like Killian Court is at mile 28.4, so he's still about four and a half miles away from Lane Mountain. And he is going to have a pretty gnarly climb up Lane Mountain. Um, and then a little bit behind him is Mike Versteeg. Oh my gosh, Finn, uh, Finn is back at it. I'm excited for uh, about 49 minutes from now when uh, Finn and Brett of the Single Track Podcast, Brett also of Trails and Tarmac, uh, come on to uh, come on to bring you all commentary. Finn will be, you know, asking people the hard hitting questions like. If Killian Jornet runs this race, does he break 48 hours? 
So I look forward to uh, to all the wonderful the wonderful deep uh, deep dives into random topics that those two will uh, bring to the table. Boswell in the chat. It's turned into the the Killian discussion over here. I think that those those uh, white tights are burnt into everyone's eyes uh, from that Western States run of Killians. Yeah, you see, now Finn tries to be nice after I call him out on the live stream. You see, this is what he does. You know, I I uh, bust his chops a little bit and then. He, Thinks he has to. He thinks he has to come and give me a hug. Uh, but no, it's. All, <laughs> I appreciate the kind words, Finn, and I'm glad that you can, uh, you know, take the jokes that I'm laying out to you. And we should. <laughs> uh, like I said, we still are probably a little bit away from the uh, lead runners coming to this Lane Mountain Aid station. My guess is probably within the next 30 to 45-ish minutes, probably closer to 45 minutes. a look here at Crown King. And again, in just a couple of hours here as uh, runners start flowing in, you're going to see this, this aid station start to get quite a bit busier. Uh, again, right now runners are still a little ways away. But uh, they will be the leaders. I would expect the leaders to be there in probably an hour and a half to two hours. There was a question in the chat here. What mile is the next water setup? So it depends uh, what you're talking about. So when they left, the Mile 11 Grape Station, uh, courtesy of Ken Rebelli, they didn't have any water until the water drop at about mile 25, 26. Um, from there, their next aid station will be mile 33, which is Lane Mountain. Um, and then from Lane Mountain, they've got a fairly short, uh, mostly downhill section to um, to Crown King at mile 37, which is what we are currently looking at. How many volunteers does it take to put on Cogadona? That's a great question. Uh, a lot would be... Uh, would be the easy answer. Um, I would have to look, but it's hundreds, hundreds of volunteers to um, to put on an event like this, and, and then that's in addition to uh, Aravipa staff, where um, it's basically every every hands on deck.
we're going to send it back to our drone here. Looks like our drone is trying to go back on course to see if they can locate the leaders. Again, the leaders are still going to be a couple miles out from Lane Mountain Aid Station. Go ahead, take a look back in the aid station here. So it looks like they are starting to fire up the food. Looks like we got some pasta there. There you see Miss Patty Curry. I believe uh, Patty rocking the same shirt I'm currently wearing. So shout out to uh, shout out to Patty. spring energy aid station making some spring smoothies here shout out to uh, spring energy for being one of our incredible live stream or uh, race sponsors here I don't know, this, uh, this spring energy smoothie is uh, looking pretty delicious. Forth is about four miles away. Oh, it actually, uh, based on his current pace, uh, he's probably going to be about an hour um, before he's at Lane Mountain. Remember, Steve is about 4.7 miles away. So we should expect our race leaders to hit Lane Mountain, yeah, right around probably 12.15 to 12.30. Uh, Arizona time, which is we're currently in the Pacific time zone.
so while we're here on the uh, on the spring smoothie, let's go ahead and have a little a little uh, a little word from our good partners over at Spring Energy. Real food, real good. Spring is providing cold fruit smoothies at the Spring Energy Crown King Aid Station. Real food is a powerful source of energy. At Spring Energy, we took what is offered by nature and carefully crafted a line of healthy nutrition products for endurance athletes. With proper nutrition training and racing should be f with proper nutrition training and racing should be full of joy without the worry of GI problems, harmful sugar highs and dips, or other negative effects from low quality ingredients and chemicals. Spring Energy is driven by science, equipped with the vast athletic experience and inspired by passion for a healthy lifestyle. We designed a unique formula for a 100% natural product. We embrace the culture of active and healthy living, providing nutritious endurance fuel for athletes who choose this path. So head on over to Spring's website, springenergy.com. Oh. And, uh, oh, I apologize, myspringenergy.com and uh, get your nutrition today. So a huge shout out to our partners over at Spring. We, uh, we appreciate them and we're stoked to have them out at Crown King making smoothies for all the runners. Uh, marathon trail running with Simon is Jam Jam racing Sedona Canyons Wednesday. He is not. He uh, he's going to be helping uh, bring the live video coverage to you all uh, all week. tuned in here to the Spring Energy Crown King Aid Station. We're going to actually take a look at our drone shot again, giving us a good aerial view of uh, Bradshaw Mountains here. Again, runners will climb up into these mountains to Lane Mountain before they make their way down into Crown King, which is where we just saw uh, the Spring Energy aid station. What was that? currently 69 degrees Fahrenheit up in Crown King so slowly starting to warm up but definitely not nearly as hot as uh, as it was this morning for runners but they are gonna be uh, you know pretty much fully exposed to the heat so um, it is gonna feel quite a bit warmer than the actual temperature would indicate
You know, because I'm a man of the people, if we get, you know, ten... If we get ten people requesting the flow to add, we'll play it again. You know? So, if you want to see the flow to add featuring Michael Versteeg, let me know in the chat. And, uh... And we will... We will, uh, make it happen. I guess the people want Florida. So here we go. The great people that satisfy, satisfy running, proud partner of the Coca Dona 250 present you with Florida. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The Flota commercial from Satisfy Running. Just Versteeg's face as he showcases the can will never get old to me. Jim Moses, is that an actual drink? Yes. Jamil broke this news earlier on the live stream. This drink will be featured at the Satisfy Running Fane Ranch Aid Station, uh, which is roughly mile 100. Runners on the course will be kind of the first people to, uh, to have Flota, and uh, Jamil is hopefully going to bring some to me in the studio at some point, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. And again, a huge shout out to the team over at Satisfy Running. They're just doing a lot of really cool stuff. They uh, put that commercial together not too long ago. Um, I think within the last couple weeks. And uh, yeah, just some of the content they've put out in the past has always been great. So a huge shout out to them. <laughs> now people are asking for the sunscreen ad. Classic. Every year a theme comes together at Cocodona. And I think that, yeah, I agree with you, Mike. I think Flota is uh, certainly going to uh, to steal the show this year. When people ask for ads, you know something has been done well, yeah. Well, I think it, you know, I think people really just love uh, Michael Versteeg and his sandals. You know, there's just something about it. like maybe we got a yeah we got a little footage from on the trail with jam cam and of course 
They lose it straight away. Jamil is still out on course, making his way back to uh, to Crown King. He started at mile 11, so he's going to get in a good uh, 26 miles today. Um, not too shabby. So as his feed comes in and out, we'll try to check in on his feed as he's uh, with more of the middle to back of the pack runners as he makes it be, as he makes his way kind of up the course towards where we're currently looking, which is uh, the view down from Lane Mountain. What mile is the drone at? The drone is flying uh, from just before the Lane Mountain Aid Station, I believe. Yeah, so the drone is flying from, yeah, kind of the area between the mile 26 water drop and Lane Mountain. Looks like... Got our eyes on, looks like a hiker. So shout out to... Uh, Oh, that is uh, one of the f um, photographers. Not sure if that's Scott or Howie. to send it to our static shot over in Crown King in just a minute. aid station. This is also the first aid station where runners can have drop bags so they'll be able to see their crew mm -hmm. and access any of their uh, drop bag necessities at this aid station here.
chasing cutoffs in the chat. I love that Chris Warden is tuned in from work. We use the term work a little lightly, uh, and you got to do the little finger parentheses uh, with Chris. He's always he's always tuned into the live stream. So shout out to Chris. He's either commentating or he's uh, he's in the chat. Here he is. He's back on a microphone. I'm trying. I really am trying. I'm to. <laughs> working. I'm working. working. I'm, I've actually been fairly productive. You're on your lunch break, right? Yeah, that works. Yeah. Yeah, that's going See? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, the, the coverage has been fantastic. I mean, I'm listening online, but I'm also just around the corner in the house. Yeah. So, uh, this is a, it's actually a pretty cool setup, folks. So, there's plenty of workspace for all of us. I mean, you've got Finn and Brett uh, at different areas in the house, and I'm over in my corner doing my bean counting. And, but uh, but the energy is here, and uh, we've been talking about uh, all the things that have been going on on the broadcast day. Uh, just uh, talked with Finn about the uh, first Deke commercial, oh. and uh, that's got to be. I would I would say, and this is a this is a hot take for for Finn to continue on with here in about twenty minutes or so. That might be the most legendary commercial in our sport. Well, the thing about it is that uh, the thing I said to Finn was that if this if somebody walk if you put that video on in front of somebody and they didn't know who Versteeg was and they didn't even know what was going on, his facial expressions. And his gruff exterior, like when he cracks a smile, would make you laugh. Yep. I think that that's what I gathered from that commercial. I mean, you don't necessarily have to be tuning into Coca Dona for, you know, 90 hours this week or uh, know who he is even to really get a kick out of it. And plus, it's just so over the top, too. Absolutely. I also am, you know, the biggest fan of the Crown King Saloon. I have spent uh, many. Uh, well, let's see, one, two, three, four. I've spent six nights at the Crown King Saloon over the years uh, as I have finished the Crown King Scramble six times. Um, and uh, there's something magical about that uh, that place. And uh, if you've never had the opportunity to get up to Crown King and uh, check out the saloon, it is truly a one-of-a-kind place. So I just wanted to <laughs> let you know that I was... Uh, tuning in obviously if I'm poking my head into the chat I definitely know what's going on but how can you not uh, I mean is that Stephen Crawford showing us around town oh my goodness the Crown King itself is 25 miles from pavement for those that aren't familiar uh, Matt gave you the history lesson uh, uh, to a degree but also uh, there's basically about a half dozen businesses in town Across that bridge that you can see that uh, uh, Stephen was pointing towards are the Bear Creek cabins, which is where we always stay every time we go up there. And that's where the Crown King Scrambled Eggs breakfast takes place every year. And yeah, this this is literally the finish line for the Crown King Scramble right here. You take a hard left into the yard and you're right there. And we got a, a comment in the chat from Jim Moses. I've known Versteeg for over five years, worked with him, ran with him, <laughs> and I've never seen him smile. I, that's I what makes that, it so special. I said that earlier, too. I was like, that's the highlight is uh, we got Versteeg to smile. I don't yeah. know if that's a – I don't know that that's a common a common occurrence. Yeah, if, if, you, if you've got a, a yen to do so, check out the um, – the Crown King Saloon, uh, and do some Googling about it and find out about its history and about the town in general. You know, a permanent population of like 150, and we make our way there uh, every spring as part of our Crown King Scramble event. And just being in town is a pretty magical thing. And, and to see spring setting up to take care of runners is a good feeling. There it is, right there in all its glory. There's always Whenever we come up uh, for the race, there's always somebody playing on the stage right there. Um, you know, some of those historic photos are so much fun to witness. Um, and 
it's a it's a pretty uh, fun time because half the people in the saloon on that Saturday night are runners and the other half are locals and it's just this nice little mix of people um, and uh, the, excellent burgers by the way yep excellent burgers at the Crown King Saloon so uh, I, uh, I highly recommend it but uh, I'm gonna go and uh, actually lunch my lunch break, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to step on in and uh, love it and share that I was definitely paying attention to what's going on. Of course, I saw Rory Monahan uh, on there as well, and he and I will be on later. Confirming on. that he will be he will be on the show for uh, what is bound to be a wild uh, era by the after dark. Yeah, he's probably got to go and get his uh, his run in today, which involves some ridiculously fast. Uh, fast time as he is uh, working towards the, the um, Olympic marathon the trials. admirable Olympic marathon qualifiers so uh, or the trial qualifier so uh, I I uh, will catch everybody a little bit later excellent work Chris <laughs> Arizona halter running historian Chris Warden. That is the truth. Chris, Chris has been uh, has been around uh, at a lot of Arabiba events. So for those of you just tuning in, we are here at the Crown King Saloon. We're going to see if Troy, ha yeah, Troy has his feet up, giving you a little bit of a view over the Bradshaw Mountains here. The wind up above these ridge lines is really uh, making it tough on our drones to go too far out right now. Um, but hopefully we will be seeing the race leaders here in the not too distant future. Yeah, it looks like Killian Korth is at about mile 30, so he's just under three miles out from uh, the aid station. So he's about to um, kind of He's about to top out kind of like the the main part of the climb before he hits more of like a little bit more gentle uh, climb and then gets onto the ridge to the aid station. So we should be able to get eyes on him fairly soon. So again, we should be seeing Killian Korth fairly soon. Again, up this climb up to Lane Mountain, it's absolutely brutal. And uh, in 2021, in the inaugural year, we saw a lot of carnage uh, in this area. Hopefully we don't see as much, but runners are still going to be moving pretty slowly up to the climb there before they hit this little 
kind of winding, more gentle climb up to the up to the ridge. Shout out to uh, Finn in the chat who traveled here from Utah and apparently forgot to bring a, a phone charger. So, Finn, excellent work. I'm neither confirming nor, nor denying whether or not I brought a charger from my house five minutes away. track our first rounds again our drone's not going to be able to go too far out right now just because of how windy it is we are going to bring it back into the crown king aid station Bellman in the chat wearing her Cocodona sun hoodie. Shout out to you, Laura. We had AJW coming up uh, to volunteer at the aid station at Crown King. our aerial view over near Lane Mountain. Again, our drone pilot is flying a little bit um, down course from Lane Mountain, so a little bit closer to the start line than the Lane Mountain Aid Station. So he should be able to uh, locate the lead runners here soon. It looks like our lead runner is likely to be Killian Korth still. He's at 30.1 as of 12 minutes ago. Um, and Michael Versteeg was at mile 33 minutes ago. So Killian Korth should, should be in front and should be closing in around 31 mile, the 31 mile mark, the 50k mark, which would put him just about a mile or two outside the aid station.
again, this is one of the more arduous, more difficult sections of the uh, of the Kogodona 250 course. That first 35 miles or so uh, up to Lane Mountain here, it's hot. It's a lot of rugged terrain. And then runners still have to factor in that they're going to have to go another 215 miles after this. So Looks like Killian Korth is nearing the uh, top of the main climb. So we will continue to try to get eyes on him. Um, as he, uh, he is, it looks like he is just about to uh, turn left to, to go up the, uh, the short steep punchy climb up to kind of more of the uh, ridge up and over to the aid station. And we are just prior to the Lane Mountain Aid Station here. As we await our lead runner, who is expected to be Killian Korth. camera feed fixed here. Looks like our drone pilot is going to be coming back in to swap out batteries here. So let's go ahead and send it back to Crown King. And I think that this is probably a good 
chance here in just a minute or so to where we're going to swap out commentary and uh, you're no longer going to have to listen to me talk. You're going to be blessed with the beautiful voices of Finn Melanson and Brett Hornick of the Single Track Podcast. So we will uh, do a little commentary swap while we wait on our drone pilot to uh, switch batteries there. Got nothing on the uh, teleprompter. Yeah, I've got a. Should I say we crashed? No, you're good now. Oh, we're good. Yeah. We're back. We're back. It's as if we never left. <laughs> Why is my video not the same as your video? Because uh, I have it on pause. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I thought maybe for a sec Finn was living in the future. Sometimes. So, so the stream is up there. Okay. The Sweet. actual live viewing is in the teleprompter window. Okay. So like what the viewing audience is seeing is in the teleprompter. Low volume. Yeah, we're trying. I think we've got our mics cranked up the best we can. I'm gonna just try my best to project. That's not my uh, not my forte, but I'm sure I can talk at volume level 11 for me at uh, for six hours. I'm screwed. It's great to be with you all in. The Cocodona 250 live stream today. That was my colleague Brent Hornick. I am Ben Melanson. We're back for another great week of celebrating what we think is one of the coolest events in our entire sport. And uh, I think as we follow these runners throughout the rest of the day, it'll be fun to just go long form on some interesting Cocodona and uh, 200 mile plus related trail running topics as well. What do you think? Man, I have, I think that over the course of the week, I might have more questions than answers. <laughs> uh, just the more I learn by watching everyone come through. Uh, it seems like there's only so much you can really listen to and talk to regarding tactics for how you're going to manage this race. But so much of it seems to come down to just experiencing it and you know, living it. I feel like we're we're still early enough, like we're seven hours into this race. We're still kind of to the point where most of these people have gone on a training run about this length. Right. We're not quite getting into the true uh, make it or break it sort of. Uh, yeah, we're gonna work on this. We're gonna work on some audio. audio stuff. Give us one minute. Leaders, There's, we're getting a lot of audio complaints. Okay. Is Killian Korth the early pick for Random Baller? 
I mean, at the moment, that's definitely what I'm learning. I mean, I, I can't wait for the Trail Runner Mag article to come out that says Killian wins Coca Dona 250. <laughs> the greatest clickbait of all time. Who do we got on the uh, Who do we got on the drone coverage right now? Let's see if we can get here we go. Sight on a bib. It's Versteeg. Believe that's Versteeg. Nice plus one point for Brett's audio over Finn's. You gotta, <laughs> you're, you gotta swallow that microphone. <laughs> so is Michael Versteeg sighting on the drone. Can you talk, Finn? Yep, just testing my audio here. Test, test. Yeah. Testing my audio. Yeah, it should be good. All right, I think yeah. we're... We're getting the thumbs up from producer Matt that the volume is good. Yep. So I think we're just going to roll with it from here on out. We'll I just I'll heard, keep fixing it. Yeah, we'll keep fixing it over time. But I just heard Brett crack open a liquid death. I'm going to do the same. Nothing like calling a broadcast, calling a ultra trail running event and sipping liquid death along the way. I'm drinking harmless Palmer. I also have an harmless Palmer. I think every single day I'm going to showcase a new flavor. Um, I, I just opened it, so now I kind of have to commit to drinking it. But I feel like harmless Palmer should have maybe been saved for day three or day four. Skylar's saying producer Mike is the primary source right now. How does he know that? How does he know that from wherever he is? Because if you don't know Skylar, you just what you need to know is he is talented in every single facet of life. I mean, yeah, I I believe him. <laughs> Simple as I that. I felt so confident relaying that to Matt, just knowing Skylar, like he's totally right. Update. Uh Liquid Death Armless Palmer is not bubbly. Wait, Paul, you don't like drinking aluminum foil? I thought it was going to be carbonated. So, I guess at the same time, when was the last time you had a carbonated Armless Palmer? So that doesn't make any sense. But I really thought it was going to be carbonated, so I'm a little bit let down. Versteeg is covering ground very smooth. I'm pretty, pretty surprised at just the, how fluid he's moving through the trail right now. Versi is the Flota Duke. Correct. Great advertisement. Now, are we going to see that ad replay during our time on air? Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. We should just play it together. Six the hours of Flota on repeat. But yeah, we were we were talking earlier about how we may leave this broadcast after five days with even more questions than answers about the two hundred mile distance, the two hundred mile event. And one thing that stuck with me, we had Joe McConaughey on the podcast last year after Cocodona and he talked about how all of his knowledge in terms of how to execute this event, how to train for this event, even how to coach for this event, he chalks it all up to, quote, voodoo magic. Yeah, he said, uh, training for anything under 100 mile, mostly data, science-based, 100 to about 150 miles, like 50% data, 50% voodoo witchcraft. 200 miles plus, and then going into long trails, even even Joe McConaughey is convinced it's still largely voodoo witchcraft, and that there's no one's there's no uh, there's no correct answer yet that uh, works for everyone, which I think makes this event very exciting. Like there's so much learning that is still to be done for a true multi-day event like this. I feel like there's still so much science to uncover, even just regarding sleep. Um, that know, seems to be the big one. We listen, I listen to 
many, many hours of Joe Corsion's Everyday Ultra podcast. Likewise. And he did a fantastic job of previewing a lot of the, you know, main, you know, some of the favorites for this race. Notables. And one of the biggest questions that he asked them was, he was like, well, I've never done a, you know, multi-day race. How do you approach the sleep aspect? And I think every single answer was different. Every single one. You know, I think uh, Sally McRae had some interesting thoughts on that because Sally is not just doing COVID only here today. I believe she's also she's doing the triple, crown. the triple crown of ultras. And she estimated that over the course of 2023, she may be in the absolute depths of sleep deprivation for 16 to 18 days of the entire calendar year. And what does that do to her long-term health? Does it affect her long-term health? Are we, as a human species, able to just take it as it comes and, and recover in the same way we recover from the battering of our life in these events? And these are the things that I, I think as 200 milers become more commonplace in our sport, we're gonna have answers to and there's gonna be research around, but we're still in the wild, wild west days of figuring things out, and I think that's part of the allure of these events, and I think that's also why there's so many interesting characters in these races right now, the people that want to, or that are comfortable being early adopters of the distance, early adopters of the training, um, subjecting themselves to, to anything, and just being, being guinea pigs in a sense, in, in a positive sense of the term. Yeah, another interesting, um, I guess, bit about sleep was uh, Michael McKnight's thought where he, he took yes. very early naps because he was like, I was tired, so I just listened to my body and went for the sleep. You know, he's like, I know in other races I've gone, you know, double or triple the amount of time before my first nap, but I felt tired, so I took a nap. And that's really interesting that he's able to know himself that well where he's, you know, prioritizing sleep in the correct way. I also listened to Sarah Bostazewski's pod, and the main uh, consensus for her last two Cocodonas were maybe we slept a little bit too much, and you know maybe we slept at correct intervals, but it was too long each time. It was uh, yeah, it's so fascinating to figure out like you know even if you go a couple hours too long without that first nap. Yep, that has the potential to kind of spiral the entire rest of the race out of control. Like 15 minutes early on could save many hours later, and that might even not be the best answer. So we still don't know. So I'm, I'm really curious. You know, it's kind of like one of our favorite movies, Dodgeball, <laughs> when they're like, "We don't know who our best player is. We haven't played yet." <laughs> That's kind of where I feel like we're at with like sleep uh, strategy in regards to some of these races, and I love that we get to learn about it in real time. Brett, there's a couple of questions that I wanted to throw out to you and maybe to the chat as well. I'm not sure if you listened to this episode of the Everyday Ultra Pod, but Joe had Jeff Garmire on, and one of the things that Jeff said was, you know, these 250 mile events they represented some of his first ultras in the sport, and obviously he's this incredibly accomplished backpacker, long trail FKT guy. It, but he was kind of saying like, I'm not sure how I'm gonna do in these ultras. And, and what it made me wonder is, are people that come from the backpacking world and the long trail FKT world, are they actually better prepared for these 200 mile races than people that are coming up from the 50 mile, 100, 100 mile distance in your field? Like if you were a betting person and you put those two types of athletes on the same start line, do you think that it's actually maybe the 100 mile run? Right now, yes. Um, I think once some of these guidelines get figured out in regards to maybe some training, maybe some sleep deprivation, some fueling aspect, I believe it will turn eventually to slightly more runners races. Yeah. But that time is not now. Um, there's, there's this really fun overlap where if you can just be super steady the entire time, you can finish very high up at these races. And who knows, maybe that's the way it will be. Um, but I, I do love kind of the blending of kind of events in these sports right yes. now. 
Well, we heard Sally talk about it, like when she was doing her homework for this race, she's like, I actually looked towards the alpinists, the mountaineers, the multi-day people, the laundry like KT people to try to get answers around sleep and nutrition and pace. And I think it's very interesting. Like she wasn't necessarily looking to like, you know, the people at the top end of the 100 mile race yet. I, I think you make a good point about how it probably will transition over time. But very interesting that she was doing her homework on what we might regard as a, as a different sport. Yeah. I mean, especially for, as we get into multi-day races, it's very much less so. I mean, we even see it in 100 milers too. It's not simply the person who is the fittest wins the race. Yes. And as these races get that much longer and you, it's all on you to make good decisions out there. That is so much more than just fitness alone. Yep. You know, I'm sure whoever wins this race on the men's and women's side, good chance they're not the one with the highest VO2 max or, you know, something like that. It's the one who was most prepared and made the best decisions <coughs> over the course of uh, the entire race. Yep. We have heard people, coaches in sport, heard Jason P talk about this, that in 200 mile events, banking sleep in the days leading up to the event are so important. I know that in other ultra races like 50k to 100 mile, we typically will write off the the week of the race absolutely yeah but like if you like you know take a xanax and sleep for 18 hours the day before the race does that allow you to then go 48 hours before needing sleep during the race i'm not sure if it <laughs> quite works like that i'm sure we'll have someone out there try that strategy <laughs> i yeah i don't know i don't know if i recommend that Sorry, folks, for the audio issues. We're hoping to secure that soon. Is our audio live at the moment? No. Okay. It's just, uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, you're back live. Is that, a, is that AJW? That's AJW. There's an interesting uh, message here from Ryan Mado. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing the last name. And the chat says, both past winners of this race have held the Arizona FKT. Just saying. That's a, Again, to what Brett said, I think we're, we're still in that era where these long trail FKT folks, they, they will have the upper hand. Just the, the demands of the race, the, the gear, the equipment requirements of the race, the sleeping cadence, it all plays in their favor. So yeah, that, that, I think that makes sense, it plays out. Versteeg told me he slept just two to three hours the night before the 2021 Coca Down. Wow. Yeah, that, that doesn't seem like enough to me, but maybe, maybe it shocks the body, gets it ready yeah. for something hard. I'm going to do an update of the uh, live tracker. Oh, I zoomed all the way out. I think one of the greatest case studies in our sport of extended major sleep de deprivation is Scott Jurek in the last 600 miles of his Appalachian Trail in 2015 read his book North and hear him on podcasts. There was a 10 day stretch there, I think. Eight to 10 day stretch through Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, where he was sleeping two to three hours a night. And I'm pretty sure 
in those last four days, it was like on one hand, single digit hours combined. That is, yeah, and then, yeah, you just have to wonder, like, making that kind of a push for how much that would, you know, just lower the overall energy levels, is that, in fact, faster? Or do you actually just get your full night of sleep every night and then hammer in between? And that answer is probably going to be different depending on the, the, you know, the runner and the person. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, Dimitro in the chat says, do we know for sure that sleep deprivation is actually required for something like that question mark? And Yeah, I, I've always wondered that question as well. It's like it's a great question. Like maybe someone coming from the hundred mile, or you know, much faster type uh, expertise, are they gonna benefit from like you know running seventy or eighty miles, sleeping for five hours? How much does the body clock do that? Like that's also hard too. Yes. If anyone's done like back to back long runs off short rest, it's it's tough. Yeah, could somebody theoretically have a 58-hour finish on this course where eight of the hours elapsed with sleeping? I mean, maybe that would, a lock up it. That would a good take question. that would take a lot of running. Yeah, you get your body to a recovery cycle. I agree. So one thing that Brett and I always like to do uh, is just to let the chat know. Like if you have questions out there, comments, uh, you want to contribute to the discussion, we love having the back and forth. And you know, right now we're having this conversation about just all of the training methodologies and, and racing execution strategies around these 200 plus mile events and how we're still in the wild, wild west and how we're borrowing strategy and tactics, et cetera, from many different disciplines and sports and uh, just thought processes out there. So um, we'd love to hear from you in the chat if you have thoughts on this. Yeah, there is a there is a Coopcast episode 133 that has great insights into the sleep strategies. And yeah, one of the, one of the cool things about Coop, I know he has uh, a lot of firsthand primary experience running these 200 plus mile events. I believe Coop raced Cocodona last year and um, so even the coaches are out there themselves trying to, to gather data and, and, and get some theories going about what's going to work. Yeah, Jim Moses in the chat, there's no question that our competitive advantage as a species is our endurance, that and, and the cognitive, but um, part of me wonders, like, endurance, yes, but for how long? Like, is there a cap on it? Like, after 24 hours, are we, are we back to equal, or back to baseline? Christian, that's one of the greatest comments I've ever heard, or compliments I've ever heard, thank you so much. Conrad in the chat, I'm, I'm gonna get confirmation as to whether or not that is Lane Mountain but it's a great drone aerial right now for sure. I think one interesting question to throw out there is like, you think about where 100 mile training and racing methodology is at right now. Where are we, how, how many years behind are we? 
with all of that data and information and common sense when it comes to 200 mile racing, like what year in the canon of 100 mile development are we in? Is this like, it, it, it is, is 2023 for 200 mile races like 2004 for 100 mile races or is it even further back than that? Like, I think that's a good question that we can think about in the chat here. Like just how, how much catch up do we have in this area in terms of what we know and, and what can make these athletes even more efficient at it? Average sleeping time for a runner is such a great question. I, I need to think about that one, Adam. Liam, I, I, I heard that too. I think Jeff talked about that in his free trail episode with Dylan. And I don't, I'd be, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this. It, it seems to me that if you're gonna do back-to-back -back long runs on short sleep, in the same way that like not eating directly after the run is gonna hurt in terms of adaptations and recovery, I wonder if like all of their running adaptations you make are gonna be canceled out by the inability to sleep in between. But that's just my first thoughts. for the group here that I want to throw out. I think this is something we can talk about all day. I can't take credit for it. It's my colleague, Brett, who put it out there. But if you had to listen to one band's records for the entirety of your Cocodona race, what are you listening to and why? And I think I'm going to actually ask this to my colleague, Brett, and see what he thinks. Brett, if you had to listen to a single band for the entirety of Cocodona, what are you listening to and why? I would love to hear some answers out of the chat before I actually share what I think I would actually listen to. I think I'm pulling a Carl Meltzer and going with the Grateful Dead because they have such, they have so many live albums that I can go down the rabbit hole of. Yeah, I think having a, like a diverse discography is important. <coughs> at the same time, I could also listen just like video game music that Nintendo's made. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the majority of Kokodana, but not there. Like, yes. I, I, I could listen to like Zelda um, or like the intro music to Yoshi pretty easily. You know, we've got Jeff Browning in the chat, and I don't know what his schedule is the next few days, but it would, I think it'd be super fun to have him piped into the live stream and have a good conversation about what he's learned over the course of. Uh, his 200 mile journey. I know he had, a, he had a great Moab last year, and this is an area of the sport that he's investing into. I think he's actually doing the Sedona 125 later this week. Yeah, I so saw some updates on his Instagram. He was getting ready for that, which that's a Wednesday start, I believe. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably, probably going to get canceled for this, but you know who's high up on my list for? artists I would listen to for the entirety of the race. You're not going to say Taylor Swift, are you? I'm going to say Taylor Swift. Oh my gosh. She has such a diverse collection of albums. Could nice. Hit, could hit all the different levels of energy across the race. Cool. Yep. Looks like, uh, by the way, Jeff is coming into the studio Friday, which is awesome, Jeff. We're looking forward to it. We'll have all sorts of questions ready, and hopefully we can uh, dialogue going from, from today. I'm sure you've got some great insights to share. <coughs> Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, Zeppelin is great. No question. I'm a classic rock guy myself. Pink Floyd for sure. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree or defer to Brett on a lot of things. The one thing I, I can't find common ground from on is Taylor Swift, but that's, I'm, I'm, I recognize I'm in the minority there. But that's because you haven't yet to just sit down and listen to some albums critically. <laughs> that's important. Maybe we have some time this week. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll do a Taylor Swift listening session on day three of this. I'm all about a good uh, storyteller. 
There would actually be plenty of moments where I definitely wouldn't wouldn't be listening to music. Um, I love running outside through the trails, and all I can hear is just wind in my feet. Like I don't know. I don't really get bored of that. Brett, one thing I think we, we should talk about because I think it's a super fun topic. This, the audience for a 200 mile race is on par with the audience for live streams of other smaller ultra events in the 50 mile, 100 k, 100 mile distance. Like we have 1,500 people on the chat right now. That's significant. That's a lot of people. I mean, if there was 1,500 people in this room and I was talking to everyone all at once, I would be so nervous. And now that I'm thinking about it, I'm getting progressively more nervous, but <laughs> it's so it's so cool. Don't mess up. But yeah, I don't know. Let me know if I mess up. I think it's, it's really cool that we have a community like this that cares so much about a race this long and just where it goes, the people in it, Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, the people in it, just the storylines, and how everything unfolds. Like, and I think a lot of that credit goes to Air Life. Huh? Yes. Yeah, I think um, I've been watching a lot of these wilderness reality TV series on Netflix lately, like these ones where they just, you know, drop people off in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness in, in mid-fall. And, you know, they gotta build shelters, they gotta build fire, they gotta go hunt. Dang. All right, I'll continue that thought in a second, working on audio here. <coughs> Apologies. It's really interesting. Like so much of it sounds, I, yeah. It totally depends on what you're listening on. What 200 miler would I want to run first? Well, assuming y'all can hear me out there, I think. I thought it was going to be this race. So, here's the thing. Brett and I were driving up 17 to Flagstaff yesterday, and I was just randomly hungry at the right time, and turns out we popped off on the Black Canyon City exit, and I was like, holy crap, this is where the Coke Donut 250 starts, and we walked over the start line, and the first thing I felt was like, wow, A, it's hot, B, it's exposed, and the race is like this for the majority of your time out there. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure until you get closer to the Flagstaff area, it's like that for quite a while. I come from Northern European descent. I feel like I would wilt in those conditions. I need something like the Bigfoot 200 in Washington or uh, maybe the Tahoe 200. But this stuff, this stuff very much appeals to me. I will say, like, I, and I pull a breath this all the time, my absolute favorite uh, event in our sport is the Long Trail FKT. I, I, the Appalachian Trail has such a special place in my heart it helps that that is the quote unquote green tunnel where you're shielded from a lot of the sun. I would, I would do the Appalachian Trail again, I think before I went to one of these 200 mile events, but and I think we'll continue the, the thought in a second. There's a, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I think there's interesting fanfare around these events. I think there's a really interesting journey process to it that's more extended than what you get in like a 100K race where it captures the human imagination in interesting ways and yeah. Yeah, it definitely, uh, it's a vision quest for sure. Truly. I'm still, I, I mean, so much of my, like, you come from a through hiking background. Yeah. Like, you, you could probably wrap your head around a distance like this much better than I can, uh, just because you've done longer things than this. Yes. You know, maybe not necessarily like a race format, but you've been outside in the elements for much longer than 250 consecutive miles. I have not. <laughs> and 
and that terrifies me. And I think it's totally possible for this to happen. I mean, I can confirm it happens in 50 mile to 100 mile events, but when you go through these long multi-day experiences, it is, it is a psychedelic experience. You go through changes in consciousness, you have new views of life, and you're left extremely impacted and changed, and I think in almost exclusively positive ways. And I think that uh, these 200 mile races are sort of like the gateway to that type of experience. So maybe that's part of it. Perhaps, yeah. Well, uh, there was a couple people asking what, what aid station we're looking at right now. We're looking at the Lane Mountain aid station yeah. and then the major aid station that we were looking at previously was the crown king uh that was our static camp on that aid station but we're looking at lane mountain right now right, is, I uh, mile 33 yeah. and on the menu there is watermelon that's what the runner guide says i'm sure there's actually a few more uh offerings than just watermelon but that is their specialty at the lane mountain aid station Brett, one question I wanted to ask before we get back to the station. There was someone in the chat that mentioned there's an inaugural Oregon 200 this year. I think you and I actually might have seen the you course. You sent it to me. Yeah. What do you think? Because yeah. you know the area well. It's cool. It's a really cool trail. Um, it's uh, in the North Umpqua region, I believe, and it's very. I mean, it's beautiful. It's like pretty green, pretty forested, pretty covered. Um, you get some just like nice views of big rivers and uh, yeah I would just it's an out and back which a hundred miles out hundred miles back <laughs> I, I mentally have a really hard time with that like I just can't see myself getting to the hundred mile mark and leaving and turning around and making my way back uh, whereas like a point-to-point -point style course like this one uh, I can I can see like my why to do a course like that gets a little bit deeper, but um, just to see a huge part of that trail in Oregon is uh, it would be pretty pretty cool. I mean, you you get to cover a lot of ground. So the only holdup is the potential fire risk at that time of year, right? Yeah, that's definitely something you're going to run into with like most summer races in Oregon. It's like there might be fires, it might be smoky, but you know. It, it also might not be, and then you yeah. might have an amazing experience, and that's just one of the tough uh, parts of you know racing in the summer on the West Coast. That's just that's just where we're at in life right now. So I think our drone camera has eyes on either Killian Court, I think it is Killian Court, or Michael Versteeg. Just one comment here: Does this not perfectly encapsulate the lonely, the the figurative loneliness of the long distance runner, just out there in the middle of the wilderness, getting after it? All by their, all by themselves. Yeah, I believe uh, Korth, Korth has already come through that aid station, at least according to the live tracker. Okay, so this is um, probably for Steve. But the trackers are. Yeah, Steve is saying for Steve in the chat. I think you're correct. They're, yeah, I mean, I know there's always a little delay with the trackers, but they're. The trackers are very close to each other right now, much closer than they were. We'll follow them out as long as we can. We're probably hitting the very edge of the range for that for our drone pilot. But yeah, one thing I, I think it might be fun to talk about, we, uh, I've been watching a lot of Netflix reality TV series around like wilderness events where they'll drop people off in like, you know, southeastern Alaska in mid-fall and they have to hunt for their food and they have to build shelter and they have to, they're exposed to the cold and the elements and I think all they have is like a GoPro to track what they're doing and provide content. But those like become six to eight episode shows that people just eat up from all different backgrounds and I think that these 200 mile races are an underappreciated part of our sport that could be perfectly set up for that reality type show on Netflix because 
I think if you edit this properly and you you know cut out a lot of the downtime, there's some really amazing stories that play out over the course of four days that are riveting and, and people are kind of like waiting on the edges of their seats and you could like end episodes at mile 50 and then they pick back up and like episode two is like 50 to 100 and um, this could be an unexpected gateway to the sport for a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't know what ultra running is I think. You could make an amazing like short docuseries off of this race every single year. Uh, I mean we're, we're seeing we're seeing it live you know how just phenomenal this course is uh, in terms of just the views and and that not only that just how beautiful the course is I mean you could stick every single one of these people running this race and you could you know have them run 250 miles with the laps around the parking lot and it would still be interesting because every single one of these people has a very interesting story yeah because I just don't know if there's ever like a boring person that signs up for a 250 mile race that's the other thing. The characters in this race are just so awesome. Yeah. Um, do we want to talk about like who our favorite character might have been from Joe Corsiano's <laughs> podcast series? All right, I'll admit it. I am a massive Chad Wright fan. I want to go run through a brick wall after listening to that Chad Wright, Joe Corsiano episode. I will admit for folks out there that might go and, and check it, I do have an incredible soft spot for David Goggins' content. It, it has the equivalent impact of 100 milligrams of caffeine on my life, and uh, I am a total sucker for like the rah-rah, and Chad Wright totally delivered, and Chad Wright is in this race. Um, there were some awesome moments in that episode. He had so many like one-liners and just quotes that, I, because I, on it, like, I had admittedly never heard of Chad Wright before, and then as soon as it's like, the, I started listening, getting deeper in this podcast, I was like, me, like, I have to learn more about this man and what what is going on here uh, is even just the the way that he explained to Joe what his training was like. He's like, I didn't do, you know, it's not. I'm not been preparing for this race for a year. I haven't been preparing for two years. I'm doing eight weeks, but I'm training. I'm training like a boxer where you know if someone needs me <laughs> if, if, if someone needs me to go help them move go pick up the kids no way. the answer no. is no the answer is no i am not helping nobody for these next eight weeks because i am training so for eight weeks he dedicated like 100 percent of his life to getting ready for this race over in the mountains out of georgia and i am so curious how how that works um like to me, eight weeks. I'm like, oh, that's not long enough. But like, what if you're 100 percent bought in for eight weeks? Like, oh my gosh! You know, former Navy SEAL. Um, this really sounds like he's got the mental toughness part down. So maybe it is just a little bit of physical prep, but then so much of it is the mind game and being able to just keep pressing. And I got to give you credit. I think you listened to the episode first and then sent it to me, and. That was a huge mistake because I listened to the episode and then just went down his Instagram rabbit hole for the next like, three hours and <laughs> just got properly motivated and I probably went and, I don't know, I just, I was super inspired, so lost an entire day to Chad Wright content. Not mad about it, but wasn't expecting my Thursday yeah. to go that way. I believe he was bid number 51. Yeah, <clears throat> 51 is less. Trackers showing mile 29, uh, right around our other friend, uh, Dominic Grossman. Let's do a little refresh of the tracker. I did love Sally McCray's podcast with Joe as well talking about this race so good um, and just it's it's so fascinating to hear how a you know a professional runner like Sally can continue to like find motivation through exploring just different events and different challenges instead of just like you know hammering her head against the wall uh, you know ha like doing the same race over and over when instead it's like no, I've done these things, but like I want to see where my limits are in this event or this event. Um, yeah. and it's, I think it's cool that you know 
Sally brings a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, so a lot of views, a lot of eyes, you know, to the events that she does because, you know, Sally does have a, a large social following. So um, probably put in the 200 mile races, you know, a little bit more on the map for people who haven't, uh, maybe haven't heard of the event before. Yep. It's, it's fascinating and yeah, I really enjoyed that episode she did with Joe and she, I think we were talking about it earlier, she's such a student of the sport and if you go and watch her YouTube vlog, which is excellent, the production value is excellent, audio is great, she walks you through all of her day-to-day -day build up, her weekly build up to this race and uh, she's really leaving no stone unturned, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Okay, we, we are going to take a just one minute break because Matt has been just staring at a pile of cables for the last 10 minutes and he said I think I could fix it give me one minute and we've got so many good talking points coming up so stay tuned we're not going to miss a beat give us one minute Audio test. Test, test, test. Audio test. Boom, 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 boom. This is like that one time. <laughs> that one time when I just made everyone deaf overnight. Yeah, apologies <laughs> to the AirPod <laughs> listeners. <laughs> One of these days. Okay, we got the sultry mics going. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, huge apologies to everyone listening with headphones. Guilty as charged with um, the bad audio. <laughs> Turn, turn our game down just a smidge. Yeah. Um, all right. <laughs> now, now people can't hear for different reasons. This is like uh, <laughs> because they're all deaf. I feel it, Brett. We, so we're going to give you just as a as a as a sincere apology from the depths of our hearts. We're going to give you the Floda commercial again. So take it from here, MC Matt. It's a landmark commercial right there. Love it. So, like, just based off the branding and everything alone, like, how much are we paying per can of Flota? I think until they can reduce marginal costs and get with a good supplier, assuming they haven't yet, we're going to be paying about six bucks a can. Oh, I was thinking like 60. 60. Oh, I believe, I believe, yeah. I believe like, in the Satisfy supply chain. Yeah, like the Satisfy branded soda is $60 a can. <laughs> 100%. I mean, it's not like there's no such thing as $60 drinks out there. <laughs> That's true. 
I mean, like, how do we know that's not just filled with some of our, like, absolute finest Cabernet from the Napa Valley in 2017? But their cost to acquire one customer is, like, 500 bucks. Hey, that's fine. Like, whatever works. Oh, this is awesome. Well, Brett, it's great to be here with you. I think we are just about finishing up hour one of 30 hours together this week on the live stream. Oh my gosh, aid station fireball. I was saving power thirst to uh, just for some point later because I was going to throw that out there to see if anyone had seen the power thirst ads because that reminded me of like the liquid death flavors. <laughs> um, Flota also similar uh similar similar vibes but anyone who hasn't seen the power thirst commercials on youtube definitely go check those out some really great flavor uh flavor names all right matthew myers in the chat brett is asking us if we can repeat everything we've said for the last hour and i'm, I'm saying we do a poll maybe we see if the rest of the chat wants us to just repeat i mean i think there's definitely a handful um handful of things that we could definitely revisit you know one of you know one of the main things was that i would you know my artist of choice if i had to listen to one over the course of this entire race it was going to be taylor swift <laughs> <laughs> and all finn was going to listen to is the star wars soundtrack on repeat <laughs> or the lord of the rings soundtrack that would be Pretty cool. I don't know. I don't know if I get Lord of the Rings vibes from this race. I get it coming into Flagstaff. Yeah. It would be a late stage soundtrack option. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we were, we were talking a bit about uh, sleep strategy or perhaps lack thereof and how yep. across our research for this race – you know, one of the biggest things that we learned was that the sleep strategies were so different across all the different runners. And we're wondering if in the next, you know, if in the next five years of, you know, 200 mile races, will it continue to be very different from runner to runner? Or is there going to be one theme of sleep strategy that yeah. starts to come out uh, and be like the main, like this is, yep. This is how we do it. <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> this is how we do it. All right, Brett, maybe maybe one question we can go into. You, you look at how much, I mean, this, this race for a lot of runners is going to take up an entire week of a 52-week year. That's one fifty-second of their year, 2023. At what point, do we stop creating new distances in the sport simply because you can't take enough vacation time or there aren't enough people in the sport that are doing this singularly? Like there's not enough of a field. Like, See, it's really interesting when you broke it down that way, the amount of time that this race takes, that made it seem more approachable to me. It's only 152nd <laughs> of my year. Like – that's like barely over one second of a minute. <laughs> like, <laughs> why not? Like everyone, I think this kind of just backfired on Finn. Everyone should go try a 200 mile race now because I mean, sure. There's the prep and like a training and whatnot for it, but then you only have to spend one week doing it. Yeah. Yep. Only one week of your whole entire life. Do you feel like this is the last big distance that you can actually create a market of runners for though, purely because again, most people can't take much more than a week off at a time to go do something. Or are we going to see the advent of I mean, 500 mile races or at that point does it just go to the FKT scene? Thousands of people take months off every summer to go through hike the, you know, AT, the PCT. So, I mean, what's a week then? I mean, that's a great point. You know, there's so many people that, you know, take a, take a summer off to go do something long. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I, I see this sport growing. I could see even longer ones, you know, coming to existence, especially as these live streams get more dialed in. 
Um, you know, like we have aid station footage coming out of Lane Mountain. Yeah. In the middle of nowhere. Yep. A 200 mile race. And we get to watch it and talk about it. Like, you know, especially as we get later on into the week, you know, it'll be very much like Hunger Games style where, you know, when we're coming on each week, we get to talk about those we've lost along the way. <laughs> um, I'm trying to find a little... We need like a bell or something to commemorate. I need my tiny cannon. <laughs> That's what I need. So, you know, I I think... Uh, it, yeah, this, the storylines are definitely going to be very interesting over the course of this race. And that's not necessarily unique to just this race. Like each of these 200 mile races has very interesting storylines like that. And like if there are production <laughs> teams that are willing to help tell these types of stories, they will be very popular. Yeah. Um, and, you know, popular to do, popular to watch absolutely nothing wrong with being a huge fan of watching 250 mile races and never doing one. Oh my god. 100%. I'm 100 percent okay 100%. with that like that's how most sports work 100 percent matt there's a couple people asking in the chat if we can do a split screen yeah i don't people want to see our faces they want i don't to know see why. our ugly mugs i'm totally down with that but they say two minutes but yeah brett i think to your point you made me reevaluate a couple things and it's like what if people who are watching these races on these live streams but hopefully at one point in time it goes to netflix as well what if there's a cultural shift that happens where people are more interested in using their time off and putting it towards a physical challenge than like someone said in the chat here going to the beach or using it for leisure and just like you know hanging around lounging and stuff like that like the, the world's a better place the if better uh, place. people spend more time outside um I don't care how you do it, but, uh, you know, you could go, yeah, you go outside however you want. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to race a 250 mile, but I bet this is going to open up a lot of doors of just possibility. Um, kind of like a couple of years ago when we kind of had the 50 K boom, you know, a lot of people who were running marathons. Oh, that's definitely the longest I'm ever going to go. Oh, they have a friend who tried a 50 K trail race. Well, if they did it, I could do it. And they do it and then they love it. Um, it's snowballing. Yes. Where does it? St yeah, there's there's some huge environmental challenges uh, on this Cocodona course. You know, Finn, you had mentioned the exposure, just the amount of hours that you have to spend in the heat to, uh, you know, to, to to make your way through the course. It that is a huge challenge for some. I like personally, like if we're talking like you know Appalachian Trail, I'm worried about the humidity. Um, yep. cause I've, I come from, you know, more of a dry heat type climate, like the, the weather out at Cocodona, that seems much more familiar to me. Yeah. I don't know how to manage my hydration or nutrition or chafage in the humidity. Yep. Um, that's so foreign to me. Um, which, yeah, I mean, ultimately why there's going to be lots of 200 mile races popping up all over probably the world one other thing brett we can talk about is how this is becoming a festival type event we have the introduction of the sedona canyons 125 we have the eldon crest 36 miler as, as a fan of this whole series i hope to see even more shorter stuff added to it as well it's kind of cool that the, the big event is the Cocodona 250, but they've also found a way, not just for people to be viewers of this experience, but if they want to play a part of it, but in a smaller event, more approachable event, they can do that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what Aravipe is doing with this, with this race and this event and this whole week is going to continue to grow and just turn into a really fun week of being a fan of the sport and we have picture in picture how much is everyone regretting that now <laughs> here we are we got another runner coming out of a uh, lane i'm sorry Mountain. chad we warned you ahead of time but anything is possible when you have matt in your corner 
Anything is possible when you have Brett and Finn in the corner. Anything's possible. That was a Kevin Garnett reference. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if, if if we can. I guess we'll definitely know at the Crown King aid station um, whether <clears throat> Versteeg has overtaken Killian Korth. On the trackers, it appears so, but... There's always a little bit of a delay. Um. One other thing, this is in Brett. You're definitely more qualified to talk about this than me, but one of the things that excites me about these 200-mile races is the diversity of gear because you are bringing in a lot of these more long-distance trail people. And so in addition to your typical Solomon pack or your Nathan pack or your Ultra Spire pack, you might have some packs from the backpacking intro, like Ospreys and, uh, you know, Z packs and mountain laurel designs. Give me, give me and, a Kelty. And a Kelty. Like, I, I think it's all out there on display. And it's it's just cool to see how different types of athletes can convene here and approach it differently in terms of, of gear. It's so cool to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're getting great shots through the aid stations and <clears throat> kudos to the uh, aid stations today. I think especially around the hundred mile mark, we're going to see some really cool ones. There was one earlier today on the stream that y'all saw, but uh, well stocked, well decorated, nice ambiance. It seems like each year the, um, the aid station menus start to get a little bit bigger. So in the runner guide for the Cocodona 250, which first thing, the runner guide is 34 pages long. Um, on page 18 of the runner guide, you get to the aid station, the mileages, but then also what the specialty will be. So at the Crown King Saloon at mile 37.4, that uh, – Aid station sponsored by Spring Energy. On the menu, we're looking at pulled pork and black bean burgers, uh, potato and pasta salad, potato soup, and they're doing spring smoothies as well. That's incredible. Like that, that, that motivates me to even think a little bit more about maybe doing a race like this because I would love to experience that. That sounds so fun. Gourmet aid stations. Killian is coming into Crown King now. He may already be here, actually. He's in there. Killian Korth is in Crown King. So that would be the race leader. Killian Korth, Crown King aid station at mile 37. Yes, we, yeah, we didn't get that uh, tracker update for a while, but he's clearly moving well. Mason says exactly what I want to see in the middle of a race in 90 degree heat is a pulled pork sandwich. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is Killian. I've got to say, Killian, Killian looks unreal fresh right now. He, he looks very, like, very relaxed, very chill. I mean, I think so much of like an agreed upon strategy for a race like this is keep the stress levels low. We do not need to add any additional stress to a race like this. Yep. Got to, yeah, I'd probably open up the, the clash of clans. Oh, no, I'm just making a phone call. Figure you need to check on the fantasy teams. <laughs> Make sure his fantasy free trail picks are locked in. Finn, what can you tell me about Killian Korth? I see you're doing a little bit of internet sleuthing right now. Doing a little bit of internet sleuthing on Killian Korth on Instagram. He goes by Killian.the.ultraman. He's a Colorado based ultra runner and skier. He runs for Ultra Spire, Noon Hydration. He's got a coaching business, Run Tough Coaching. Got to imagine that with a good performance here today. That's some excellent brand marketing for anyone out there that is trying to uh, get an education 
on how to execute these types of races. I gotta say one thing. This is what is so cool about a 200 mile race. This guy can hop on a cell phone in the lead and just chill at an aid station. Who do you think he's talking to? What, and what are they saying? I bet he's talking to uh, Michael Versteeg <laughs> and say, hey, I'm already in the Crown King aid station and I ate all the pulled pork sandwiches. <laughs> all they have left for you is watermelon. I heard you hate salt and vinegar chips, so I made sure to eat all the other chips, and now that's all that's left. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Smell you later. <laughs> I think we're going to remember these types of moments. Remember back in 2023 in 200-mile races when you could just, like, call someone on your cell phone at an aid station and still maintain the lead? Man. I I hope that part of this – I don't – I hope we're still a ways away from uh, – seeing rushed aid station transitions and 200 mile races i mean the longer the race the more important these aid stations get and if you rush through and you know miss something the amount of time you're spending between these aid stations too is is massive like the next aid station is quite a ways away yeah how far what's, what's our gap uh 16 miles yeah 16 miles to the next aid station at Arastra, Arastra Creek. And can we read off the menu here for what he's got to look forward to? So at Killian Court's next aid station, he will be looking at turkey and cheese roll-ups, hummus avocado roll-ups, potato soup, and spring rolls. That's what he gets to look forward to. He doesn't even look hot. No. It's hot out like no big bucket hat where's that sunshade and i would love to know just how good those spring smoothies taste if anybody gets any intel in the chat on the ingredients what's going into that we would love to know is that an entire block of cheese <laughs> you you pooped in the refrigerator and ate an entire wheel of cheese i'm not even mad i'm impressed First person to name that movie gets a shout out. <laughs> so his crew just got there. Wow, his crew just showed up. I believe he's got the Limon Pepino Gatorade. That is super, super fuel. If Leah Yingling is watching this live stream right now, shout out to Leah. This is also a Leah favorite. I think she'd go for the same thing. Uh, yep, absolutely. It was, yeah. Who, who said it first? Tori. Nope. E train. E train before it. With the anchorman quote. Aid station fireball with the rare miss. Maybe it was on purpose. We'll see. But I will say if. If Killian Korth takes an entire block of cheese in his pack on the way out right here, that's that's straight queso right there. I want to see some runner at some point in this race say, it was so damn hot, milk was a bad choice. I'm trying to get a vis on the footwear. He's got gaiters covering it. Um, oh, great. Oh, it's looking like the Ultra Olympus. Their highest stack shoe. There you have it. We got uh, offset colored gaiters, but goes well with the orange vibes of the shoe. Um, I approve of that. So we're looking at, so we had a two liter reservoir as well as one, two, He's loaded two soft flasks into the bag. That's another. So we're at three liters total of fluids right now. He has a quart Gatorade. We got some spring energy gels. Ah, Killian taking the pulled pork sandwich <laughs> with a nice slice of American cheese in uh, 89 degree weather. I think one of the comments said, because who wants a pulled pork sandwich when it's 90 out? Joke's on you, it's 89. 
Oh, interesting. It's a Gatorade Zero. That's that's a bold move. I would go for like Gatorade <laughs> Extra. It's a bold move, Cotton. We'll see how this one plays out. Interesting, interesting. Wow. So, I mean, that's just – you have to be so strong to just haul around that much fluid on a, a pack with no, like, hip support, you know, like most backpack – backpacking packs yep. you can put a lot of the weight onto your hips these are just all on the sh shoulders all right we've got some uh cinema aficionados in the chat so one... pepper needs new shorts <laughs> we haven't seen this since the helsinki instead of 1909 and we all know how that one played out um that's actually that's a a, a real good question is what mileage can they pick up pacers and I had that in the runner guide. Uh, whiskey, whiskey row, you can pick up your first pacer, and that's at mile seventy-eight. So we're still forty miles. Jim from in the chat. He hasn't been sitting during all this. He's been standing the whole time, which is interesting. Time on feet. One interesting note, and I'm sure this was talked about earlier in the broadcast, but Killian Korth is back for vengeance here in 2023. He had a DNF about 100 miles into this race last year, and so I think that adds an interesting bit of uh, context to his race here. This is, this is in, to some extent, a redemption opportunity for Killian, who uh, I'm sure had similar intentions last year, and um, he's back at a hamstring tear. Ooh. He has been putting down some mad calories at this aid station. Um, very impressive. I mean, in the heat, to be able to down probably upwards of 1,000 calories at this aid station yeah. and then keep going out of it, you got to— He's going straight Joey Chestnut here. Yeah, you got to, like, Kobayashi. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just super impressive to be able to put down that kind of— food and then make your way back out on course but this is a very good example too of this is the kind of this is the kind of fueling that you need to practice for when doing a race like this it looks like we are going for a maybe a sock change yeah wet wipes keeping those feet clean um i love the up close camera that we're getting on Killian just to see the entire process yep. of in the aid station to out of the aid station. Aaron in the chat. And says, Versteeg's in the aid station. Versteeg is here. Brett, like, Aaron in the chat says, why is he not doing all this in the shade? Which I think is interesting. He is choosing to sort of stay exposed here at this picnic table. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And, I, I would think, you know, I think if he's probably hunting for the shade, he's probably feeling really hot um, just based off of kind of his body language and how I don't even see any sweat marks on his shirt. You know, he's either like super dehydrated and is on borderline heat stroke or he's actually just perfectly fine at this temp. Yeah. And I'm thinking it's the latter. Yep. Um, he's doing, you know, killing, he's doing all the right things. He's taking care of himself. You know, making sure the shoes are empty, change the socks, put some lube on the feet, ate the food, drank the drank. Uh, I believe it's uh, someone had asked what kind of pack was he using. I couldn't get a true ID on it, but I believe it was a Solomon pack, probably either their 12 or their 15 liter. Brett, knowing pack. what you know about this terrain and the Ultra Olympus, what do you think about the shoe choice for this type of event? You know, I think the longer the race, the less, or the, the more important just pure comfort becomes. Um, you could do this race in a road shoe if that's what you're most comfortable in because we're not hitting high speeds where we need mega performance yep. grip, things like that. You know, it's mostly purely down to comfort and what you know is going to just work. All right. 
these to me kind of feel like Solomon Advanced Skin 12 liter pack. There yeah. we go. To me, these kind of feel like Barkley Marathon aid stations. Like they're a little bit more drawn out. They're more consequential. They're hanging around for 10 to 15 minutes. Well, they understand that like when they leave this aid station, they're not seeing another one for many hours. Yep. In even most of the competitive 100 mile races, there's aid stations every five miles, you know. If you're fast, you might be able to get by with, you know, one bottle in between aid stations. You know, I remember in 2015, I watched Rob Carr win uh, Western States, and he only ever had one bottle on him at all times because he gambled and went for like, no, I know if I'm running fast, I will be able to go one bottle between aid stations. That's and wild. he and he gambled on it and it worked. That just doesn't exist at this race. Um, the amount of time that you spend in between a stations is just way too far and you have you there's no room for that yep i was looking and seeing they had a couple uh filter flasks as well which is probably a smart move to potentially grab more water when you're out on course <clears throat> yeah i am loving all this aid station footage so good. Oh, it's awesome. All right. So you also added on a waste, waste light as well. I believe that's a Ultra Spire Lumen waste light. Yep. Just in case gets dark out there i guess we i guess we don't know when he's going to see his crew next but best to be prepared don't want to be stumbling through the woods in first place in the dark he thanks the his crew thanks the aid station volunteers for being out there and killian korth is making his way back on course For those who are just turning in, we're at mile 37 at the Crown King Saloon Aid Station. Jogging out. What a flex. <laughs> All right. We got... A station cam on Versteeg now. Again, I love there these. are there's a lot of cameras on him. So it looks like Versteeg is going. I believe that's a Powerade bottle. So we have a we have a Powerade versus Gatorade battle right now. Yep. Very interesting. I'm like, what do? Yeah, what do, in the chat, what do you think? Powerade or Gatorade? I want to know. I mean, I guess for all we know, it's not actually what was in the bottle, but. Yeah, Versteeg's got a. Uh, He's got a crew. Quite the crew. He's a content creator. So I, I, it looks like we're, we've got water. We've got like a thermos. We've got something blue. Powerade. Are you joking? Is that a Powerade Zero? <laughs> are they both drinking zero calorie <laughs> coconut water i am so confused right now why are we going zero calorie electrolyte drinks wow i cannot believe it powerade zero folks again like i said i have a feeling that by the end of the stream i'm going to have more questions than answers <laughs> And Michael Versteeg is making He's out. quick work He's quick. this aid station. There was an uneaten burger on that table, so I'm, maybe he's feeling the, the the pressure of Killian Korth coming in and out. Oh, and maybe we're not actually leaving. Killian went right. Versteeg's going left. Versteeg has an entourage. Oh, and now they're saying you should probably have turned right. I've never been satisfied. <laughs> Name that. 
Let's see how good the chat is. <laughs> Oops, forgot my full board. Yeah. Just put it in a doggy bag. Arastra. 15.7 miles. Alex, Alex offer Hamilton. Correct. Glad. That's, ooh, that's actually, dude, I could listen to the Hamilton soundtrack on repeat for the majority of this race. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'd, I'd love that. Yeah, that entire musical. So good. So, Michael Versteeg, he probably spent, what, a total of five or six minutes in this aid station? Five or six minutes. And Killian was probably upwards of 15. It's amazing to me, and I think we're probably going to see this, or one thing that I want to pay attention to at this aid station is as, like, the top five, top, top five men, top five women come through this aid, what do they look like? What do their crews look like? It's so interesting. Like, you look at the race leader, Killian Korth. He was on his own for the first 10 or 15 minutes he was in aid then he had sort of like it appeared to be a group of friends maybe a partner join him michael versteek had a whole company there with him he had a yeah. whole crew of camera people like just two different approaches philosophies to the race and it all works they're both in the lead you know um very interesting to me and i'm sure there's going to be people that don't even have a crew that they're doing the entire race start to finish just working just, off aid stations yep draw bags no pacers um curious if there's anyone who did no drop bag no pacer i mean that would be tough because you just gotta no drop bag no pacer that means you'd have to start the race with all of your just i'm just thinking headlamp batteries like you are starting the race with a lot of headlamps yeah if you went okay now i yeah we're gonna have to crowdsource this one maybe matt has anyone done this race no drop bags, no pacers, no crew, just purely off aid stations. I don't know about no drop bags. There's people who've done it with no crew and no pacer. Yeah, I know people have gotten a crew, no pacer. I'm curious if anyone, who will be the first to go off aid stations alone <laughs> and just carry everything from the start? I wonder what Garmeyer did the first year. Yeah, Jeff Garmeyer, the first year, he might, um, he might be one to ask about this. Yeah, Andrew Glaze, he was on that. Everyday Ultra podcast. He unsupported solo unsupported, with drop eggs. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe next year we'll see the no drop bag level up. <laughs> Which, yeah, then like you're you're mandatory taking pulled pork sandwiches. Yep. You have no choice. Yep. Um, and you don't get to take your pick of zero calorie electrolyte drink. You're you're drinking sugar. Coca Dona two fifty unsupported <laughs> FKT. Yeah, I think that's called just doing this course on any other day of the year. You know who I really want to see run this race? True Heart Brown. Oh, that's... Flag sure, staff why here. not? <laughs> Flag stuff here. Let's get True Heart on the start line. I, I don't know who I want to see do this race. I mean, the people I want to see do this race are the ones who sign up for it. Like, that's really what it is. Like, they can just pick for me. Brian so, says he's here for the Anchorman references. I'll just give him some, I some mean, uh, description here. The, the, our recording studio smells of rich mahogany. <laughs> Is that a good thing? Or, I mean, I guess 60% of the time it works every, every time. time. Courtney DeWalter has not done the Coca Dona 250. She's done... Tahoe 200, Tahoe 200 and, and the Moab, Moab 240. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I'm pretty convinced that those performances were what got her on Rogan too. Like the, the outside interest, in addition to her, obviously her personality and just being an ambassador for the sport, it was those 200 mile races that really captured the imagination of people on the outside that don't follow the sport too closely. So I think that there are these really interesting opportunities at races like Cocodona where for the average fan, um, there's maybe some more relatability or just. Or well, it's just so fascinating, like uh, trying to look at it as 
uh, you know, someone who's maybe not ever witnessed a trail race or anything like that, like the, I just trying to figure out like how someone covers 250 miles on foot, um, you know, to looking at it from that perspective, that's more interesting than covering 100 miles on foot because it's two and a half times longer. Yep. Like it's insane. Um, all right. We had a conversational pace shout out a moment ago. Wow. Which is awesome. I do. Love it. Cool. Yeah. The fans are out there. Conversational pace for the most in-depth trail shoe reviews. What, um, okay. Let's just, let's go down that rabbit hole for a sec. Throw it into the chat. If you're a uh, start in Cocodona 250, what shoe, what shoe are you running in right now? You know, what's our, what's our footwear of choice for Cocodona? While we're waiting for some of these, the Speedlands, yeah. Yeah, shout out to uh, one of our sponsors, Speedland. They have just released the uh, the GS Tam, which is their highest cushioned shoe at the moment. Um, that's actually going to be the next review that we drop on the Conversational Pace YouTube channel. Recording that tonight. We are recording that tonight. Um, yeah, the GS Tam has been a fun one, but uh... Brett, there's a. Uh, we were talking about this a couple of days back. We we told producer Matt that we were getting speed go spammed right now. <laughs> so Crocs sports mode. Crocs the, and sports okay. mode. Yeah. Got to call it the Asics Trabuco Max. Great shoe. That's been one of my favorite Max cushion trail shoes of the year. So surprised by that shoe. Um, it's a great shoe. I feel like you can't go wrong with the Speed Goat. I guess the biggest question, I mean, for most of these, most people were going to be changing shoes as there's just not that many shoes that can handle 250 continuous miles of uh, abuse. But uh, some of these really high stack, super soft shoes, I worry about because... There's so much foam and it's so soft that when it really does start to break down, if you don't have a very efficient foot strike, um, it can start to, you know, break down unevenly, yep. can throw the body out of whack a little bit. Um, so that's why kind of you play that game of when, how much is too soft cushion? How much cushion do I need versus a little bit firmer protection? You know, um, seeing a lot like, yeah, a handful of people have said like the Saucony, endorphin edge the exodus ultra those are great kind of in between shoes where they're like borderline high stack shoes but aren't as soft as say something like the ultra olympus asics tribuco max hoka speed goat but i mean there's no correct answer here the the correct answer is the shoe that you're most comfortable in Someone mentioned The Long Way Home, which, Brett, you and I now believe is one of the best ultra-running documentaries of all time. It follows Eric Sensman's running of the Cocodona 250 last year. If there's a way to link to it in the chat, we'll do it. It's actually yeah. produced by Aerovite, but this isn't. This, and this is totally organic, by the way. We just we watched it in prep for this event. It's excellent. So if you're looking to consume a little bit of extra Cocodona content today, it's about an hour long, and production value is great the storytelling is great the character development's great it's worth your time yeah i i just loved how it wasn't so much about winning a race or even a race in general it was more like eric's journey of completing this and just you they did such a great job of capturing all of the emotions that he was going through over the various stages of the course I also thought it was hilarious that he broke down the Cocodona 250 into three climbs. Yes. Um, if I were to make one like recommendation, I would say try and break the course down into a few more pieces <laughs> than just three climbs. But um, the interviews, just the footage they got of Eric and how he just continued, it was incredible. I think we've got Sarah Ostazewski on 
our eight station camera. Looking strong. Uh, running really well. Veteran of this race. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Yeah. This is Sarah's third Cocodona. And I, according to the trackers, that was going to be the next person we were going to see into the uh, Crown King aid station. I think we're actually unsure of exactly what part on the course we're looking at, but this is coming into Crown King. Mic issues, I think. Microphone issues. My mic. Finn's mic. <coughs> so we're watching Sarah Osazuski come into the Crown King aid station. A lot of pep in that step. Looking the fresh. Legs, the legs must be feeling good. The legs are fresh. I'm really curious to see what her aid station transition is like. I'm also curious of the footwear. I lean towards Nike Zagama, but I don't recall ever seeing one with a white outsole like that. Maybe it's a special edition from the sister. Yeah, Melissa, I believe her sister Melissa works for Nike, and yeah, Melissa's the I think the tech rep, a out tech of, rep out yeah. of the Phoenix, Arizona area. Oh, Sarah also works for Nike. Yeah, Aaron in the chat says Killian Korth was. 14 minutes ahead of Versteeg coming into Crown King. Lost a lot of time there. I will say, I think that K Killian was probably waiting for his crew and he could have made the decision to bolt, but there's probably a lot of wisdom in waiting and there's plenty, of, plenty, plenty of time left in this race. Yeah, and, you know, there's always the back and forth of some runners are going to spend more time in the aid station and then the actual section of the course in between the aid stations are going to cover faster. So we could see that the gap opens up between the next aid station and then Killian spends more time in the aid station. Michael's much steadier and then uh, goes all the way. Oh, we got a little blood on Sarah's knee. Yep. A little, little trail wound right there. Uh, we are looking at some... Uh, yeah, I'm probably not allowed to talk about these shoes at all. Um, there's actually, yeah. Send it to Protos of the Gram. <laughs> um, I think it's actually an Ultrafly upper with a, a different midsole, and that's probably the only detail that I can go into. Exciting, though, because this is the kind of real-life testing that these shoe companies need to be doing to make yes. a trail shoe. Like, if you want to make an amazing trail shoe, go get someone to uh, run a 250-mile race in it and give some feedback. Okay, so <laughs> as of right now, we've gone purely off of, like, drop bags and crew support in terms of, like, repacking the pack. Um, I saw some science and sport gels. I saw some spring gels. We've got the... Uh, the, the the prototype serial number on the side of the shoe. <laughs> Love to see it. Uh, Has a camera crew here, but it doesn't look like any crew. She looks solo, which is, again, uh, just noticing the pattern, the different patterns of the runners coming through. There oh, have been look at this big brain move right here, filling the soft flask, putting it in between the slots of wood on the table. Oh, I, okay, that is... Minor, minor Thought blemish. Thought that counts. Thought yeah. that counts. That, that's, see, when you're thinking like that, you're, you're in a good spot in regards to the race. That, yeah, that was a clever way to fill up the bottle. Grape tailwind, FTW. Just looks veteran here, moving around with purpose, knows where everything is. This is clearly not her first Cocodona. Looking strong, looking composed. Yep. Uh, who do we have in here as well? We'll try and get an ID on that. Uh, on the tracker, it was Mike Groenwegen. Bib 30. I would love to get a uh, 
bib ID if possible. Is Sarah on her way out already? Oh, she's still there at the, the table. From Seattle, Washington, Mike Groenwagen. Mike appears to be rocking a Hoka Speed Goat. See, Mike, Mike looks warmer than some of the other people that we've seen come through. He does. A little bit of color commentary on Mike. It does appear he comes from that long trail, unsupported FKT background. This past summer, 2022, he made his third attempt to double loop unsupported the 93-mile Wonderland Trail around Rainier up in Washington. Wonder Wonderland. So, just it's it's these, these some backgrounds sunscreen are so cool. application. He's done the Tahoe 256 hours. Yeah, he got second at the Tahoe 200 last year. He's run the Moab 240, Bigfoot 200, Fat Dog 120. I will say, Sarah looks dialed. I mean, we, lis we listened to her podcast with uh, Joe Corsione and yep. one of the things that they actually learned a lot from the first year and even into the second year was I think we might have had too big of a crew and we had too much going on where you know I think as Sarah has gained a lot of experience from the last two Cocodonas she's able to make a lot more decisions out there on her own like she clearly knows what she's doing right now um, and it was a lot in previous years, she had said it was a lot of like, do this, do this, come here, go do that. You know, where, who, sh when should we have pacers? Where should they be? And I think it's just getting a little bit more dialed with the ins and outs of the aid station. And yep, I think she might be partaking in a spring smoothie. Love it. Yeah, and this was something Andrew Glaze talked about too. How he didn't necessarily think that in these types of races that having a crew is a clear-cut advantage because there's not as much of a need to be in and out so quickly, and there actually is a benefit to taking your time, and in those cases, you can go to work for yourself. I thought that was really interesting, and that appears to be at least a part of her strategy. I'm sure she'll have crew at other checkpoints, but sometimes you can maintain focus better when there's the obstacle or, the, you know, the only way out is through, you know? It's a good point as well. Um, someone in the chat said, like, Sarah hasn't sat down at all. Like, we are, this is a, this is a no sitting aid station for Sarah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, and that's definitely a tactic, I would say. And Liam, right below that, not seeing any active cooling techniques for anyone. So, I, is it just, is it not as hot as, we might be thinking it is. I'm going to see if this... So they're up at close to 5,000 feet now, and I think that that's part of, uh, part of what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. They're at a higher altitude, so uh, it probably feels a lot cooler compared to where they were at lower, lower uh, 5, earlier in the feet. day. Yeah. yeah, and I guess just the perception of temperature as well, like... If, it, if they were running and it was 100 and now it's 80, that's going to feel significantly cooler than if you just walked outside right now and went for a run when it's 80. Um, there's something a lot to, you know, the body naturally adjusting to the temperatures yep. uh, as the temperatures change as well. Sarah has oodles of awesome sauce. And I saw on the spring table over there, they have a no GI problem formula now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven awesome sauce. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe if they're free, maybe I'll just bank a few for my uh, training for my next race. Shout out to the single digit bid number two. Having bid number four is awesome. She just grabbed like $40 of spring. <laughs> 
Hey, one of the perks of signing up and running the Cocodona 250. You you get free spring energy gels. There's AJW checking in with Sarah. Let's see here. You know, one of the runners that I'm really interested in tracking is Mike McKnight, who is no stranger to this race. He said in his pre-race interview that the times he's had the most success in 200s is when he was totally oblivious to the race around him and he was just focused on how he felt. And uh, I wonder if he's executing on that today, if, if sitting back and not being concerned about staying up front with folks like Killian Korth and Sarah and Versteeg is a factor for him. And I, if he's just betting that he's going to race his own race and things are going to fall back, it's that's going to be a very interesting storyline to follow. Yeah, I mean, we're still so early into this race. I mean, not even 12% of the way through if we're yeah, projecting Yeah, I mean, it's like times. trying to call the winner of a mile, you know, <laughs> 300 meters in. <laughs> I was like, well, we can speculate all we want, but uh, – it makes sense that we're commentating that a lot of these people look very good coming through this aid station. Like that makes sense. Yeah. Do we have audio in these aid stations, by the way, Matt? It might be cool to hear what they're saying. We're Matt's going to take a. But yeah, Aaron says Mike has always won the two hundred from up front. So yeah, I wonder. And who knows? Maybe that's just going to show like how fast Killian has gone out. Yeah. You know, it looks like here, Sarah, again, extremely er early in the race, but it's it's fun to just talk about it. She has a pretty commanding lead over the next female runner, who is Megan McCarty. Sarah's independent of this race at that point. She's competing for the lead the podium, which is amazing, which is awesome. just doing a little microphone adjustment to uh to uh fix the uh the headphone clamping that's going to turn me into a cone head over the course of the week well you can just do this too so we've got an incoming runner coming into the crown king aid station again spry looking stride um let's see if i can Possibly Micah, Micah Thews. Not Apologies, Micah. not Micah Thews. Maybe is it Christopher? Michael, sorry, Michael Greer. Or is it Chris St. John? We'll get a proper ID on the on the bib number. Also looking good. Everyone is. I think running. I saw a smile. Christopher St. John. John from Flagstaff. So we're looking like a. Local, local crusher. Did that say 24 years of age? 24 years of age. From Flagstaff, Arizona. I see he's opted for the Leckie brand poles because of the, uh, <laughs> the Leckie gloves. Yeah, he's doing this similar. I wonder if there's any... Uh, uh, motivation to do this race after Eric Sensman did this because yes, uh, it's the same similar situation where he's just running home, running home. And I know one thing some people out there in the audience like to pick up on is a lot of these 
athletes in the sport that have success based on a scientific or engineering background. Chris is a full stack web developer here in Flagstaff, Arizona. So maybe he's one of those guys who is just totally dialed in from the logistical standpoint, race prep standpoint, calculated in how he paces, how he eats, all that kind of stuff. Just thousands of hours <laughs> of continuous work in the incubator. Yes. Yeah, it looks great. Trying to chill. <coughs> oh, yeah, I think that's true. It said sixth male, but I think he would be sixth overall, fourth male. Yeah, the... Um, all of uh, all of the uh i guess places and bios those are all being i guess updated as quick as possible looking at chris st jean's instagram here the the bio says runner van boy digital nomad plant fueled so i like that he's he's added a few interesting angles to his running digital nomad digital i'm not nomad. i'm not even quite sure how to break down digital nomad <laughs> I think he, you know, a lot of those folks, it's the software developers that you know, like, can I got to fall and get dirty at least center. once so people think I did something. Maybe he's able to do that with being based here in Flagstaff, being at elevation. That's true. Looks like Sarah's uh, loading up. Getting ready to exit the Crown King Saloon aid station. Wait, that was you, That was you keeping it chill, Sarah? <laughs> 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 it's a fun climb. A lot of these athletes, Sarah included, do a great job of storytelling their preparation for these races on platforms like Instagram. We can try to link to them here in the chat. Chris has a great one as well. He's done a lot of good storytelling of his prep here in the lead up. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta carry a lot of stuff for a race like this. But to your point about this being so early in the race, which it is, I think Sarah, again, just further demonstrating wisdom here, veteran experience, taking her time to check all of the self-care, nutrition, recovery boxes before heading back out for this next long stretch. Yep, she's taking that time to downing a soft bottle. Gonna fill it up again. Come through. Ah, uh, standing in the shade. Don't be all the internet. About it a little bit. And say I'll find you. One thing I will say though, the on the other hand, just to play devil's advocate a bit, this race is so long knows. that even if you're going through a rough patch early on, you can absolutely turn that around. I yep. mean, I think it was Mike McKnight, in, in one of his podcasts, was saying, uh, I think it was last year, he felt like trash early on, and was like, I'm taking an early nap you know gonna try and turn things around made that decision to like you know sacrifice some time early on yep um to hopefully save it later and this you know race is long enough where you can absolutely do that 100 percent. i mean sure of course i'd like to be in the position where i just feel great the whole time but <laughs> it doesn't always get worse it it almost always gets worse <laughs> before it gets better. <laughs> I think Sarah just took a selfie so with to you, Sarah. our Thank cameraman. You. That's a good content creator. Really always taking right the time here. to document. I appreciate that. You turn right and then left I believe Sarah's the wearing a Solomon pack. <laughs> oh, and as she exits, I think Chris had just come in. That was so much nice. fun. <laughs> Love nice. to see the camaraderie out there, and everyone's working towards a similar goal is, and supporting is, each other. Is Sarah living in Flagstaff? Living in Flag. Sarah's yeah. living in Flag now, so who knows? Maybe they got in some training runs together. Okay. 
That's Chris. So Chris went to the main aid station first. Uh, it's been interesting to see. I don't think there's any right or wrong answers here. Um, some go and immediately grab their drop bags and grab their own things. Some are going for peruse the uh, aid station fair first and then uh, go for that go for that drop bag. Okay, we're doing the uh, the half sit on the public aid station table. Uh, not illegal, sometimes frowned upon. We'll let it slide for this one. couple people that I think we're going to see rolling into this aid station soon. Don Greenwalt, Michael McKnight, Micah Thews, Kevin Goldberg, Michael Greer. There's a large, large, large contingent of people that are roughly four miles out from aid right now. And here's Sarah hiking back out, looking, just looking good, looking composed. Yeah, I mean, that's what this race is all about. Um, you know, it's never a race where you're cranking it to 12, uh, 38 miles in, you know. It, you got to be chill. You got to be zen. You got to be relaxed. Keep those stress levels down. Don't let those cortisol levels rise too high in the body. That, you know, jacks up your inflammation and such. $5. $5 for Sarah. <laughs> I don't know the significance of that, but, you know, fiver is a fiver. It's a good day. What I really want to see is, you know, for those watches that are able to capture the entirety of the race in one file. Yeah. I want to know how many steps this race is. I'm going to see if How I can... How many steps has Sarah taken? I'm going to see if I can pull up her file from the last few years as well as Joe McConaughey. Yeah, because we can... Uh, we, could, we could do a little math there, you know, average cadence times the amount of hours and minutes out there. Give us a rough step number. I just found Joe's file probably going to take about three minutes to load here <laughs> so we go yeah 60 hours what's the average cadence down there average cadence yeah, if it captured it 141. 141 so Finn Finn doesn't do public math I don't do public math we're looking at 141 average cadence times 60 hours okay I'm doing this right now on a laptop calculator that's not right. 60 hours. <laughs> well, no, because it's 141 steps per minute. Per minute. So you have Times to figure 60. out how many out, you have to figure out how many minutes are in 60 hours. Aaron Shimon says uh 4 million. 4 million. Is that right? Aaron, right. thank you for saving me. As I said, I don't do public math even when I have a calculator. Yeah, but we need a second we need a secondary uh calculator to confirm that's how math works. But, uh, dude, that's a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps. And just to keep everyone up to date here, in about five or ten minutes or so, we're going to need to shut this live stream down and switch over to a new stream. So we'll have uh, just a couple minute break in the action. But uh, we got about another five minutes or so. We don't want to miss the action at Crown King. So. We will do our best to stay as long as we can, and then we'll switch over to a second stream. You in the viewing audience will get redirected automatically to that stream, so nothing uh, you have to worry about.
Oh, that's pretty cool. So we're the, the people doing math in the chat. They're giving us about 507,000 steps, which that's a number I was a little bit more prepared to read than 4 million. <laughs> Who do we have in the station right now? Uh, I, I believe this is Don. This is Don Greenwald, yep. Don Greenwald, bib number two. We're doing some. We're doing a lot of work on the feet. I hope that's uh, like preventative work and not, you know, blister issues or things that we're dealing with, because um, that would definitely be a little bit worrisome to be having to manage uh, some, you know, blister foot issues this early on. But could just be uh, smart. I'm seeing a fully loaded ice bandana on uh, Don. First one I've actually seen. A couple cool notes about Dawn. So she is a veteran of the race, finished second in 2021 in just over 90 hours. So knows what it takes from a pacing standpoint, from a logistical standpoint. This is somebody that uh, if I'm in contention in the women's race, not a bad person to hang around. Yep. Definitely, take take notes. These are these are people that were you know taking notes on as all their aid station transitions. They've all been different. Um, I guess some of the similarities for most have been that they are taking their time and checking all the boxes. The one person that really was in and out fast was Michael Versteeg. Brett, this is a great question in the chat for us to discuss. Has anyone discussed when the first scheduled runners planning to sleep? This so is cool. yeah, we've we've uh, been trying to gather as much sleep information, and there's been so many different answers, just depending on who you ask. Even across, you know, veterans of this race who've done it once or twice before. Um, do you schedule your first sleep at like an exact spot? You know, like twenty four hours, twenty hours, or is it a window of time like i will probably sleep mm. for an amount of time between 20 and 30 hours um do you do a big push for you know 30 30 plus hours before a longer sleep so i'm definitely very curious when the the leader of the race is yeah. going to get the first shot that's Oh, now that I'm thinking about it, that really stresses me out going to sleep in first place, but you have to do it. Yes. You know, cause you, like immediately I'm thinking, Oh no, if I'm sleeping, I'm losing time, but it's, you have to remind yourself that everyone in the race has got to sleep a little bit. Um, oh yeah. That's, that's such a, a interesting kind of debate to go back and forth on. One quick uh, note here, Brett. This is without a doubt like, to continue the diversity of crew stops. Don is the first person to sit in a comfortable chair. Everyone else has been sitting on those. I mean, everyone else did the like wooden bench. Did. Standing or they wooden bench. She's got and she's got a pit crew around her. Yeah. Everyone that's come in has been different so far. And Don still has the arm sleeves on, so you know, really going, paying attention to that sun. Yeah. You know, sun exposure, which I think that's really important, you know. And shaded. Yeah, she shaded too. Like limiting that exposure to the sun, like that adds up. You know, where do you think this race really begins? Mile 100 or 150? I have a hot take here. I kind of do too. What do you think? I think that this race begins at mile one. Oh, gosh. And, and I'm not saying that to be flippant. Like, I actually mean, like, there are some things you can do in the first 30 to 40 miles of this race that can really mess up the rest of the race. Like, what, what Dawn is doing here, I think, with this, like, intricate crew stop mentality, sitting comfortably, taking shade, I think is a, I would assume to be a more sustainable strategy than mm -hmm. some of the other things we've seen. I think... It's not so much a mileage point. I mean, I guess we could get an estimated mileage, but I think the race like will really start to take shape after about 30 hours. 
Um, so depend, you know, whatever mileage that is, but around 30 hours, that's long enough where someone could have made a critical error and like absolutely blown their race. Um, that's also long enough in where you can have, you know, some of the good decisions that you made earlier on are starting to now pay off. So I think in that 30, 30 ish hour range is where we start to see, um, it become less of a, you know, simple, like just a foot race and more of, you know, like the race of attrition. Brett, are we seeing p potentially the other female runner here, Micah in the orange hat behind? Talking to Don someone Curry. on the medical team? Unless they just happen to be wearing a shirt that says medical, which, I don't know, slight faux pas, but... Appears to be a runner. I just don't have their... Matt, do we have an ID on the other runner in this aid station? Orange hat. Okay, yeah, Mika Thews. Mika Thews. Uh, one of the classic Ultimate Direction packs that might have been the Peter Backwin uh, pack, the one that had a dedicated burrito pocket. Great call. Great to see that pack still alive and well. I do still have one of their Ultimate Direction hard bottles with the with the red top. Another, I mean, one cool thing. So we've got Don here, second place at the 2021 Coco Donut 200. Mika won the Tahoe 200 last year. This is a real who's who of this race. Look and at this. at Coco Donut 2021. Five-gallon Gatorade <laughs> jug with just ice water going for the full... <laughs> The full dunk. She seems to be in great spirits. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was like that was like some slap in the bag action. <laughs> slap in the base. That was some that was a Tour de Franzia move right there. Mika was an early adopter of the two hundred mile races in our sport. I'm looking at her ultra sign up right now. She ran the Bigfoot two hundred back in twenty fifteen. She's been at this 200s game for going on eight plus years now, which yep. is cool. And just to update everyone who's watching, after Mika leaves the aid station, we will be updating our stream. I don't believe that means there's anything for anyone else to do, but that is why there will be just a temporary downtime as we get stream number two booted up and ready to go. Sounds like that's my opportunity to uh, grab another liquid death. <laughs> Going for a bubbly one this next time. Michael Greer, is in the aid Michael Greer is in the aid station. I believe someone earlier in the chat was asking about Michael Greer. And we now know that he is in the mile 37 aid station. Some interesting background on Michael Greer. Grew up in Utah, moved to Arizona in 04. Wife is a Buckeye, has five kids. Worked in health and wellness for 12 years. Running store, nutrition center, recovery center. Currently works for the University of Phoenix doing business to business relations. So always cool to get a little bit of context on the runners. And we've got this great questionnaire that the Aravipa marketing team sent out a couple weeks ahead of the race. And as more of these runners come through, we'll have... Uh, some intel to provide. Michael did a 175 mile run in the Grand Canyon back in March to celebrate his 40th birthday, which is kind of cool too. So that was barely over a month ago. Yeah. Wow. Says he loves running through the night too. And I feel like that's something most runners obviously don't get a lot of experience doing and, you know, don't feel as comfortable with. So cool that that's something he takes on with enthusiasm yeah how is chad wright doing i was just checking the tracker update just to see if we could get a a, a rough 
mileage. Um, tracker last updated around mile 33. So, you know, probably expect to see Chad coming into the aid station in the next hour or so. A little few questions about the, uh, the thermometer reading. Uh, it says 90 up there. Is that the actual temp for that? So that 90 degrees that we're seeing is actually 90 degrees for the start of the race. So it, it is cool. It is much cooler than 90 here up at the uh, Crown King Saloon Aid Station, which is why we haven't seen quite as much, uh, you know, icing or watering down as if it was 90. Someone in the chat said that on top of that 175 mile Grand Canyon effort, Michael Greer has done a couple of 60 to 70 mile runs in the last couple of weeks too. So redefining a training schedule for this type of race. Yeah, can we beep the Strava profile? I'm working on it. Peoria, Arizona, Michael Greer. And just as a, a weather update for the people here, it is 71 degrees in the beautiful town of Crown King, Arizona. And that was Matt with the weather. <laughs> yeah, Brett. Can as we go Family Guy style? <laughs> <laughs> it's hot! <laughs> it gonna rain. Uh, Brett, peep this Strava. Michael Greer, Ooh. about three weeks out, did a, a week of training where he had 28 hours time on feet culminated in a 66 mile hike run which is wild 18 hours 18 hours if you go back on his strava to march 10th 2023 did a 60 hour effort in the grand canyon 175 miles 38,000 feet of climbing the only question i mean first of all so impressive the only question I have for Michael, did he leave his race in training or is that, is he showing us something that we don't know in the world of, you know, periodization and adaptation is, is he going to be primed today for a great effort? Yeah. I mean, this could just be another day in the office for Michael. Seriously. You know, like, I mean, that's, that's such, a, that's so interesting. There's, I, I mean, I guess I would love to get his take on this, but like, how intimidated is he by, you know, a supported 250 mile race with aid stations when he's gone, you know, 175 in the Grand Canyon, you know, solo, no aid stations, yeah. et cetera. Like from a mental standpoint, that would really help, you know, alleviate a lot of the fear and unknown that I would have in a race like this. Yes. And a lot of these miles that he's doing in training, you know, relatively low impact, probably like, zone like, one, a lot like of zone two, one work. 250 mile pace, you might say. Because <laughs> uh, that's, that's a real thing. So many people always train at under their race pace. Like even for 100 milers, you know, if your 100 mile race pace is 15 minutes a mile, you hardly ever see people actually getting in training runs at 15 minutes a mile. And it's important to do that even for these really long races. What percentage, if, as a coach, and again, we talked about how training, preparing for these races is still voodoo magic, but like, just based on your, your guess, like if you were working with an athlete doing a 200 mile race, how much of their training would you, what percentage of their training would you assign to hiking versus running? Gosh, it, it it's, I think that that's definitely going to change throughout the course of the training block as you get more like specific towards the race um but you know if we're looking at like historical strava data of this race and you figure out like how many hours of hiking is being done at this race like the answer is you need to be very good at hiking the kind of caveat to that is you don't quite get the aerobic stimulus in most cases with hiking because of how low intensities you know of course like if we're hiking up something steep that throws our heart rate into that kind of capillarization type phase but um you can't just simply hike a ton you know I'm, and i'm looking at it coming from like a runner's standpoint you know yeah. if we're coming at it from a through hiker that's a totally different story so there's a, a blend of you know adding running to get fit 
and then adding course specific training to get the body ready for the course and the answer of like how much you do one versus the other is going to just vary a lot depending on the person and mm. their background years of experience etc awesome you heard it here first he probably didn't i'm probably not the first to say like probably didn't hear it here first probably just me regurgitating more information but uh you heard it in the most eloquent way we got kevin goldberg coming in the guy just before kevin goldberg had a pretty nifty what appeared to look like a through hiking pack on going back to our discussion about the diversity of gear here as well and how it's not just those 8 to 12 liter Solomon packs, but some of these much larger, even like 40 liter packs, you'll see some people wearing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, whatever's comfortable, you know, whatever you know you can operate with. We could have a SoCo commercial for this, whatever's comfortable, Coca Donut 250. Yeah, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> we got runners. Is that a We're getting some gold, we're getting some mighty ducks calls in the chats here. And I, I hate to uh, you know throw Brett under the bus here in front of our lovely viewing audience. He sent me a message asking about the big Goldberg energy in the chat. Goldberg here has a has a, a very uh, stout fan club. Is uh, the best I mean way I'm, to put it. I'm seeing it. I'm I'm I mean I'm I'm learning about this in real time, and. Yeah, his fans are very vocal. Who uh, who else also just arrived into the aid station that we have eyes on right now with the Hoka bucket hat? <laughs> Chugging a muscle milk and another Gatorade Zero? No, this might be the low, just the low, uh, low cal Gatorade. Okay, that's there we go. There we got Kevin. Um, just double fisting a medley of beverages right now <laughs> like i think that's just straight up muscle milk a little bit of intel on kevin goldberg did the triple crown of 200s oh, in 2019 the jmt milk. in five days in 2020 the coca 250 last year i've been waiting for a moment when someone actually starts drinking dairy products so I'll just let whoever can type the fastest type in the quote that I'm thinking of from Anchorman. I hope that's not the case with Kevin, but uh, yeah, the, gosh, just going back and forth between orange Gatorade and like vanilla muscle milk. That I you weren't here the first year. Taste. Yeah, I guess so. First year was bone dry. Let's hope milk's not a bad choice. There we go. Forever pace. All caps. I'm glad the all caps is not getting you banned in the chat like I did during Black Canyon. Brett, but. Kevin did Cocodona last year in 74 hours, got fourth, and then turned it around and did Western States the next month. Oh, my god. And goodness. got his sub-24 hour buckle. Yeah. A sub-24 after Cocodona? Um, all right, aid station fireball. Here. Here's some new math for you. So. Who's done the Coca Dona well, Western the States double, and what was their times there? <laughs> the good news is now um, you're getting he has the ridges, a whole get spreadsheet it's all of out of interesting doubles that he's building out, and the Coca Dona Western States double is probably pretty rare um, because there's only been three years of, or I guess two years of Coca Donas. Um, he's got the pulled pork sandwich too. Oh, not afraid. Oh my gosh, we're going just like, like. I mean, that might even just be a jug of, like, heavy creamer, for all we know. <laughs> and then we got the Gatorade and the pulled pork sandwich. This is an, we got an iron stomach right here. And again, this is one of the things that always fascinates me the most, is what people eat and put down at aid stations, because everyone's diet's super different. Michael Langwell with the Big Goldberg Energy Super Chat. Love it. I love to see that. Keep it coming. Got that Big Goldberg Energy. Brett, we just missed it in the chat, but someone said Bucket Hat's so hot right now. Bucket Hat's. Bucket Hat makes a lot of sense. That beard uh, out of his crew member is just, I'm 
like Gandalf right now. <laughs> it, that was a, <laughs> like an adjective. <laughs> Just, I'm just so gandalf Kevin is all about hitting every food group. Yeah, he's... He's completing the pyramid in real time. Huge proponent of the pyramid. Huge proponent. I, I agree with maybe not going too heavy on the vegetables. Is you know, we don't, we don't need that kind of fiber intake 37 miles into the race. But he's checking all the other boxes, though. We got the... the I mean, what, do you, what even does the food pyramid even look like right now? Like I'm going with like salt, protein, and sugar, like candy, candy cane, candy corn, <laughs> and syrup. <laughs> there, there's a, a quote from a different movie. Same actor though, actually. <laughs> <laughs> thought I was, thought I was diversifying, but I'm, I'm not actually. Elf. There we go. Jalula, just to prove his dominance. Dude, you're probably right. I mean, we have another runner here in right behind Goldberg. Goldberg. Possibly That's Adam Williams. In the pink shirt back there? Uh, Right there, this guy. Oh. I was saying there's someone behind him looking left as well. Oh, yeah. You see that? There's Matt Shapiro. Shout out, Matt Shapiro. Matt Shapiro, great photographer. Shapiro the hero? Shapiro the hero. Just like that. <laughs> I think I might have just quoted Hercules. <laughs> That's actually his Instagram handle. Oh, yeah, I know the Shapiro the <laughs> hero part. Don. Don. No, that was Nick. Not Don. Nick. The next question, the next oh, that was just a, that was just a, a, a button fumble. Yeah, this wow, this there was a big group. Uh this yeah, this aid a, station is popping off right now. We're going to just based on the tracker, we're going to see upwards of 30 runners, I would imagine in the next half hour come through here. There's a large contingent. Another guy is Xavier. Xavier Burrell from Montreal, Quebec. Yeah, he says, I'm French-Canadian. I love Ultra Trail. Started running 10 years ago. He says his main That's reason amazing. to come to Cocodona is because he likes to run in the heat, loves this environment. So, Yeah, I mean, you probably get pretty sick of the cold weather in Montreal. they got some kind of gnarly winters. He's done Tour Géant, which is cool. Man, I'm just loving th this. is just such crisp aid station footage. Like this is what this is what we're here for. Like, yeah, it's just so fun. I'm just yeah. I'm always so fascinated by what <laughs> kinds of foods people are going to eat at these aid stations because. For the most part, they couldn't even tell you what they're going to want, you know, nine hours into a race. Like, you have an idea of maybe what it is, but, like, you know, your your taste buds could just, you know, flip that switch on you. And, you know, you're going from, like, yeah, who knows? Maybe you fuel the entire rest of the race with that five-pound bucket of red vines. It could happen. We got a pulled pork, another pulled pork sandwich. So, um, yes, yeah, so we're looking at a whole myriad of runners in the Crown King Saloon aid station. So, I, I'm not sure which. We had, we had a camera at one point on Don Reichel, who is, I think, the first Speedland athlete to yep. come through the aid station. Speedland athlete, um, not too long ago, did an insane treadmill challenge where he did 
the 12 hour, 100 mile, and 24 hour distance world records on a manual treadmill. So it was a treadmill with no motor, like one of those like assault runners. Um, but he did it in um, a, a version of the Speedland, the GS Tam, except they put a road outsole on it, which I'll just say it right now. I would love to see a road outsole version of that GS Tam. That, that shoe is fun on the roads. Me too. A little bit of bio on Don. Works full-time for a health tech startup attempting to reverse type 2 diabetes. That's cool. That's cool, yeah. Yeah, everyone, these people do just cool things. Uh, Michael Greer looks like he's getting ready to make his way out of the aid station. Um, I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw it to the chat. Um, in like a race that you've done, what was something that you didn't expect to eat at an aid station, but then you did and it ended up being awesome? Um, you know, the first Western States I ever ran, it ended up being, uh, rice balls that were just rolled in salt. Like I've never eaten that during a training run, but then it ended up that and grilled cheeses ended up fueling like my last 40 miles. <laughs> um, both two things that I never tried at a, you know, in a training run, but seemed amazing at the time. Salsa on chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> wow. Salsa, that's, I guess that, that's a good one. Maybe a follow up to, um, yeah, let me, what race was this at? Because that, I don't know, that's fascinating. Like, where can you get grilled dumplings in a race? Uh, the mile, this aid station that we're looking at is mile 37. Cheese popcorn. Oh, man, I would get so scared of getting a little popcorn shards, like, stuck in my throat. But the cheesy part would be nice. Pickle juice. <laughs> One time I thought I was downing a cup of Mountain Dew, but it ended up being pickle juice. <laughs> that was a, just a violent reaction from me. It was at Bandera in, I think, 2018. Oof. Green olives. Nutella rolls. Peanut butter and pickle sandwich. I've actually heard that a couple times. Non bread and cheese whiz. That actually sounds incredible. I could see that being amazing. Ultra fuel. Pierogies. The pierogies, that's a, a famous one that they cook up at the Kroger's Canteen Aid Station at Hard Rock. So, folks who are watching this live stream right now, there's going to be a lot of runners coming through this crown king aid station in the next 20 to 30 minutes we'll do our best to identify as they come through but just keep in mind there's going to be what i think will be hordes of runners coming through now you didn't already switch to stream two did you yeah. Oh, okay. yeah we could switch before this oh okay Yeah, at some at some point in the very near future, we're going to be switching to um, our, I guess, our second second live stream as we're oh near in our time cap on this first one, and we want to make sure that we don't you know break anything. Oh, Oreo cookie milkshake, that actually Michigan really blood. That sounds good to me. Dude, we should just go to Michigan Bluff and sell those <laughs> people. I always thought that like an iced coffee kiosk you know like the people at the baseball games who have those things that look like giant vacuum cleaners but it's really just full starbucks if we did that with like iced coffee at michigan bluff gosh the you'd make a killing yep man we got to get into the michigan bluff coffee game <laughs> last chance could be good too because we could do a lot of interesting branding around that last there's, there's no fans at last chance so <laughs> i'm not gonna sell <laughs> not going to sell uh, coffee to people on the course. Aid Station Fireball told me to check my phone, but I actually don't. I don't have a lot going on on my phone, so I'm going to figure out what you're talking about. Oh, in the uh, Discord. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so Bill Dittman did the Cocodona Western Double in 2021. Mark Vogel and Kevin... Goldberg, who we were Wait. talking about earlier, did that double in 2022. Bill, Bill Dittman. Bill Dittman. That's our Morton guy. That's our Morton guy. 
Uh, Bill Dittman, he works for Morton. Oh, wow. He did a double Boston Marathon, I think, recently, too. Like out and back? Ran sort of to the, thing. yeah. Yep. Ian Sharman used to do that. So, yeah, Bill Dittman did Cocodona Western Double in 2021. Mark Vogel and Kevin Goldberg did it in 2022. Uh, Liam, do you know if anyone is doing it this year? Lindsay, I would also add that the lemonade at Phantom Ranch is amazing, too. That has saved me on multiple occasions. Brandon, I've heard great things about Fort Collins. Very underrated training location on the front range of Colorado. I'll probably actually get penalized by folks for letting the secret out, but heard great things. Dude, the chat is going so fast. I know. Um, I guess this, I mean, what an what an interesting problem to have. And we're like, we have we have eighteen we have over eighteen hundred people watching this live stream right now. And I I'm so thankful that every one of you is here watching and contributing to the chat and having this conversation with us because I mean that makes our jobs so much more fun. Yep. And we know that everyone in the chat has knowledge that they can contribute to this live stream. And that's one of the things that I am loving about the place that trail running is at right now is the interaction between commentary, the actual course, like people racing, the chat. It's so fun. It's so true. It's so fun. It's, I think I couldn't, amen. Amen. Brett, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling 22. <laughs> you walked right into that one. You walked right into that one. In addition, I think that this is, I've seen a lot of mile 37s in my time around the sport. This is the best looking group of runners I've ever seen in mile 37 <laughs> race. Yeah, that's very true. Most people don't look good at mile 37 ever. And like nearly every single person here <laughs> is looking incredible. At 37. Let's see. I'm just going to refresh the trackers. To curious. Oh, oh, yeah. I was going to say, I was just curious because um, when Killian Korth and Michael Versteeg uh, came into the Crown King Aid Station, it was like a 10 minute gap. And then when they left, it was like one or two. Yeah. According to the trackers, it actually looks like Killian is pulling away from Michael Versteeg a little bit, which is kind of what we were theorizing. And that Killian might be the, his style might be to spend more time in the aid stations and run harder in between them. Yep. Whereas it looks like Michael Versteeg is having shorter time, but then the you know slightly slower overall average pace. Yes. I and maybe I've missed this, Brett. I'm I'm curious if you've picked this up. I haven't seen any of these runners, or ver I've seen very few of these runners go out of these aid stations with headphones on. I saw a couple aftershocks. Um, not too many though. Um, you know, maybe it's a scenario where it's just been stowed away, or you know, maybe the uh, maybe it's too early for music. Maybe you got to save that. Mm. Maybe you got to save that for a little later. Yeah, I would I would have a hard time like if I was running next to someone, you know. I love, you know, chatting with people while running, but you know, the talking does raise the heart rate a little bit and you, you know, you you kind of need every single one of those beats uh to be in the right place for uh, a race this long. Uh it would it would take a lot of self-control to like limit the kind of conversation and yep. You know, chatting, which I guess ultimately that's why we're sitting here where our job is now to talk about the race and the running and chat with all of you wonderful people about this race. 
that is going back to gear. That is one of those multi-day ultimate direction packs. He was folding the top of it. Oh, like the the fast pack, the ultimate direction yeah. the fast pack series. Was it an orange one? I'm gonna see if I can find packs. <laughs> Listening to true crime podcasts while alone in the woods. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I could handle that. I think this was that we, we were looking at the fast pack twenty. Let's see. Bib one twelve is coming into the aid station, psyched, pumped <laughs> on life. Oh my goodness. Bib one twenty. One twelve. One twelve. Kevin Metz. All right. What do we know? What do we know? Kevin Metz says, "Uh, yeah." They call him K Money, dating back to middle school. K Money. Dating back to middle school. Like spelled out money too, not just K dollar sign. K and money. his crew is communicating by walkie talkies during the race. So you might hear my call name, which is Silver Shadow. Oh, ah, okay. So if you hear Silver Shadow out there, you know that K money is out and about. I mean, I I totally respect the use of walkie talkies. Um, like me and my friends, we're looking at any excuse ever <laughs> to use walkie talkies. I mean, most importantly, um, you know, for road tripping, we're, uh, yeah, we're going to use walkie talkies to talk to each other. Uh, update from uh, our friend Liam, aka Aid Station Fireball. Clifford Matthews, bib number 164, is doing the Coca Dona Western States wow. double this year. So he's the only person um, this year, which, yeah, I feel like we're probably only ever going to get like one, maybe two people each year. I guess, if any, that are going to do the Cocodona Western States double. Wow, that is so scary. Bib number 10. That's Eliza Lapierre. Eliza Lapierre. Um, I recognize. Maple hat. Yeah, recognize the untap. Uh, coached by Jason Coop. Yep. And is, yeah, just super excited at the opportunity of kind of testing the boundaries um, of, you know, just the limits. Gosh, we've got about like five people walking into the aid station right now. A little bit more color on Kevin Metz because I think that some of these backgrounds are so fascinating. He says, my nine to five, I spend time working on a startup that builds the best tools for digital creators. The website is Manifold, M-A-N-I-F-O-L-D dot X-Y-Z. I'm only saying this because if you go to the website, it's one of the coolest looking websites I've ever seen. Yeah, Andrew Glaze just did the Canyons 100 mile, which was uh, last Friday. I guess Friday into Saturday, flew home, and then as now starting the Coca Dona 250. And as we've heard as well, uh, Andrew Glaze is doing it solo, no crew, no pacers, just drop eggs. Which there has been a handful to do uh, the no crew, no pacers, drop egg only. Um, but to also do Canyon's 100 mile the couple days before. That's that's an extra. I'm I'm loving uh K Money's tackle box of of goodies in there. I mean there's 17 different types of tape. One for each toe. Brett, Kevin did the Black Canyon double last year, which I think is the 100k on Saturday and then the 60k on Sunday. Correct, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of cool. That's technically possible. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, one thing that we're seeing a lot of that, you know, you just don't see in too many, you know, 100-mile races is, uh, you know, much more attention is getting paid to the feet. This iPad's like about to die for some reason. Even though it's so I want to read out, uh, so as I was mentioning earlier, we had a questionnaire that we sent out to all the runners in the race and Kevin contributed some of his thoughts when he talks about his why for this race he says quote two things in my life that have been more of a calling than anything are running in the desert it sounds funny but even back when I was running road races in Ohio I was intrigued by the trail scene via accounts like I run far I specifically remember seeing a photo and tweet coverage of the Javelina race where my brothers were dressed in Halloween garb and thinking quote I need to be there I don't even know why 
and hadn't run more than a road marathon at the time. Fast forward 10 years later, a lot of luck, a lot of chance encounters. I'm now living in Seattle, and but the desert is where I feel the most home. Cocoa it just makes the most sense. Cool, man. Great to see the universe conspire to make this race possible for you, and uh, we're glad to have you here. That's awesome. So cool. He oh, says his nutrition plan for Coca Donut will primarily be McDonald's hamburgers. So going back to your question, to the to the chat. Hey, whatever whatever you can do to avoid fiber. Underrated <laughs> ultra food. Yep. <laughs> McDonald's burgers. I mean, it's funny. You know, McDonald's kind of got like their chefs or something. They must have gotten into that battle where like they were trying to figure out the perfect like Big Mac you know bun ingredient formula and like added too much salt. What do you do? Add some more sugar. Oh, shoot, we added too much sugar. Let's add a little bit more salt. Oh, no, we added too much salt. <laughs> okay, we'll add a little bit more sugar instead of starting over. But instead, we just added like double or triple the correct amount of salt and sugar. Turns out those are actually two great things for uh, Cocodona. Wow. Brett, you were actually telling me about Guy Fieri earlier today. <laughs> Kevin says, I was once cast to be on the game show Minute to Win It with Guy Fieri. Wi uh, Guy Fieri hosted Minute to Win It? <laughs> Or was he like his partner on Minute to Win It, the show? I don't show? know. Uh, either way, Minute to Win It was such a fun show. <laughs> um, I'm seeing, uh, uh, so looking at the uh, aid station across the table, we're seeing a couple, some spring smoothies, some uh, pulled pork burgers. Don says Josh Perry should be here any minute. Josh is a really fascinating character. Josh, I believe, has the Arizona Trail FKT right now, the unsupported one. Could be wrong. Self-supported, sorry. So he has the self-supported FKT on the AZT. So very cool. So Aaron says in the chat, two years ago, everyone was coming into this aid station looking wrecked. This year, not so much. Is the added water station the difference? I bet... Per, like probably that, but I bet also just like there was so much of a learning curve that first year that like no one got to experience and like people get to talk about the race and the course and it's not as new. Yeah, I think that there technically, I guess, were two added water stops this year because the 11 mile aid station moved to mile eight. We still had a little aid station at mile 11. Yeah. And then we had the water drop at 25. It's also cooler. I know it's hot out, right? It was yes. Um, in the in the it's in ninety degrees uh, down in the valley right now, um, but I think it was a few degrees warmer uh, in the inaugural year. And then yeah. there were also wave starts, so some of the back of the pack runners didn't start until seven a.m. So they started that's two huge. hours earlier. That's that's, that's a massive. big deal. Yeah, that's massive. Yeah. Yeah, because the quicker you can get up high and out of the heat, the better. And, like, those extra two hours from, you know, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. to cover some of that distance that would normally be in the heat. Um, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, those are some big difference makers for sure. So, you know, that that's – I don't know, that's, that's my favorite answer to that question. Um, my live stream keeps reversing, like, 20 minutes on me. So that, that that 90 degree, I know, I apologize for that 90 degree temp uh, up on the screen being slightly misleading. That's actually the, the temperature at the start of the race currently, which is, so that's the temperature in Black Canyon City. Um, and that's a couple thousand feet lower than where all the, the runners are at right now at mile 37. So I anticipate that it's probably around 80 or perhaps even a few degrees under at this aid station and also have with the runners having come from 90, yeah. 90 plus to now 80, um, that would feel significantly cooler than them, which is why I think it, you know, these people are just looking, you know, <coughs> looking un undercooked, not overcooked. <laughs> They're Medium rare. Over easy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if where, where we're at with this, but wow, the picnic benches are getting full. There's a question in the chat from Linda. How does the FKT versus Cocodona pacing compare? I'm assuming you're asking about long trail FKTs and not just the, the broader swath of FKTs out there. 
I, I would imagine it's pretty similar. I, you know, you hear Carl Meltzer say that on the long trails, you're on that three to four mile an hour treadmill for as long as you can. And I, I think when you look at the winning times on this course, I think Joe McConaughey last year, obviously slightly different course, but he was in on around that four mile per hour average. I think you're going to see a similar like three to four mile an hour window in this one as well. Yeah, that kind of seems to be like the sweet spot towards the, uh, I guess towards the front of the pack. Um, which, yeah, and that, that pace, that kind of miles per hour, that's still something that's within like an attainable range of some of our fastest through hikers. Yeah. Which again is like that really interesting blend of, because I think it was the very first year of Cocodona. Um, I believe it was third place or fourth place overall hiked every single step of the race. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, the ultimate direction. Uh, well, just the image there ca like caught me because like these are two competitors right now. They're literally fist bumping. They have plates of food. Yeah. They're taking their time. They're smiling. They look pretty fresh. They look inspired. Like this is a totally different sport. And it's yeah. so and cool. I've actually, I've seen similar energy like this at the very beginning of some of the tour de France stages, because you just simply aren't racing that first hour. Right. You know, and that's just, you know, that's even, even more in this race. You know, like we're not, we're not really racing each other this first day. You know, we need to be Miles away, survive and taking care of ourselves. And, you know, and in a lot of cases, you know, it's just like, this isn't the race where you go like in the well See, we didn't have anything that after way. 11. It's a um, you know, it's a different, it's a we different well was, that yeah. you go in. And it dried up. Yeah. So it was, it was only like it's one, one you kind of fall into. On the entire These guys, like, if I'm if I'm a person yeah. who has never more, seen our sport before, and my I first had, exposure I, I is this live stream, and I'm seeing these festive aid stations, the competitors laughing, smiling, pretty much yeah. under control, about to head so out for a relatively leisurely paced stroll. Like, I'm like, this is cool. Yeah. And then I say, tune back in in three days. <laughs> and like, maybe we'll clip this and, you know, show it back to him and be like, hey, remember 48 hours ago when you were this happy? <laughs> I mean, I hope they still are, but, you know, that's just, uh, that's just how it's going to be. Okay. So we're going to use this time right now. We're going to switch the streams. Um, that doesn't, that's nothing for the people. Matt's going to give an announcement. Yeah, you guys don't need to do anything. You'll get redirected to the new stream. And give me about 60 to 90 seconds, and we'll have that up. Nature break. Yeah, man. 